three o'clock, so let's go ahead and get started. So good afternoon. Welcome to the 3 p.m. public portion of the closed litigation session of the January 8th, 2019 meeting of the City Council. In this part of the meeting, the City Council will receive public testimony. Thereafter, the council members will move to the courtyard conference room for the closed session. I would like to ask the clerk to please call the roll. Thank you, Mayor. Council members Crone. Present. Glover. Present. Myers. Present. Brown. Here. Matthews. Here. Vice Mayor Cummings. Here. And Mayor Watkins. Here. Before we open public comment, I have a brief announcement. The city attorney will provide a report on items listed on the closed session agenda at the beginning of the 3.30 p.m. session. Are there any members of the public who would like to speak to any items listed on the closed session agenda at this time? Um, seeing none or hearing none, I will adjourn this portion of the meeting to the courtyard conference room where the council will go into its closed session. Good afternoon, everybody. Welcome to our 3.30 portion of uh, the January 8th, 2019 meeting of the City Council. I would like to ask the clerk to please call the roll. Thank you, Mayor. Council members Crone. Here. Glover. Here. Myers. Here. Brown. Here. Matthews. Here. Vice Mayor Cummings. Here. And Mayor Watkins. Here. And if the clerk could please lead us in the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America, to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Gotta think about that one. At this yeah, time, right, we'll have some introduction of some new employees of the city of Santa Cruz. And I'd like to start with uh, our human resources director, Lisa Murphy, who will be introducing Katie Coate, administrative assistant too. Katie. Good afternoon. I'd like to introduce Katie Coate. She is our new AA2, working in our benefits division. I'll read a little bit about Katie. Katie is a Bay Area native who's made her home in Santa Cruz for the past 18 years. She's a background in finance and customer service and looks forward to growing in the human resources department for many years. <laughs> she enjoys raising her two boys on the beautiful Santa Cruz beaches and in our parks and finding time to get outside and play as much as possible. Her favorite indoor hobbies include board games and trivia nights. You're on my team. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, Katie always tries to spread her energy and cheer. Uh, I asked her what's a piece of trivia. She used to be her high school mascot, the American High School Eagle. <laughs> um, and another, another success story, Katie was a temp and we hired her as our permanent. So that's a, a great success and a great win. And we're very happy to have her and jump right in. As you know, benefits touch each and every one of you. So be nice, because <laughs> she's got the keys to the city. Great, so thank you and welcome Katie. Thank you. Welcome Katie. Katie and I sometimes pass each other when we're doing our kid drop off at school. So <laughs> congratulations and welcome. At this time, I'd like to invite up our Deputy Director of Libraries, Janice O'Driscoll, who will introduce Catherine Upton, librarian too. Good afternoon. It is such a pleasure to introduce Catherine to you because Catherine actually worked for us a long time ago in early literacy work. She helped us develop one of our most important early literacy programs, Read to Me. And she worked on kits, she worked with daycare providers, she worked on training, um, and she got this program launched and it's still going today. Then she kind of wandered off and became the school librarian for Baymont School for several years. 
And in the meantime, we were able to hire her for some special projects. One of the most exciting ones was when we began a project where we're training volunteers in the community to do story times to preschools. And so Catherine developed the curriculum and did the training for all of those volunteers. And it's very successful, also still going. But well, we've managed to attract her back to the library. And she is now back in the permanent staff. She's currently assigned to the downtown branch and she will be doing story times and answering questions and all of the things that you would expect. But she's also going to take over a very important STEAM program at the library at the downtown branch. And STEAM, just to remind you, science, technology, environment, arts, and mathematics. And so Catherine will be working with school-aged children and developing those programs for them. She's also going to be helping us keep the content current on the kids page of the Santa Cruz Public Library's website. So please join me in welcoming back mm -hmm. Catherine Upton. Welcome back, Catherine. At this time, I'd like to invite up our Director of Economic Development, Bonnie Lipscomb, who will be introducing David McCormick, Development Manager. Good afternoon, Mayor and members of the Council. It's, I'm so excited, actually, to introduce David to you today. Um, this has been a long time coming. David's our new Asset Manager, Property Manager for the city. And some of you may know um, we've had this position vacant for a while. We've had numerous folks on our staff um, part-time sort of uh, pulling together some of our asset management, property management. So we're really excited to have a designated person filling this role. Um, David has a wealth of experience. Um, and I'll get to that in just a second. But first, just a little background. His wife is named Catherine. He has two children, um, Michaela Mika, who's five, and a son. Um, um, who is 16 months, Jackson, and he's lived in Santa Cruz over the last five years, uh, most recently, and he lives on the east side. Um, most recently, he's worked for the city of San Jose in their parks and rec department. Um, he has a lot of GIS background, so I'm really excited what he's going to do with our asset management portfolio, and we're talking about an interactive map, so I think that'll be really useful um, for our community. Um, he graduated from San Jose State with an urban planning, urban development, and design degree. He did grow up on the east coast um, in Vermont and Massachusetts, um, but his, his wife's family is actually from from the Santa Cruz Aptos area. And the interesting fun fact that I learned is that David's wife's family goes back five generations in Santa Cruz, and their family owned and ran the historic Garibaldi Hotel, or the Garibaldi Villa Hotel, that was off River Street. So some of you have seen some of those historic photos from the late 1890s, 1900. It's very beautiful and kind of a fun, a fun connection. Um, Dave, David's uh, going to be responsible, as I said, for property management. This includes our portfolio, currently over 70, 80 properties in the city, including the wharf management, some of our other properties, acquisition, development, property maintenance, and hopefully soon also the tannery commercial leasing. So we're going to have a lot on his plate. He's really hit the ground running. So excited to have him here. Um, his favorite thing about Santa Cruz is the creativity and energy. I asked him what his favorite thing in his months sort of long of working here at the city, and he said it's the positivity. Um, it's sort of the good energy energy um, at the city and obviously no commute over the hill and being able to walk downtown. So I hope you will welcome uh, David and a round of applause for, for David for being part of our team. Welcome David. And I would like to now invite up Parks and Rec Dire Director Tony, Tony Elliott to introduce Isaac Steinbrook, uh, facilities attendant. All right, good afternoon. My name is Tony Elliott, Director of Parks and Recreation. Uh, it is my pleasure to introduce Isaac Steinbrook today. I uh, just had the opportunity to meet Isaac a couple hours ago, to be honest. Um, and uh, I realized that Isaac's reputation really um, is huge within the city. Uh, I think half of the chamber uh, uh, hall in here is filled with Parks and Rec folks. Uh, <laughs> who really love and respect and appreciate Isaac. 
Uh, Isaac actually started as a volunteer with Parks and Recreation uh, at the age of 12 uh, at Loudon Nelson uh, and has worked with seniors uh, primarily um, and is known really for his customer service, professionalism. Um, Isaac uh, went to high school at Santa Cruz High, uh, is currently going to Cambrio College, uh, studying for a degree in computer science. So uh, I think it's fair to say and I, I wish the whole Loudon crew, uh, crew could come up here and, and speak as well, but I think it's fair to say there's a contingent of our seniors that are tech savvy and largely because of Isaac uh, and the work and leadership that he's displayed. And so he will continue that work uh, in a part-time role um, at Loudon Nelson, working with seniors, but working with this uh, great team at Parks and Recreation. So uh, on behalf of this team behind us, the cheering squad, uh, please help me welcome uh, Isaac to the team. Oh, Wonderful, welcome Isaac. Okay, so at this time we will have a presentation from our police chief, Andy Mills, who will be introducing uh, the police department volunteers. Thanks Andy. I also have two employees that I'll introduce oh, first, if that's okay, Mayor. That. Yeah, absolutely. So if Lori and uh, Jody would come on up, please. They're shy, they said, Chief, we, we wanna make sure that we're not that's talking, good. okay? <laughs> But uh, anybody who works in city government knows that who actually runs the organizations are the A2 and A3s. And we've been so fortunate to hire uh, two A2s to help the chief's office. Uh, one works for Dan Flippo, the other works for myself, and uh, they are busy all day long. And so I'd like to introduce, introduce to you first, Lori Hageman. Well, Lori came to us from, Cal came to California from Ohio, Michigan, uh, where, but she's been here for 32 years, so I guess she's kind of a native. <laughs> and uh, lives in Boulder Creek. Yeah, this is Lori over here. Uh, she has spent the last 25 years in administration and management, including having multiple employees, I think eight or 10 at one point, uh, in the healthcare field. So she really understands healthcare benefits, and which is another huge asset for us as an organization. I do have a question, who do you root for? And when Michigan plays Ohio. <laughs> Michigan, you said? Oh, okay. <laughs> we'll have to argue this for the next five years. Uh, on her downtime, she enjoys the outdoor and, and uh, raising, helping raise her grandchildren who come over and visit her frequently. And so, uh, welcome. Glad to have you. Welcome. And Jody Malloy uh, came to us from uh, Connecticut where she worked as an executive assistant to uh, the senior levels of corporate management in the uh, New York area for over 20 years. This included uh, more than 10 years as the executive assistant to the CEO of a multi-billion dollar Fortune 500 company uh, that was traded on the New York Stock Exchange. I'm kind of looking for insider tips, but she's not giving them <laughs> up. Um, this included handling shareholders and board members and, and people who were constantly complaining about things, so she should fit right in. <laughs> and uh, Jody and her husband live in Santa Cruz and have four children, including two fur babies and two horses. Mm -hmm. And uh, she goes down and visits them quite frequently. Um, this time it's been a little bit muddy, huh? Yes. Okay. So anyways, we're very thankful to have both of them. They've just been hit the ground running and uh, can't wait to see what they can do in the future. So thank you, ladies. Welcome. <laughs> And now if I can get all of our volunteers to come up. <laughs> so what do you do when you have a really busy police department that don't have enough cops to go around? <laughs> you find volunteers and uh, yeah, and so we're so thankful <laughs> that uh, This is just about half of the first class. And so we actually have 25 total volunteers and they're responsible for a variety of things. Uh, one of which is walking the downtown area, helping people find restaurants and places to go and then educating people as to what you can and cannot do. Like you can't smoke downtown and we're happy to point that out. Nor can you skateboard on the sidewalks and do other things that uh, they can point out. Uh, but most importantly, what they're doing is they're creating a great visual presence not only the downtown area, but the beaches and the parks as well uh, as, we roll, as we roll this thing out. And ultimately, they'll also be calling on senior citizens who are shut-ins and making sure that they're taken care of and that uh, 
uh, that uh, if there are needs, they can refer them to adult protective services and do vacation home checks. So they have a variety of things that they will be able to do as we continue to grow in this program. So if it's okay, I'd like to introduce them to you in, in no particular order. But if I can say this uh, while I'm introducing them, where did uh, Beth and Caitlin, where are you at? Come up here, go and hide in the back. <laughs> so three people really made this happen. And I just wanna really recognize them for their unbelievable efforts. Uh, Joyce Blotchke was uh, charged with putting this together and she just did a fantastic job. And uh, we hired Beth as a part-time uh, person who spent full-time working on this project. And uh, Beth did a fantastic job getting people backgrounded and, and, and going through the process. And then uh, when all else failed, uh, Caitlin, who you, you can see is with child, um, <laughs> we actually <laughs> were looking for a uniform that uh, could work and so she came up with this. Uh, Caitlin, uh, put all the curriculum together. They, everybody was trained for over a week in a variety of, of, of with a variety of tools. She put the curriculum together. It was very thoughtful, including the next stages, so that when she does go out on maternity leave, uh, she can continue with training. And she came up to me a week ago and said, hey, I really own this project now, so I don't wanna leave it. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and so she has just been a, done a stellar job um, uh, helping put this together. I know that everybody feels that way because I've had multiple people come up to me and tell me uh, how much they appreciate it. So I'm gonna introduce the uh, volunteers to you. And if you would, volunteers, just step forward or wave, wave your hand so people know who it is. Sydney Val uh, Falcone. <laughs> Haley Richmond. Veronica Sharoch. <laughs> How do they do, Veronica? Not good. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Joe Netro. George Stagney. Beth Thurman, you know. Uh, Margie Way. I'll get out of the way so you can actually see Margie. <laughs> Colin Miller. Maggie Ramirez. Kyle Wave. Everybody knows this guy, J.D. Sotelo. J.D. Uh, where's he at? Yeah. <laughs> 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 Ryan Perales. Monica Young. Diane Lamone. How did I do, Diana? Good. Actually, until I called you Diana, it's <laughs> Diane. Uh, David Gianni. Giannini. Right behind you. Yeah. <laughs> Jim Carraher and uh, Jake Demetsch. So this is our volunteer crew. You'll see them out and around in their uniforms, by the way. I'd like to thank AT&T for uh, uh, paying for the uniforms that did come out of the police budget. Uh, and so community members have even stepped forward to help us. And uh, we're looking for some great things. We're actually getting ready to start a couple of crime, criminogenic experiments that we can measure to see how effective they are with this, with this group. And uh, we'll announce that in the future. So thank you so much for the time. Thank you, Chief Mills. And I just wanna thank all the volunteers for being here today and for just choosing to spend your time supporting our city. There's a lot of volunteer opportunities and I appreciate you choosing Santa Cruz and doing this. So thank you so much. I think Council Member Thorne has- I'm really happy to see this. This is great. Thank, thank you all for, for volunteering. This is really, um, how long is a typical shift? Right now there are two hour shifts, uh, multiple shifts sometimes a day, but we're going to expand that into uh, three and four hour shifts uh, so that we can get more bang for our buck out of them. <laughs> how, how many days have they been out there so far? Have they already been out? Yeah, they've been out for about a month. A month, okay. Yeah, I, uh, that's, I thought I've seen them just. Yeah, yeah. And t the typical thing that, what, what comes up most that you are asking someone to do or do they ask for directions or is it cigarettes, is it? Uh, what I have done is, um, gone into some businesses and just said hi and introduced myself. That helps. It's also helpful uh, for us to be around when people that look like they're in need come up to us and say, gosh, can you help me with the something? Or, you know, do you know you like that? So it's, uh, we contacted Chris who works, um, Chris the home, uh, works at the li her office is mm -hmm. at the library there and could match up um, somebody that was in need with her. So it's just, we're just uh, feet on the street, you know? Thank you. Thank you.
Councilmember Matthew. This is the first class, and what's your anticipated schedule for those who might be interested in the future? I assume you want to have an application period. And we go through an application training, period. Yeah. We also have to go through a rigorous background because okay. uh, they still are in the police facility, and we want to make sure that uh, people are of the highest caliber. You can see that we have really have a high caliber uh, folk here. Uh, so it does take a little bit of time. So we would anticipate in the spring we'd like to do another class and see if we can take this up to 50 and, uh, and then continue to expand from there. Great, thank you. You bet. Thank you. Uh, other questions? I just have one. Uh, do they, are you guys doing evenings shifts as well, or is it daytime primarily, or what are the hours? Yeah, mostly it's daytime right now. Okay. We're trying to keep them out in the daylight. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, good. <laughs> Good. Okay. Thank you so much, everybody. Thank you, thank you so thank much. You. So I have a few announcements and then we'll move on to our regular meeting. So I'm excited to invite everyone to the historic groundbreaking for the first segment of the Coastal Rail Trail. So please come and celebrate with the city and county officials and the community members at the west base of the San Lorenzo River Railroad Trestle Bridge at 1215 p.m. this Thursday, January 10th. And I'll wait just a second to continue. <laughs> I'll just repeat the time again. So there will be a groundbreaking on this Thursday, January 10th at 1215 p.m. The lunch hour ceremony will be followed by a party with free refreshments and giveaways, and there is gonna be free parking and a bike valet. So for, for more information, please visit thecityofsantacruz.com, and I hope to see you all there. Today's meeting is also broadcast live on community television, channel 25, and streaming on the city's website, thecityofsantacruz.com. I wanna thank Jennifer Cameron, who is our technician for both this afternoon and evening sessions, and um, thank her again for her work. So all of uh, our city council members can be emailed at the city of city council at cityofsantacruz.com. And if you would like to communicate with us about an agenda item, we'd like to receive your email by Monday at 5 p.m. before our council meeting. This provides us with an opportunity to review your email and include it with the rest of our agenda packet. Please do bear in mind that all items of correspondence with the city and city council constitute a public record and are generally subject to disclosure upon request by any member of the public. Accordingly, if you have any sensitive information or private information that you do not wish to be made public, you should not include that information in your correspondence. Our rules of decorum are on the window ledge to my left, and it is my job to keep the meeting running without disruption, and we ask you to respect your fellow citizens when you are inside and outside our council chambers. At this time, I'd like to ask if there are any statements of disqualification amongst the council. Seeing none. City Clerk, are there uh, any additions or deletions to our agenda? No, there are not. Thank you. Quick oral communications announcement. Oral communications is an opportunity for members of the community to speak to us on items that are not on the agenda. Oral communications will generally occur at the conclusion of the afternoon business around 5.30 p.m., but may occur before or after 5.30, depending on the meeting. At this time, I'd like to ask our city attorney to provide a report on closed session. Yes, thank you, Mayor Watkins, members of the city council. There were two items on this um, afternoon's closed session agenda, which began at 3 p.m. in the courtyard conference room. First item was a liability claim, the claim of Wendell <coughs> Turner Burgess. Um, there was no reportable action on that claim. However, it is listed as item eight on your consent agenda. Second item was a conference with labor negotiators. The council received a report from its chief negotiator, uh, Lisa Murphy, concerning the uh, SEIU Local 521. Uh, there was no reportable action. Thank you. At this time, we usually have a city manager report, but it is my understanding at this time we will not. Okay, thank you. So at this point um, in the meeting, we'll move on to our consent agenda. 
And those are items two through 10 on our agenda. All items will be acted upon in one motion unless an item is pulled by a council member for further discussion. Are there any council members who'd like to pull an item? And I'll just start by saying I plan to pull item number three myself. Are there any additional items that would be pulled? Council Member Crow? Item number two, the minutes from the last meeting. Item number two. Item nine. Mm -hmm. oh, sorry, Council Member Matthews? Yes, I'd like to pull five and six. Six and? I was gonna pull six. I was gonna pull six as well. Okay. So I see that we will be pulling items two, three, five, six, and nine. Is that correct? Okay. Are there any council members who wish to only comment on any of the items that were not polled at this time? Sure, no problem. The items that were polled from consent are items two, three, five, six, and nine. Are there any council members who wish to only comment on any of the other items? Not at this time. Are there any members of the public who would like to request an item be polled or to speak to an item on our consent agenda with the exceptions of items two, three, five, six, and nine? Now would be the time to do so. And you will be given two minutes. Thank you very much, Mayor Watkins, council members. Gillian Greenside, and I'm really here just to appreciate item number four. Uh, it's been a long time coming. That is the televising of the Santa Cruz Planning Commission meeting. Uh, for the past three or four years, myself and uh, actually my late husband John spoke to this, although he hated speaking at the microphone, but he thought it very important that the planning commission meetings be more available to the public since so many important decisions are made there. And it was he who brought it to my attention that we're the only city that doesn't to make our planning commission meetings available in that way. And I was even surprised when we visited his family in Vallejo to see on the television that all of their commissions are televised, <coughs> parks and recreation, etc. So we've asked for many years and uh, there hasn't been any progress. So I can only say uh, with a new council, this is very heartening and I want to just express appreciation. That's of course assuming that uh, it will be voted to go in. And I hope it will be on community television because I think that is the most available for the, for the community. So thank you very much. Thank you. Are there any other members of the public who would like to speak to the council on the consent agenda mm -hmm. besides items two, three, five, six, and nine? Seeing none, I'm now looking for a motion on the remaining items of consent, which are two, seven, eight, 10, and 11. Actually, no, two actually are actually not two. Oh, I'm sorry, yeah. four, seven, eight, 10, and 11. I'll move the consent agenda. Second. Okay. That was a motion by Councilmember Matthews, seconded by Councilmember Brown. Uh, any further questions or deliberations? All in favor, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? That passes unanimously. Um, so now we are moving on to the um, polled items of, con and so we'll start with item number two, which I believe is polled by Council Member Crone. Thank you, uh, Mayor. Uh, this had, to, and, and uh, you, I emailed Bonnie about it, and um, I might have gotten a email back, but I, my, well, I'm not receiving emails right now. My, something's wrong with my machine. But this has to do with item number 27 from the last meeting uh, and it was the reading of final adoption of ordinance amending chapter 221.03 of municipal code pertaining to relocation assistance for displaced tenants. And I was just wondering, I just thought there was, um, all the people who spoke, 31, expressed concern um, and I thought there was a for and against or, or speaking in favor of the motion or speaking against the motion. I thought we were gonna separate it out like that. And I do, um, and I did respond to your email, but that particular item there were people in support of the idea, but they shared concerns. That's why they fell under Express concern. expressing concern because they weren't 100% for the item as, as it was 
Okay, I'll move item number two. Okay. Is there any um, member of the public who'd like to speak to that item? Thank you, Mayor, Council members. Um, la that last meeting was very long, and I don't usually look at the minutes, but I did for this agenda, and I totally appreciate it's a hard job to do minutes and uh, that, that for that particular meeting. However, um, I was a, uh, in many years ago. Minutes were much more detailed, and reading minutes, you've got a sense of the dialogue, I understand that might be cumbersome, but uh, the next iteration for council was for and against. And it seemed to me, looking at all of the items, it was very hard to tell <laughs> how many were for, how many were against. I think the category was express concerns. I spoke strongly in favor of one of those items or not strongly, I spoke in favour of it. So I, I think if that is the usual formula for and against, that would be helpful. And just lastly, on the uh, oral communications, um, I, I think the minutes for those who read them gives a sense of what happens at council and the public record is important. And under oral communications, I spoke and if it could, I don't think it would take a lot more to give a little bit more flavour. What I spoke to was the fact that on the wharf, <coughs> the shops leave their doors wide open on a freezing day with the heaters full blasting. And I brought that as a concern, but the capture of it was Greensight spoke about shops and restaurants on the wharf and thank the outgoing councils. So I just think to be able to capture just a little bit more accurately of what is brought forward to you would be, would be ultimately in the public good. But I do appreciate that was a difficult and long meeting. Thank you. Thank you. Are there any other members of the public who would like to address the council on this item? Okay, seeing none, I'll return it back to our council for action and deliberation. Oh, you moved approval, Chris, is that correct? Uh, I'll, I'll move the item. Yeah, and I'll second. Okay, so that was um, moved by Councilmember Crone, seconded by Councilmember Matthews. A question by Councilmember Myers. I assume that for the new members, we can't, we'll have to abstain for the majority until the 7 p.m. session we are in. I, I'd like, I'll turn it over to our city attorney to respond. That, to that. has been a, a custom of council members in the past, but it's not a legal requirement. The approval of the minutes is the council's official certification that those are the minutes of the meeting. It's not an, an, uh, an attestation by council members that, that they reviewed it and made sure everything was accurately set. So um, in my view, current council members can approve the, the minutes from the last council. Okay. Thank you. And then, um, thank you. Just to address the concern of the community member is feasible, Bonnie, or to include or expand the detail in the minutes so that if someone were to just reference it, they would be able to get a stronger understanding of the decisions that were made and the conversations or concerns expressed? Um, our minutes are specifically action minutes, not verbatim and not summary minutes, they're action minutes, so that's part of the charter, actually, so. And just, to, but from what, um, she was mentioning that there was description that she spoke about businesses on the wharf. So that seems pretty specific. Mm -hmm. uh, is there a reason that her specific complaint wasn't, or issue with the businesses on the wharf weren't included in the minutes? No, there's no specific reason. It was, it's an action. It was just a summarization of the people speaking and what okay. they spoke of. That's why we record the meetings. That's why people can go back to the video also. So that's why we do this action minutes because there is an option to watch the video. I would, yeah, I would just say it's it's pretty difficult watching the video a lot of times and finding exactly where you want to find. Um, and I'll just say for the record, I think having summary minutes would be would do the city a lot more justice in terms of finding out what people actually spoke. Here's 31 people who spoke, and I don't know what they said um, for that one item. And this is nothing about this is just the way it's it's been done for a while. But I'm going to say and be great to. Turn that around, because it's hard to go watch the video. Great. Any other comments at this time? So we have a motion by Councilmember Crone and a second by Councilmember Matthews. Is that correct? Okay. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? No. 
and then okay. well, I was just going to point out that the that the minutes as they're currently prepared are pursuant to the council's uh, policy manual. So sure. were the council to direct um, further elaboration on uh, comments from either council members or members of the public in the minutes that would require an amendment to, to that personnel manual or the procedures manual. Okay, thank you. Okay, so that passed unanimously. So item number three is the item that I pulled, and I just wanted to um, provide an overview of the process. Um, traditionally, the mayor, as long as I've been on council, and I'm not sure how much longer before my time, um, is uh, tasked at the beginning of the year to hear input from um, our council members, all uh, seven, including myself, and to weigh and balance um, their input and um, a number of considerations, time commitment and travel, availability, um, experience, et cetera, and then um, re bring before the council a recommendation. And so that's what you have before you here today. And I just wanted to kind of provide that context so that you and the community are aware of how the process goes, um, what the sort of uh, facilitator role that the mayor plays in that process um, and any questions that may um, be um, amongst the council or the community in regards to that. Are there any questions from the council at this time? About the, about the process? About the process, uh, or for me, or, or on the item in, in general. And then are there any members of the community who would like to address the council on item number three? Seeing none. We'll return for action and deliberation. Is there a motion to move the item? I have some questions. A question? I just have a more, it's a statement and a question, I guess. Uh, so uh, after reviewing, and I totally understand the process and the historic precedent, precedence that exists because of it, uh, but when looking at some of the uh, suggestions and nominations for considerations that were made, I find concern in some of the structure uh, and uh, also the selections that have been made uh, because of a lack of representation uh, as well as, and I, I spoke, we got a chance to meet and talk about it briefly, but I noticed that on the document that's online still, it's still the same. So I'm not sure if any of those things have changed or not, but if not, then especially uh, with regards to the public safety committee uh, that have council members, Myers, Matthews and Crone, uh, on there doesn't provide any representation of lower income and or a diverse representation from socioeconomic backgrounds in the decisions or conversation around public safety in Santa Cruz. And uh, after speaking with the police chief and his vision of the direction that he'd like to see Santa Cruz public safety go, uh, it seems like there should be some more representation there as well as in some of the other uh, committees or groups that were put together. So I just want to express uh, my concern and ambivalence in moving forward with these suggestions, especially with, uh, especially with the public safety um, error or lack, lack there of representation. Um, I want to share uh, Council Member Glover's um, comments as well as um, you know, th the, the words you just said, or, you know, the, what it's been done in the past, there's been um, a fair uh, distribution of these tasks. Um, I would say that a lot of these committees are, are really unknown to the public, for one thing. Um, looking at them, there's 12 primary ones that I think uh, probably have the most interest and people want to be on as far as council members, but one is the ad hoc committee on budget, the Metro, uh, the bus uh, board, the uh, public safety committee, the downtown management committee, the community programs committee, the RTC, uh, visit Santa Cruz, which does um, uh, public relations for the, for the city and for businesses, um, marketing, basically tourism, the farmer's market, uh, the Long Range Development uh, Plan uh, Advisory to UCSC, the Library, LAFCO, and um, and homelessness, um, and I, I just think with these twelve, it just seems like there there's a, a better distribution process. Uh, 
you know, I know the council member Glover didn't get any of his choices that he um, put in for, and I received one. Uh, and uh, yeah, I would I would just um, like to hear from from other council members about you know having a, a fuller conversation about these uh, committees. If I may just briefly, and then I'll see if other council members want to respond. I certainly understand that when. Um, you express interest in an item or serving in a certain way um, as a member of one of these external agencies or committees that um, there is um, the possibility that there won't be an opportunity for everybody to serve. So for example, if I have five requests for an opening of two positions, uh, certainly three people won't get their requests met. And so, um, again, I just want to let you know that when considering these recommendations before you today was a huge variety of fa factors that I tried to balance. So um, um, I, I recognize that there's been times in the past where I didn't get the items that I wanted to serve on. And um, so I, I, I empathize with the disappointment, I guess I would just say, knowing that, um, that that's, par that's partially what the setup is for if you're not able to meet the needs based on the allotted slots, essentially. Other council members wanting to speak? Um, well, I'll just say that um, the mayor does have a task to um, balance the, or uh, consider the desires of individual council members, um, the, um, the range of options, and also concerns for continuity on some commissions or um, assignments. And, um, I didn't get everything I asked for and was surprised at a couple of others. So there, I think we're all in that uh, situation. But uh, my experience is over the years that um, by and large, the uh, assignments, uh, people rise to the occasion and or they learn new things. And it, um, uh, to my mind, has, has um, in the long run worked well. I, I definitely understand the issue that has been raised here. Um, uh, I'd be prepared just to move this. and I. I think it's also important to acknowledge the prerogative of the mayor to do this. Obviously, it has to be confirmed by council, but just to get the discussion moving forward, I am going to move confirmation of the um, uh, assignments that are made in this in this item. I'll second that motion. So motion by Matthew, seconded by myself. Oh, Councilmember yeah. Brown. Well, I mean, I think it's worth just weighing in here to to say that, and I know we had the conversation that I too was. Uh, concerned about the the spread uh, in terms of the those uh, designations. I'm perfectly fine with the um, the commission appointments I got. I understand continuity in addition to all of the other um, uh, factors that you've considered, and I appreciate the challenging task of doing this. Um, um, it's not fun, I know, um, or I've heard. Um, but I, I do think that, at, you know, at some point we, we ought to really be um, looking at how the, um, you know, how we are all represented and, can, and, and have opportunities to serve and represent uh, the city on these various boards and commissions. It's been a serious learning experience for me. I'm looking forward to carrying on with some and taking on new ones. Um, but you know, I, I just want to I want to say that I, I do think that um, certain council members um, have been a bit left out here, and I'd like to make sure that we find a way to address that. Um, so I just put it out there. I w I w oh. I'll just um, add that there will be a, the city ad hoc committees come up and come come and go throughout the year as work kind of um, comes about. So there will be opportunities for more uh, ways for us to collaborate and serve in that regard. Um, and um, I had something else now I, I forgot. So I'll go ahead and move this to you. Yeah, thanks. Um, I, I think that this is this is really serious. And uh, I would I would like to uh, make a substitute motion to um, uh, table this item until our next meeting and have some time for further discussions and uh, for their discussions to go on among council members as well as uh, the public as well, because they've they've been un interested. Some of the folks who who I know who who do read the agendas. So I, I will I will make a substitute motion uh, to take this up uh, to table this right now and take it up January twenty second. There's a motion on the floor. Is there a second? I'm gonna say seeing none. Unless. There's uh. 
Can I say something as I enter into my decision of whatever I decide to move? Or, or um, well, I, my understanding is if the, the motion on the floor will die without discussion, if there's not a second, it will. Correct. It could be <clears throat> reiterated afterwards. I, I, I'm I don't know if I follow what you're. Um, you're correct that the motion dies for lack of a second, uh, but. Um, it could be reintroduced if possible. If Council Member Glover can make a comment and then the yeah. motion could be resurrected. Gotcha. Okay, Council Member Glover. So this item, as mundane as it may seem to people that aren't behind the scenes and thinking about the totality of what's going on, is essentially a symbol or it's setting the stage for our working relationship together as council members over the next four years, two to four years for some of us, who knows how much longer. The concern I have is that if we're not willing or able to work through some kind of a compromising situation where people across the dais feel that their perspectives will be represented and that their preferences have been taken into account through the uh, appointment process, then I fear that it will cascade into a culture of difficulty when trying to reach compromise on other areas of focus. And especially when looking at the public safety committee that is made up of all white people, all over the age of 50, who all, I, to my knowledge, own property in Santa Cruz, it is impossible to get a diverse perspective of representation on how we can reform and change our public safety system so it works better in Santa Cruz. So to have a motion made to push it through and seconded when you understand the concern and you've heard from multiple com uh, of your fellow members expressing that the structure and makeup is not sound from our perspective. Uh, it is concerning and disappointing to me for this to be one of our first things that we're dealing with. So I will second the motion uh, for Council Member Crone's alternative motion to table this discussion for two weeks so that we can work through this and ideally find a way to come out the other side closer as opposed to farther away. Any discussion? We're now discussing on the substitute motion. Yeah. Yes, I'm going to I'm going to vote against that. I, it, again, I thoroughly uh, understand your concern, and I didn't even ask for public safety. So there, it's not a it's not a conspiracy. <laughs> I was that's the one I was surprised to find myself on. Um, uh, and I told the mayor I'm happy to serve where appointed, but uh, an alternative would be to um, confirm this uh, list, but anticipate that there may be opportunities to change the alignment, um, uh, to tweak it, rather than putting the whole thing in abeyance. Um, a lot of these uh, outside commissions, uh, particularly, um, are gearing up for their January meetings and so forth and, and need to move forward. So I'd like to, to confirm globally, uh, but understand the concerns, and there's always the opportunity to make a, a shift uh, at, a, at a subsequent meeting in the very near future, if that sounds amenable. That, that's, that's fine. And if it's specifically to public safety and there's the consensus amongst Mayor, the um, council, I, excuse I, me, I, I, well, I will acknowledge point you. Of order, I'm, point of order, um, when you table something, you vote on it without discussion, I believe. I that is correct. I Council Member Crump yes. pointed that out to me, and I'm, I'm just reading the rule. Okay. <laughs> it requires that all discussion of the item under consideration at the time of the motion be halted immediately without further discussion. So um, I think there's been a motion and a second. You ought to, to vote on the motion to table. So we're, mo we're voting on the substitute motion to table the item without discussion at this time. Okay. All those in favor to table the item to the January 22nd meeting, please say aye. 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 That uh, is, uh, no, all those voting no, say aye. I would say no, excuse me. No. 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 Okay, so that fails for the lack of votes with council members Crone, Glover, Brown voting in favor, council members Matthews, Vice Mayor Cummings, council member um, Myers and myself voting against. So we'll go back to the original motion which was made by council member Matthews, seconded by, by me to uh, pass this and... Um, can, I, can I comment or ask a question? Sure. So at a later point in time, if, it, if council members are able to discuss um, their interest in possibly switching um, between 
different um, committees or agencies. It could be tweaked. In the then we can make those changes in the future. Yeah. And we could, yeah. uh, yes, that's true, absolutely. And I would, in fact, amend my motion to be that we adopt the assignments um, that are put forward in this um, agenda report with the understanding that there may be tweaks in the near future. Absolutely. And I'd be happy if there is consensus. an official word, tweak. I was going <laughs> to say. <laughs> and if there is consensus among the council to reorganize public safety, we can make that the first yeah. task of the mayor. And, so. and then, so that's the motion. And I would just say for those council members who do uh, have some further comments to communicate those with the mayor so that those tweaks can be done at the next meeting. And then we can go forward through the year with the assignments in place. Sure. Oh, one second. Well, there's public comment. I'll just make a quick comment while Nicholas is coming up, uh, or Mr. Whitehead. Um, with the tweak uh, caveat, I would be prepared to move ahead. I do want to make sure that we revisit this, however. Okay. Oh, is there any public comment? Did we already, didn't we, what? did we not? We did public comment. We did not do, we did not we did do public comment, excuse me. Are there, is there any member of the public who would like to speak to this item? <clears throat> You'll be given two minutes. I need two minutes. I would suggest that the Public Safety Committee become a commission, and that would address the issues that Council Member Glover spoke to. Um, I think that what goes on there isn't helpful for the community. It's a kind of safetyism focus on a lot of negatives, and it would be useful to have a broader representation of the commission <coughs> and televised. Any other members of the public who'd like to address the, the, the council on this item? Okay. Seeing none, we'll move it back to deliberation and action. And just for question. clarification, I, um, um, the motion is to pass uh, what was before us today, knowing that it can be modified and tweaked <laughs> as needed. But um, for, for, for my uh, clarification of understanding of the council's will, the, the first request is to look at the public safety makeup. Is that correct? Mm -hmm. Okay. Council Member Crone. Um, could we get clarification on the um, on the Metro Board? How many representatives do we have, and how many? Um, it's not clear to me. Uh, two, two from the city. Uh, it, it was Cynthia Chase and myself. Here it says alternate. So do we have one or do we have two? Um, maybe I'll look to to staff to maybe respond. Uh, I believe we have two. Two. Mm -hmm. Yes. Okay. So yeah, where, where where's that go so on the, on be the enough, list right? here? So, may, so the the. Um, it looked like there was uh, um, an alternate. It says alternate. So perhaps that's not necessarily accurate. We would need to remove alternate. That those are the two appointments. That's right. That's okay. Okay. Well, I, I'm, I'm disappointed um, that uh, there's at least two sevenths of us who have brought this to your attention, and you will not um, change it which is kind of really interesting to me as far as collegiality, getting off on the right foot, beginning of the year. Um, I'm just um, pretty, pretty disappointed that there's not any changes that you, 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 would, you would make. Um, it's well, disappointing. I'll, I'll just respond by saying it's the role of the mayor to hear input from the council and propose recommendations to the full council. Um, these were the recommendations with balancing the various factors that I mentioned earlier that I've brought to the council for approval. That does not preclude the council from doing whatever they may want to do with that. If that's the will of the council to change it, that's the will of the council to change it. So it, so it was my responsibility to prepare this and bring it forward to you, and that's what I have done. Um, balancing, again, that we're a seven-member govern, seven governing body from various sectors and have various input and considerations and, um, uh, and making those appointments uh, based on that. So that's where we're at. If there's the will to change it or um, do anything different, that's, that's the will of the council. I, I will say for the record too that um, Council Member Glover received none of the requests he made as far as I know, and I received one, and some of the folks on this list received four and five. 
of uh, the request they made. Any other discussion at this time? I, I will say uh, that t this process has been incredibly disappointing, not only uh, in the response to the concerns that have been expressed, but also in the, <laughs> the decision breakdown. It was uh, disappointed in some, uh, some of those that made the decisions that they did, just to be completely honest and transparent. Uh, however, um, the fact that I received zero, now it's okay to say, sure, not everyone gets what they want, but to receive zero out of the uh, list that was provided of appointments speaks uh, to me in a way that is discouraging and uncomfortable. So I hope that we can work towards figuring out ways to remedy and address that in a positive manner uh, because I do not feel represented in the slightest by uh, these decisions. I would like to hear from the mayor exactly what went into your decision making and who was consulted. You said that it was experience. You, you, you said to me anyway, and I wrote it down, um, availability um, and interest. And um, I was never asked in, um, about my availability on any of these um, issues. I don't know if other folks were, um, but from, you're, like, how did you make these decisions actually? Like, who made the decisions and how were they made? Because it doesn't seem to me that, um, well, I think we're making the case for experience. Yeah, I can make a case for a lot of these um, boards and commissions. Uh, I don't really understand. I think, I mean, I think from what, I, from what I've already said, it's the balancing of those different factors, essentially. And some folks did let me know their availability or unavailability, if you will. Um, and taking in all of those, uh, that input is sort of how I tried to balance these uh, recommendations to come before the council. I agree with them or not agree with them, that was what I was tasked to do. And if there is the will of the council for me to revisit the recommendation for public safety as the first modification, I'm happy to do that. Um, or if there is a potential shift on how you would like to proceed with this in the future, that's that's the, up to the council as well. But that's what I was asked to do, that's what I did, and that's what's before you today. And by the time that was made public with having heard the concerns, that was what I had already presented to the community at this time. So um, that's where we're at at this point. So if there's not any further, any additional further discussion, would we like to move the item? Um, I was just gonna mention that now knowing that um, the Metro consists of two city council members, one of whom is not an alternate. I'm wondering if that might be taken into consideration to. Mm -hmm. Absolutely, okay. So the motion is to pass this with um, tasking the mayor to revisit the Metro and public safety appointments by the 22nd, okay? At this point, is, if there's not any additional comments, we'll go ahead and vote on the Can, can we also strike the, the word alternate from yeah, the Santa Cruz right. Metropolitan District Board? We actually have two council members who sit on the Metro Board. That's right, and we'll strike the word alternate from that. Okay, at this time we'll take a vote. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? Nay. That passes with Council Member Brown, Council Member Matthews, Council Member Myers, Vice Mayor Cummings and myself voting yes, and Council Member Crone, Council Member Glover voting no. Okay. So the next item that was um, pulled is item number five. And I don't recall who pulled that item. Was it Council Member Matthews? I did. Um, <coughs> this is a proposal to change uh, the time and structure for oral communications. Um, and I personally um, will speak against this. Um, I wanted to hand out to the council, um, this is the, uh, actually the part of the Brown Act that talks about the purpose of oral communications. Um, and you'll notice it's Xerox on the back of a precinct sheet, something that's familiar to all of you. <laughs> <laughs> um, but basically, um, the fundamental purpose of oral communications as written in the government statute is to give an opportunity for the public to address the body on an item that's not on the regular agenda 
and is within the subject matter of the jurisdiction. We, we kind of stray f far afield of that sometimes. And the government code also says that the local agency can adopt reasonable regulations limiting the amount of time allocated in total and for the individual speaker. And um, it's, I think it's quite fair to say that there's an active engagement in oral communications here in Santa Cruz. Uh, it is correct, as was stated in the staff report, that um, at one point it was in the evening, uh, was moved at another point to late afternoon. And there's always a balancing act of uh, those people who have demands of family, demands of work, et cetera. Um, but my main reason for preferring it at the end of the day, at 5.30, is it does accommodate those who have, um, that is, for staying with the current plan. It accommodates those who have a regular uh, daytime work schedule. They can get here um, and they can get home and have the evening with their family. But of equal importance, the items that we have scheduled at 7 p.m. tend to be our great big items. It's a big public hearing on an ordinance, on a development proposal. People come, those meetings are often involve complicated staff presentations, but also a great deal of public interest. And typically, uh, or often I would say, um, the uh, experience of public oral communications is um, contentious, chaotic, <laughs> and has over time been discouraging to the public, uh, the general public that comes and wants to engage um, in the substance of an item and um, is frankly turned off of engagement with the public process as a result of the oral communications experience. Um, so it takes up a half an hour of the evening time non-productively um, and in fact can often be a negative experience. Um, so for that reason, my preference would be to keep it at the uh, afternoon hour. If the decision is to go forward with this, there's some language that just doesn't make sense in the proposed um, language. Like it says, if oral communications um, uh, let's see, if the oral communicate, if the afternoon business concludes earlier than 7 p.m., the council sh shall recess. Well, that makes no sense if we're doing it at seven. You see, I think the language isn't even consistent here. Um, and the language here says if, that oral communications will occur around 7 p.m. If an agenda item is still in progress at 7 p.m., the item will be concluded. Well, there again, that makes no sense. So uh, I think at the very least, if the desire of the majority is to restructure the oral communications to 7 p.m. This language needs to be cleaned up. Um, another thought would be, if the desire is to go to 7 p.m., that oral communications be at 7 and business starts at 7.30. That way people know, am I coming for oral communications or am I coming for the business section? So that that's just another thought. Um, also, um, I think it's very important uh, items that are I items that are shown redlined as five, I guess, on occasions when the speakers remain um, to address the council after 30 minutes of oral communications, uh, quite a long series of options, um, extending maybe the comment period for another 45 minutes or for a total of 45 minutes. I, I personally think those should be stricken. I think the idea, as, as the Brown Act uh, uh, anticipates, we set reasonable limits for the public to come and address us. And the public can communicate with the council in many other different ways, as we all know, with email, with private meetings, and so forth. Um, this is one opportunity, but it's really not to drive the, the, the whole evening. So um, I think it's important to leave to the mayor's discretion the management of the meeting, that is the discretion of the amount of time, setting aside a maximum of half an hour and adjusting the commentary time uh, as the circumstances dictate. So those are my comments. Um, uh, others will weigh in uh, accordingly. I'd, I'd personally like to keep it uh, at 5.30. And if it goes to seven, to clean up the language and leave the timing to the mayor's discretion. Are there any other comments before I open it up to the public to comment at this time? It's um, it's something that slipped in uh, the last 
four or five years, oral communication. Uh, I see it as one of the, the essence, one of the essences of, of a democracy where we open the podium and we hear from the public on items not on our agenda. Um, it's been extremely important, at least to folks that I've spoken to in the community. Um, and it would be interesting to look at when oral communication actually started, um, meaning when, it's, when it was at five or 5.30, it's been a floating time. Um, it rarely begins at that time. And it's very difficult. People have often been frustrated, they leave. It started as late after six. Uh, people can't uh, guarantee you know, what time it's gonna begin. Um, in addition, I don't know if 5.30 is not, a, a lot of people are sitting on 17 when it's 5.30. Um, and also the fact that they could be home and watching it too at a fixed time has been important in the history of Santa Cruz. So um, I agree with Council Member uh, Matthews that it, we should advertise oral communications at 7 p.m. and then 7.30 regular business. Um, and uh, as far as the time allotted, if it's, if it's an issue that just happened that week or day in Santa Cruz and people are really urgently want to talk about it, uh, I would definitely uh, have the mayor exercise her discretion in extending it to 45 minutes, it just gives it that. Um, but 30 minutes, I think, is, is a, a, a good amount of time to listen to the public every two weeks. And if there's less than 10 people in the room um, I, who want to speak, address the council, I, I would um, you know, like to see it at three minutes. And that's, that's why it was, it was in here. Thank you, Mayor. Are there any other comments? Councilor Brown. Uh, <clears throat> so I guess I'll just uh, I'll weigh in for a moment. I, you know, I've been clear since I've been on the council that I believe that 7 p.m. is an appropriate time for rural communications. Um, I really uh, appreciate the idea of having time certain. I agree with council member Matthews that um, do, if we're gonna do it this way, doing it time certain at seven and then having our business meeting begin at 7.30 is a good idea to um, eliminate that uh, limbo that people sit in. And it's, it's you know, with the 5.30, you know, at or around 5.30, it's been that way and it's been frustrating, I think, for people. Um, so I, I really support this because of the time certain. I am really okay with this being up to the discretion of mayor whether or not to extend the oral communications period based upon uh, demand uh, from from the public. What I see World Communications is for is an opportunity <coughs> to address us on items not on the agenda. Now that, in our experience, has been uh, you know, liberally used <laughs> by um, you know regular uh, commenters, communicators. It also has been an opportunity for members of the public to bring items to our attention that that may be have just come up, items that we are not aware of in a way that really um, that, that we hear it right. So, getting an email about something is different than somebody showing up and saying this is happening in my neighborhood or you know this is this has come up. And it provides an opportunity for us to hear from those folks and then uh, hopefully agendize something and or get it addressed through staff. So I, I really want to make that as accessible to the public as possible. So I'm going to support this. I am really okay with the uh, proposed changes and I think it's, it's fine to have it be the discretion of the mayor about whether or not we extend it if there really is a major issue that people want to come and weigh in on that we haven't agendized. Um, and so I, that's, those are my general comments about the, the proposal as it is. Any additional comments at this time? I'll just weigh in. I, I agree that uh, we should uh, advertise at the 7.30, the 7 and 7.30 periods so that people who uh, want to come from one or the other should mm -hmm. have very clear ability to do so and, and know that it, it, it will be honored. Additional comments? Before we open up to public comment, I'll just say um, this is something we've brought that's been brought before the council a couple of times. We made the modification to the 5:30, um, and and 
one of the things that I felt good about when changing it from 5 p.m. to 5.30 is that it does allow for that window of time when people are commuting home to get here in by 5.30. And if thinking about who can access um, oral communications, one of the things that I've brought up in the past is that 5.30 for a working parent is actually a lot easier than a 7 p.m. time when you're trying to prepare dinner and um, deal with the child kind of experience. So in terms of who um, that change in timeline and timing um, uh, meets that need, I, um, I'm not quite sure who we're modifying for that. Um, and then in terms, uh, but I'm hearing sort of two things, which one is the assurance of a time certain so that the community is aware that we'll have an oral communication period um, and, then a, and then a proposal for a change. I do share concerns that um, with the 7 p.m. Um, item like we have this evening, that when you start oral communications at seven, it really does push back um, what will be often a very uh, intensive, uh, long conversation. Um, so there is sort of that personal concern around the 7 p.m. Um, time. Um, and I know also that we have three new council members who haven't necessarily experienced oral communications at this point. Uh, so my preference would be to uh, postpone this item and um, and have a, the new council have a sense of what that could be. We could potentially discuss maybe a time certain of 5.30, which would be a different discussion. Um, but in terms of changing it to seven, I, I don't support that at this time. But at this point before I open it up, I'll bring it back to council, but I'll open it up to the community to weigh in, and you'll be given two minutes, so. Mayor, okay, then I'll bring it back council to members, Gillian Greensite. For the first 30 odd years of my involvement with uh, city council, oral communications was always at seven. And the big items uh, of weight and importance were always in the evening. And both of those changed uh, so that oral communications was a floating time and most of the big items were in the daytime and often there was no evening meeting. Um, in the earlier days after oral communications, sometimes council went to midnight, sometimes rarely, but sometimes even longer. Hard for you and staff, but important, I think. The problem with the earlier time when it was shifted to the afternoon was that it was crammed in with the important items. So I had a big item and sometimes in the middle of it, uh, you stopped it, had oral communications and picked it up again. And it was an item near and dear to my heart and all of the council members were distracted. And I'm going, oh no, it might have been something I paid $500 for, like a tree appeal. So that floating time has been very non-public friendly. Um, so my uh, perspective, it would be good to have it at seven. I see one problem though with your trying to advertise uh, seven o'clock oral communications, which I think would be great, and a fixed time for your business, hoping now that more business will be in the evening, is that if there's two people for oral communications in eight minutes or four minutes, you could start your business. But if you've advertised it for 7.30, that's going to be a problem. So I think you have to wrestle with that a bit. But I really feel going back to seven, a fixed time, I know sometimes it can be tedious, uh, repetitive, but it also, I think, traditionally was a much better public process. So hoping to see that. And I apologize, okay. I have to go. Thank, Thank you very you. much. Now, is there any other speakers who'd like to speak to this item? Okay. Please come forward, you'll be given two minutes. Thank you. Um, good evening, everyone. Such a great city council. Thank you uh, for all your service. Um, I want to support the seven o'clock um, time certain oral communications. I think, uh, it would just work out better for f working families uh, and community members. I think this, uh, the oral communications as it is, and it's already been stated that it's, uh, <laughs> it's been all over the map. So I, I wanna support that. And then it makes sense to start business at 7.30. Um, I know that families, I mean, people are still on the road. <laughs> I mean, s many of us have the luxury of having, uh, being uh, workers here in the city, but there are many people on the road at five, 5.30, 6, 6.30, and 
even though I do know that it is hard for families, I think that seven o'clock works. I think it's hard for families anyway. I just think it's just tough having kids in the town the way it is with all the traffic and all. So I, I really want to, you to think about um, people who have to commute. There's so many people commuting. The commuting time is off the charts. And that five, 5.30 is really not possible anymore given the traffic and if you really want people to show up and be part of government, I think we need to make this change. Thank you. Thank you. Any other members of the public? <coughs> You'll be given two minutes. Namaste <clears throat> and bula bula. Bula bula bula, kava kava, lava lava, raja raja, bali bali. Shout outs to IIT and Marshall Systems. Um, I have previously, under uh, two minute comment periods, uh, focused on predictions because that has a, a way of in, uh, injecting the threads that are being shared and offered into, uh, uh, into the bowl of content in a uh, somewhat wieldy documentary process. Um, I just, I just want to, could you pause the, I just want to let you know that we're discussing oral communications right. in the time. Is, is, are your right. comments really And as uh, Congress, oh, I mean, excuse me, as Council Member Brown indicated, these two minute periods are really up to the interlocutor to optimize in a way that doesn't waste anyone's time. And I often try to keep it short anyway. <clears throat> uh, and this brings up the collateral topic of congestion. And, and my, my, the bullet I want to share on congestion is that I anticipate a bond measure in the future. Uh, again, Agent Orange is uh, offering a prediction about the future. In this case, a bond measure, which will be between uh, 400 million and 1.1 billion with potential sweet spots of 775 million or 883 million, where these would uh, facilitate the uh, congestion relieving plan, the low hanging fruit that was identified by a recent study, <coughs> where uh, shoulders on the highways, Highway 1, for example, for say four or five mile stretch, which can be optical fiber project uh, enhanced. Uh, these can be superconducting metal uh, levitating tracks the way Japan and China have not been depriving their citizens of speed rail. So it's possible to have a 21st century technology project in our humble little county. Uh, but. Uh, okay. Well, thank you very much. I thank you. Okay. Um, if there aren't any other members of the public who'd like to speak to this item, we'll bring it back to the council for action and deliberation. I'm gonna actually acknowledge council member uh, Glover for uh, first. Thank you. I think our job as council members should be to make democracy more accessible and not less accessible. And from what I've heard from the community, both here and uh, in communication outside, is that oral communications especially the way the city council structured it has made it so the democracy is not accessible. So I think we should be doing everything that we can to maximize the access people have to come and speak with us and make it so it's as expected as possible so that people can get here, whether or not that results in us having, as was uh, suggested as a possible scenario, a gap of open time uh, if there aren't enough people to fill the solid and secured space. In that situation, we could recess for a couple minutes, as I'm sure we wouldn't mind getting up and going to the bathroom until we restarted our original, original business at 7.30. And I do want to express some concern because with all due respect, Mayor, I think what I heard you say was that for parents with small children, it's easier at 5.30. And if that's the case, you don't know why we would move the time. Did I mishear you? You did. So what I said, if I don't know the intention of moving the time, but if we're thinking about accessibility, coming from being a parent of small children, actually 5.30 is better for me uh -huh. and for a lot of the working people that I know who then could stop by on their way home prior to going home, kind of engaging in uh, dinner preparation, et cetera, before coming back for oral communications. So that was my statement. Right. Um, I'm just concerned that with that perspective, because I did, even in that one, it sounds like you said you don't understand why we would change it or something. Um, it's 
the other people outside of the parental groups and outside of the people that are privileged enough to live in a family unit in Santa Cruz and be off work and home by 5.30. So there's students that are involved in those kinds of things where they're getting out of campus and out of school. Uh, there's people that are working in service jobs that are forced to uh, be in Watsonville or come back this way. There are people that are coming from over the hill and all of these other reasons why moving the time to a later date, even though it may not directly benefit people with small families from your perspective, thinking about the larger community outside of just that group. Um, and it's, it's very concerning, I would say, uh, to, for that energy from my perspective to come. And I really, really hope that as we think about this and contemplate the value of changing it and providing a set time, we think outside of our own privilege and outside of our own lives and outside of the circles of people that we hang out with and to the people at the very bottom of our socioeconomic ladder that find it difficult to uh, participate in the timelines that have been expressed. Okay, I appreciate your um, perspective. And I'll just, um, for clarification, reiterate that I heard that I don't know who we're trying to change this time to meet the needs of, but that was my experience. Until I do understand who we're not able to access, it feels sort of arbitrary to me to change the time. But what I did hear was that there was a, a concern, and what I've heard from the community is concern around the the moving time um, of 5.30 before or after, depending on the agenda. And that I feel is, um, I, I, I have heard that concern, that it's more about the time certain. Um, are there any other council members? Can I just like respond to, to that? Uh, one second, if there, if there are there any other council members who'd like to speak to this item at this time or comment? No? Okay, go ahead. I, I would just say that in saying that changing the time to a later date seems arbitrary, I'm concerned that it illustrates a severe disconnect between the reality of life of low-income people and what's represented on the perspective of the dais. Sure, so. and, and if there's data to substantiate that, I'd be happy to revisit that at 7 p.m. So at this point um, would be the opportunity for action and deliberation. It was my preference to postpone this item um, and this change um, based on the fact that there hasn't even been one opportunity for oral communications amongst the new council at this point, as well as we'll be revisiting how we do our um, council uh, procedures and norms in a future time anyhow. Um, Councilmember Matthews and then Councilmember Cummings, uh, Vice Mayor Cummings. Um, I'm gonna be really honest here. My, my preference was to table this and give a time for new council members to have some experience but I see that every single item is coming forth as a litmus test on um, where we fall on some spectrum. And um, as I said in December, that is the last dynamic I want to reinforce or perpetuate. So I am actually going to move that we uh, may uh, pass a modified language for this that would move oral communications to seven it can always be changed in the future, but I would I would change the language, which I think, frankly, was just kind of sloppy here. Oral communications will be held at the beginning of the evening session, which will occur on or about 7 p.m. Strike all the rest. If oral communications concludes earlier than 7.30, council shall re recess and reconvene at 7.30 and begin the um, business portion of the meeting, to begin the business portion of the meeting. 30 minutes will be allotted. No individual will be allowed to speak for more than three minutes. Strike the next two items. No individual may speak more than once during oral communications and all the rest as shown. I would like to, to have the uh, star, the asterisk at the bottom, time limits may be increased or decreased at the mayor's discretion, actually have a number attached to it. So that would be my motion. I'll second that. Okay. Is there further discussion, uh, Vice Mayor? Any oh, further discussion? Yeah, oh, no, my question was around the language. Okay. That's just my letter. Okay. Question. All right. Go ahead. Um, 
who, I, I'm trying to figure out who put this policy statement here, because that wasn't uh, anything that, uh, the language that I, the, the three council members who brought this forward are, is, you know, in the, in the discussion. I don't know where the policy statement came from, so I didn't. Um, are, you, are you talking about the asterisk? Well, you just where it says city council meeting oral communications policy statement. It's in our council policy. Uh, I, I'm not, I don't have it in front of me, but uh, there, this is a, this is a. It's an existing policy. It's an existing, it's an existing city council, council policy. Policies. So it's an amendment to the existing policy. Right. So that, that's been the one that's been in place. Okay, I'm what sorry. What you see I, is a red line version. Okay, yes. it was without the red lines. <laughs> well, there, there was a red line version in credit stage. Oh, sorry, okay, yes, got it. Um, I appreciate taking out the at or around 7 p.m. because that, that time certain at 7 p.m. is really, I think, um, helpful. Uh, but I'm, I'm, I'm gonna go ahead and, and join you in, in uh, voting yes on this. I think it's more than time has come. I'm just gonna ask the city clerk if she um, caught all of the proposed revisions. Mm -hmm. Okay, so there's a motion by, oh, is there a further discussion? This is a statement uh, pertaining to uh, something that was mentioned earlier. On this issue? Okay. Yeah, um, so it was just mentioned that this, uh, or every issue is turning into a litmus test to fall, so find out where we fall on the spectrum. I would say that every issue that comes before us as a city council is a litmus test to find out where we fall on the spectrum. And it is my duty to bring up uh, every time when I feel that this body is not taking into consideration a certain portion of our community. Okay, so at this point we're gonna vote on the item. I have, I have a question and we too, because um, I, I wanna, because I do also want to see um, improved communications amongst council members. I think and if I can just I interject here, uh, Council Member Crone, as it relates to this item right now, we're voting on the oral communication yeah. at 7 p.m. I think we have an opportunity. Yeah, it, we will it have does, it, it, because um, council member made a comment about wanting to see things improve. And you know, we started that first agenda item and there was no movement on um, boards and commissions. Okay, well we already voted real, on this item. It's so a real, this point uh, we're so now, it, but I, I am a, very much appreciative of the council member moving this item. Uh, I just wanna okay. put that out there. Great, okay, at this point, um, we'll go ahead and take the vote on the item. All those in favor of the motion made by council member Matthews with the modified language, seconded by uh, council member Myers, please say aye. 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 Opposed? M myself. So that passes beyond, uh, that passes with council member Brown, council member Myers, I'm sorry, council member Matthews, council member Crone, Glover, Myers, and vice mayor Cummings. Um, voting yes and myself voting no. Okay, so the next item is item number six, which was the Charter Amendment Committee. And um, I don't recall who that, who pulled that item. Cynthia did. Oh, uh, Councilman Matthews? Yes, um, uh, I don't support the item, uh, the suggestion to add five additional members. Um, I think there was a great uh, deal of thought given into the formation of this committee. There was an open uh, application period with both uh, individual and at-large appointments. Uh, and I would say most importantly, that committee has been seated. They've begun their work. They're, to my understanding, cohesive. They've had uh, discussions that are not highly politicized, but are focused on the issues that were presented before them. So um, I would like to um, just have that committee continue on its work, understanding that there will be a lot of community interest in this, uh, community engagement. The committee that's been appointed will come forward with recommendations or not, and they will come to us for decisions. So this is the council that will ultimately uh, make the decisions on whatever the result is of that um, committee that already is appointed and functioning. Any additional comments at this time? Um, from what I understood from talking to our, our staff is that they haven't, um, they've had two meetings so far. The third meeting is January 30th. Uh, they haven't begun talking about directly about the issues that we've tasked the, the group with. Um, and, and just in terms of 
fairness and, and, and parity, I, um, my sense is that if I was coming on the council, I would like to also have um, someone, an, an appointment to um, this body. And this body is, I see it as really important um, or p the potential for important work. Um, there's a powerhouse of, of experienced people on there. Um, I do think it is lacking uh, uh, more student voices. I know there's one student on there. Um, and I'd just like to see, you know, us have more, a robust discussion that actually, you know, represents a, the many sectors of Santa Cruz. Um, right now, I don't, I don't know if it's every, everything's involved in that or everyone's involved, every voice. Um, as a, a newly elected member, um, I actually um, would prefer that the committee continue its work at its uh, existing makeup and size. Um, while I always would appreciate having a voice into some of these kinds of things, um, I want to uh, want to uh, just acknowledge that the process is underway. There's uh, qualified people on the committee. Uh, adding five additional people brings the total to 18, which I believe is an excessively large uh, committee. And um, so I'm going to speak for myself uh, in this situation and uh, be firm that uh, it looks like from the process that was uh, completed to seat people on um, this committee, there was directly appointed um, folks from council members and then six at-large uh, appointed members, uh, again, through application and letter of interest process. and. Uh, I'd like to honor the committee process and keep it moving and uh, don't see a need to uh, make this change. Any other comments before we open it up to the public? Vice Mayor Cummings. I know that this committee was formed uh, during the previous city council and I have one of the questions that I've had regarding this and wanted to open up for discussion was whether or not the issues and the items that are being discussed by this committee is actually reflective of um, the desires of the current city council as well. Um, I do also feel like having representation on um, on a commission or on a committee that's going to be looking at um, direct elected mayors, district elections, compensation, among other uh, items. I feel that it would be good for uh, some of the new members to have representation, especially given the fact that they've only had two meetings. I think that if it was further along in the process, where if they were towards the end of um, their recommendations, I would maybe feel that it wouldn't be appropriate for us to include new members, but given the fact that they've only had two meetings, I think that this is an early enough stage to where if we, um, if the council or members of the council feel that they would have, want to have representation, that this would be a good time. And I'd also, again, as I mentioned before, would like to open up the discussion as to what um, the committee is actually addressing in terms of these different items. Um, Okay, Councilmember Brown. Yeah, I agree with Vice Mayor Cummings. I, you know, this. Let's just reiterate that this was a committee established by previous council, and uh, at the time there were uh, there was a laundry list of items to for that committee to discuss uh, or to take up and and consider. And I, I do think that we're at a place now with the new council members being seated and, and from the conversations I've had with actual committee members, it's not entirely clear what, um, what our objectives are here. So I do think it's worth having that conversation. Um, I also, you know, I signed on to this agenda report because I do believe that uh, new council members should have representation whether they um, feel like they want it or not or need it or not. Um, I just think that actually is, uh, you know, uh, actually d part of the democratic process. Um, but I um, am willing to, uh, you know, I, I just would like to see what people think. If, if there are council members who feel like they don't have enough information, maybe the, the unclear mandate, you know, I mean, how do we proceed in light of that? Um, 
I, I think that this is an opportunity to do that. Mm. I'll weigh in briefly and then I'll um, turn it over to Councilmember Crone. Um, one of the things that gave me pause when we originally brought this item forward um, was the fact that we were gonna be having a new council uh, pretty closely after we decided to move forward with it, but it was unanimously approved by the current council at the time to move forward with that structure regardless of that uh, change. So um, I, I, um, I'm hesitant to, to switch that up knowing that we kind of made an informed decision at that time, knowing that the council would be changing, the makeup of the council would be changing. Um, I do uh, agree that um, it feels um, difficult if we're going to add members or um, ask folks to spend, uh, volunteer to spend their time and our staff to spend their time, um, that we wanna have a clear purpose and expectation of outcome. And for me, that would come probably first before even changing the makeup of um, the, uh, the committee. At, so that would be sort of what I'm hearing and I agree with in terms of what um, challenges sort of present themselves with this specific committee. Um, Council Member Crone, and then I'll open it up to the public. Thanks, I'm just wondering if it's appropriate to ask Ms. Hemar to, to come forward and just give us a summary, because um, I, I heard um, Vice Mayor Cummings might had some questions there, and maybe we can just have some information exchanged about what, what's taken place so far with the, with the committee. Sure, <coughs> thank you, Casey, and maybe we'll just have a brief summary um, about this item. Hi, uh, Casey Hingmard, Principal Management management Analyst in the City Manager's Office. Uh, the committee has had about six hours of meetings. Um, a set, we've, a set, they've spent a lot of time uh, getting to un understand each other, uh, try to understand the council's intentions in the direction that was given. Um, and those recordings of those six hours of meetings are available on our website. Uh, as well as our minutes and everything. And um, there was considerable work put into getting us to this point. They've developed a work plan. They finalized bylaws. And um, it's, uh, Council Member Crone is correct. We've not gotten into the substantive part of the uh, direction. We were planning to start that on January 30th. But considerable work has gone into it up to this point. Thank you, Casey. Are there any questions at this time? Seeing none, we'll open it up to the public to see if there's any comments, and you'll be given two minutes to address the council on this item. Happy New Year, Council. Uh, my name is Elise Casby, and I'm just a generalist activist in the public interest. Um, I just wanted to say for my time, I'd like to ask a question of the council, and that is a brief summary of what exactly is, if you could just you know, just a short summary um, of what exactly is the Charter Amendment Committee so that the public might have a greater understanding. And I'd like to ask if I could stop my time there and then have it restored after you answer. Uh, no, I'm, I apologize. At this okay. point, we're just gonna open it up for public comment and then we'll re revisit, the council will revisit the item, okay. at which time we can ask staff potentially to come up and briefly cover what this is. Okay. So. Um, I think my question illustrates what is a, a more typical position in the public, and that is that given the lives that we lead these days, it's extremely difficult to be able to keep on top of council business. Even if you have a personal laptop and a smartphone and a stable place to live, you can still have a difficult time finding out what's really happening in our city government. So now I just heard some things and I attend a fair amount of city council meetings. Um, government is my passion and interest. The policy and city participation, that is citizen participation in our government is my complete goal and objective. Um, so I don't understand what this committee is almost at all at this moment. I admit I did not look into the agenda in advance, partly because I was in Sacramento yesterday lobbying Governor Newsom, the new governor, for a green new deal. So I just wanna say that I'm not even somebody who has a terribly busy life compared to a lot of people. It seems that this charter amendment might be absolutely crucial 
to the lives of our citizen in terms of jurisdictions, power and responsibility that is held by representatives. So I just want to say that I would hope that this would go through a, a thorough, thorough vetting by the public and the council. And please don't vote fully on this today. Thank you. Speaker, please. Good evening, Mayor Watkins and members of the City Council. Congratulations to the new faces I see on the City Council. Um, my name is Kesef Kumar. I am a senior at UC Santa Cruz and I serve on the Charter Amendment Committee. I'm here tonight to talk a little bit about my perspective. Um, I think a lot of the substantive conversation regarding the logistics of this committee have already been had. Um, I'd like to reiterate that there has been time taken to both get to know each other on the 13 person committee of which I'm the youngest, but there's also been time taken to start to discuss the items. And I think that what's been highlighted to me in discussion of those items is I at no point have had this feeling of, well, this person is saying this because they were appointed by so-and-so council member. And I don't believe anyone has thought that way about myself. Um, if, for the council members who are returning, you'll remember that I went through the general process to be appointed to this committee. And in doing so, I was asked questions about both my qualification and the manner that I approached the committee in. And I responded that I wanted to do it in an academic manner. Um, I believe I've so far lived up to that. Yes, the brunt of the work begins at this upcoming meeting. And at this point, I'm hoping that I can meet with the new city council members, um, council member Glover, Myers and Cummings before we make a decision about needing more, as we're calling it right now, more representation. Um, I believe that I can fairly represent all three of your views um, in a way that'll bring them to the table for conversation in a larger context. Um, I don't see it as a very partisan battle about, or even partisan in Santa Cruz terms, battle about what's going to pass and what's not going to pass. There is a room of people, 13 people, who are just discussing the issues. Thank, Thank you, you so much. Thank you. Next speaker, please, and you'll be given two minutes. <clears throat> it was Dave Willis. First, I wanted to say, when the guy was saying something, that's the first information I've had pertaining to a committee. Like the lady came up, she said a lot of words, but she didn't say nothing, I didn't hear nothing. What exactly is the work? What is the committee? We need clarity. And if you are a member, then you are a member, you're in. You should be entitled to all of whatever the protections, whatever the good things about this is, period. You being new has nothing to do with it. You're in, you're a member, full, power, maturities, whatever, come with that, period. So whatever this committee is, like the lady was saying something, I didn't hear nothing, what work is it? I need to hear something, not just a lot of words. I'm not here for that. Oh, and it's good seeing you new people, you look good to me. Thanks a lot. Thank you. Are there any members of the public you'd like to address the count? Are there any additional members of the public in the audience who would like to address the council on item number six, the charter committee? Okay, you'll be our last uh, speaker and you'll be given two minutes. On the charter committee? Okay, we haven't done oral communication steps. This is on the charter committee. And oral communications will start at 5.30. Yeah. No problem. Yeah. This is addressing the council on the charter amendment committee and you'll be given two minutes on that. Great, thank you. So, bula bula. Um, so, Agent Orange in this case wants to uh, address uh, a D word directly, and that is the diversity word. Uh, I was very heartened by what uh, Councilmember Glover was trying to express, and uh, also uh, Councilmember Myers uh, uh, did this issue of uh, what's an optimal number for a committee size. Uh, I believe the overarching principles here are uh, diversity scores, metrics, best practices, 
Uh, if anyone needs help on downloading a good PDF document in this category, I would go to GAO. If anyone needs help with GAO, please uh, contact Homeland Security uh, uh, um, uh, Secretary uh, Kristen Nielsen and just ask for the barn owl truck, and we will optimize that for you, even though we might be inbound to uh, Houston, Texas, support the border uh, National Guard action of 100,000 deployment uh, by uh, hopefully Friday midnight or Saturday midnight uh, after tours to uh, Orlando and uh, New Orleans. Um, <clears throat> uh, just to uh, wrap up in my remaining 59 minutes, uh, a second, <laughs> it can be helpful to take a deep breath at Buzz Lightyear light speeds. Um, I believe uh, Santa Cruz will have great pride in delivering uh, a caravan of products to uh, the Texas uh, portion of the National Guard and the uh, deployment uh, near the border. Uh, with uh, support from Air National Guard 130th, uh, 138th Airlift Wing, 147th Attack Wing, which has the MQ-9 Reaper Squadron, uh, the 149th Fighter Wing, uh, the Texas Air National Guard Headquarters, which is at Camp May uh, Mabry in Austin, and the Air Component Command, of course, with habit, which has embedded units in uh, San Antonio, Austin, Fort Worth, Garland, Houston, and LaPorte, which also has a Naval Air Station. Uh, uh, the bottom line is I believe that the experience at the border will be a great, giant, big, soft, green blanket. Thank you. And I'll, I'll just remind um, members of the public, if there's an item before us, then the uh, comments will uh, need to be specific to that item, um, and you'll be given two minutes. I, I believe we have no more uh, members of the public who are interested in speaking, unless you are, sir, in terms of the Charter Committee item, or... Okay, and you'll be our last speaker. Are there any additional members of the public who'd like to speak to this item? Okay, look, I lived in South Africa, okay? My name's Nicholas Whitehead. I lived in South Africa. My parents took extreme risks so that everybody could be represented there. When I was in London, England, it was the Irish who weren't represented and we were killing them and jailing them. And I was bitter about that. When I came to America, I heard Dr. Luther King, and I saw his successor. In my opinion, Jesse Jackson, Reverend Jesse Jackson, was not a troublemaker. He wanted a positive future for this nation. So please, do the right thing here in our little town. Build the rainbow, will you? Put these people on the required committee. Okay. All right. So we'll now close the public comment portion of the um, meeting, I mean of the item, and we'll go ahead and bring it back to the council for action and deliberation. Um, uh, council member uh, Glover. So while I can appreciate the hesitation by some council members to add an additional five members, which would be the two at large nominations, I do agree with fellow council members that it is important uh, at least from my perspective, that we incorporate or allow for new council members to have one appointee to represent their position and or people that they feel are um, up to the task. A uh, great example, I appreciate Kasev uh, uh, coming up to speak. However, if you, my friend, are the youngest person on the committee, then we need to really mix things up a little bit. I'm not sure how much, how old you are, I don't know if I can ask questions, right? I can't ask questions. I don't know how old you are, but um, the, and I haven't, I personally haven't seen the committee, but I do know that from your statement that you believe that you would represent my position based off of that statement and following your political work over the last uh, six months or so, six months to eight months, I don't believe that we share the same values when it comes to certain aspects of the community. So with that, uh, <laughs> and with that knowledge, I think it's incredibly important that as uh, Mr. Willis said, that we have severe uh, intention in our representation and make sure to uh, give the opportunity for people to make those appointments and also to answer the, uh, or to make a statement as to 
why it's so important, this charter committee uh, is going to be looking at items like determining if the mayor is elected directly through elections instead of it being appointed by the city council. That's incredibly important. Whether or not we're gonna break the city up into district elections so that each different area will have to do that. Some people say it's great, some people say it will disproportionately impact people of color. So we need to seriously be thinking about that with the representation of who's on the body. Other things are compensation and the size of the council, full-time versus part-time pay and participation in our allocations. And then we get into the other aspects of things like ranked choice voting, which will completely transition the way that we do voting here in Santa Cruz and look at other aspects of ways to support the managers, the city manager's office and polling of the community. So these are incredibly essential issues that are gonna be dealt with in these committees and to not have a representative that can, um, that can echo and or represent my personal values uh, as a council member, I think would uh, do us a disservice as a community. Mr. Myers, and then council member Cronin. I just wanna make sure we're clear on, on sort of what this committee will be doing and then our role as the city council in terms of the final outcomes out of the committee. Because I think, uh, I think we may be a little bit little bit, uh, we're, we're, I think we're giving a lot of power to this committee right now. And so the role of the committee is really to be advisory to the city council. Uh, the city council ultimately will make the decision um, based on the recommendations coming from the, from the committee. And I would imagine we might have at least one or two briefings from the committee. Usually I know when I've served on committee, there's usually um, uh, a couple of times when the work comes forward. I don't know exactly, um, Casey without seeing their work plan, but I would see, I would assume that there will be bits or parts of, of things that are brought forward to us. Um, certainly we have a lot of representation on our council, thankfully, um, from all different perspectives. And uh, I think, um, I think it's, it will be our job ultimately to take the information brought by the committee and, uh, and discuss the things that I think are of interest, um, for example, to Council Member Glover and, and maybe others here at the, at the dais. So um, I think that um, committees can be uh, a lot, it can be time consuming. We have assigned staff to them. Um, there are efficiencies in terms of maintaining a committee that's a good working committee that's doing the charge. Um, we certainly will um, receive, I'm sure, the work plan and the bylaws either as an information item. Um, so I think uh, it's Im incumbent upon uh, the new members to uh, engage with committee members, look at the materials, acquaint ourselves with ho what's going on, and uh, try to make this committee as efficient as possible. If these are, are important questions to our community, it's important to, to do the work and get it done. Um, and again, I think there's efficiencies in, in the amount of people involved, and I think um, there's, there's transparency in terms of how we can potentially uh, understand more and, and learn as, as the committee's going. So again, I just, I think, uh, I just wanna make sure that everyone's clear that this, this will come back to us as a body and that we will be engaged in it um, in our roles as council members. Yeah, I, I also agree with, um Councilmember Myers about ultimately this will come back to the city council. Um, so it's not really about um, a, a group of people making decisions for us, but I think enlarging the committee will be diversifying the committee. And um, saying that, I wanna move this recommendation, a motion to add five additional members to the charter amendment committee with one member of each appointed by council members Cummings, Glover and Myers, and two at large nominations made by a majority uh, vote of the city council. Is there a second to that motion? Second. So that was a motion by Councilmember Crone, seconded by uh, Councilmember Glover. Um, Casey, did you want to add anything? I see, I'm sorry, I just saw you standing. I don't. I, I wondered. I, I would, if you if you want to add what I heard from Councilmember Brown in terms of uh, the committee feeling um, not necessarily clear in their ask. I just, I wanted to clarify a couple of things and um, that in reviewing the direction that was provided to the committee uh, from the council direction and then also watching the video of it, of the, when the council gave the direction multiple times, it, it wasn't, ter it, it's not terribly clear. So uh, the, the members of the committee looked at that and also, and our, the understanding that the committee came to was that it was an initial review 
they are conducting an initial review of these to, to recommend to the council whether or not they should look into these specific topics. Um, and with relation to uh, particular slant or bias, my observation as a staffer is that they are making a very concerted effort to, to bring in independent um, folks or people who are not employed at the city to try and inform them as they're studying these matters. Um, and as a staffer, I'm, I actually like that because I don't wanna be perceived as trying to push anything in a particular way. And so um, that they're, they're really making an effort at trying to, to maintain you know, some independence. And, um, and I, I will say my observation also is that they're not people who are um, gonna be convinced or have their arms twisted to do something. Everybody's pretty vocal um, about their perspective. That being said, you all are the council and we're here to serve you, so. I think I saw council member Matthews. Yes. Um, just for the information of the audience, uh, those members who weren't familiar with this, uh, it has been restated. This is a suggestion, a, a pr proposal to modify the composition of a committee that's already been established. Uh, this was an initiative by uh, then Mayor David Terrazas in, um, uh, in August to establish a charter committee. As I think most of you know who watch politics, there's been lots of interest for years. There should be district elections. There should not be district elections. There should be a directly elected mayor. There should not. How long should that term be, et cetera? Those, those questions have been out there for years. And so the uh, idea of this was to establish a citizen committee to investigate those ideas and uh, report back to the council. Either, yes, we think it's a good idea to propose a change in this way, or no, leave it alone. Um, that's entirely up in the air. So uh, as a result of that, there was a study session and it came back and uh, as has been explained already at previous council meetings, uh, each of the existing council members at that time made one direct appointment and there were some at-large members. So the proposal coming back is in light of the uh, recent election to add three more directly elected members and some more at-large members. So just, just for your information, that's, that's the question before us. Um, and I appreciate the confusion because I was at that meeting and it started out with kind of a discrete list of things to study and then everything in the kitchen soup, kitchen sink got thrown in. So that list grew and grew. And I imagine that one of the first jobs of the uh, committee will be to refine that and say the most important things to um, study are the following. But I also appreciate Donna's uh, comment that very often when there are uh, commissions that uh, they come back and report to council and basically say, here's where we are. Is this what you had in mind? <laughs> Something like that. So particularly given the nature of this, um, some priority items and then kind of everyone's wish list, uh, I think probably be a good idea to clarify. This is gonna be a challenge. Having said all that, uh, I would like to propose an amendment that um, uh, adds additional direct appointments um, I guess the amendment would be deleting the two at large, just add the three direct appointments, but delete the two additional at large. So if that's an agreeable amendment, we could move forward. Is that a friendly amendment to the yeah. motion? Oh, well, it's it, proposed as a friendly okay. amendment. It, it's not because okay. um, it is, we are talking about politics and it was an incredible, I mean, I work with David on, on crafting this. We've spent a couple months talking about it and coming up with various things and we don't necessarily share the same politics. And um, I ran into him the other day, he totally understands too why new council members and you know we would wanna add uh, more members to the, you know, it started out like this and you know you move it like that and you get more voices. I, I think it's real important to have more voices um, in a group like this because the city charter is a kitchen sink. If you look at the city charter, it is filled with stuff. Um, so it's not um, unusual for maybe um, this group to be wading through the kitchen sink. Are there any additional comments by council members? Uh, Vice Mayor Cummings. Um, I know this has been mentioned a couple of times, but um, it does seem like that um, one of the things that 
I think might be important is that we look at what we're actually directing this committee to address and whether or not that reflects the desires of the current city council, given the fact that this was, um, this committee was formed in August and many of the um, items that are being discussed on this committee might not reflect what is the, um, the will and the interest of the current city council. So I don't know if there's any way to um, suggest that we postpone this discussion and this vote until a later date, um, but if that's possible, that would be my preference. <clears throat> I, I have Mayor. to agree. That would, oh, that would be the appropriate way to to do what Council Member mm -hmm. or Vice Mayor Cummings is suggesting, because that um, looking at the scope of what the committee analyzes is not part of the agenda the description item, huh? for this Absolutely. evening. Yeah. So if that's mm -hmm. the, the if that's the council's um, if that's the pleasure of the council, then it would be appropriate to bring it back. Thank you, Mr. Kandati. I have to say, and then I'll, I'll acknowledge you. I agree. Um, I think we are asking people to volunteer their time and um, want to make sure they have clarity of purpose and we can revisit that and then relook at the structure at that time would be my preference. So I agree with you at this point. So, uh, Council Member Matthews. Would the motion then be, I'll just suggest, to defer uh, expanding the committee but um, uh, agendize for a future meeting uh, clarification of the charge of the committee. Yeah. In okay, addition so to consideration of the okay. additional of additional yeah. members. Yeah. Yeah. I'm sorry, I'm sorry, Councilmember Brown. I missed what I, I wasn't fully. I missed what it you was said. to postpone action on additional members and Have an agendize the, for a future meeting. A clarification of the charge. Uh, okay, I'm so sorry. We'll, speak, we'll yes. use your microphones. Thank you. To postpone action on the addition of new members to the Charter Amendment Committee and to agendize for a future council meeting a uh, clarification of the charge for this committee. Um, Mr. Kondati? I, I would suggest also, um, as the, uh, well, you did mention membership. I was going to recommend that, that um, the makeup of the committee be brought back as a general consideration because it, it just seems a little odd to me to have a committee composed of um, 15 members appointed by the council as a whole and three appointed by, appointed by individual council members. So you might want to consider the structure of the committee as a whole as part of that discussion. Okay, thank you for that. Council Member Cohen. The, the, just point of information, the committee there's seven appointments on the, mm -hmm. and there's um, six at large. That would be 13. This would be three more appointments here. That, if, were that, if that's the case, then I certainly, um, you know, withdraw my comment. And the reason I, I brought this- I didn't, um, I didn't recall that. The other folks forward quickly was because I understood that there's a meeting on January 30th. We are interviewing folks January 15th. Um, if this is, you know, n not clear, it's, there's a lot of interest anyway amongst <laughs> the community in these issues. And, and as Council Member Matthews said, for years people have talked about um, district elections or direct election of mayor, and there's been a lot of recent interest in um, ranked choice voting. So I think there are clear issues for this uh, committee to take on and, and, and discuss that, you know, the council would not really ha be able to entertain here in the council. I mean, it's, somebody's looking into it. That's what committees and task force and commissions are about. They bring stuff to the council that's, um, you know, f bubbling over and not um, necessarily finished, but they've done a lot of research and looked into it. And uh, that's why I think it's real important to get people on there right now because the, the next meeting is January 30th. Okay. Are you, if I may, for clarification, are you suggesting that this be postponed to the 22nd or to ask maybe that the committee postpone their meeting until we get for the clarification? Could be. It could be. Uh, you know, this doesn't have a clock ticking on it. Right. Um, and um, so if I may. Yes. Um, perhaps what I'm hearing is that we could potentially ask that we cancel the upcoming January 30th meeting while the city council has an opportunity to revisit the purpose of that committee as well as its membership. And, um, and then 
re-engage with the committee members based on that clarification. Does that sound yeah, accurate? It's so moved, that language, and I think that that's really important, but I, I would like to see it come back on the 22nd, postpone that meeting on the 30th. But I still don't know about, um, well, I guess it doesn't matter, about, uh, on our 20, 15th and 22nd interviews and um, appointments. We can we can still appoint to this commission, committee mm -hmm. uh, 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 beyond, separately from that schedule. Sure. So yeah, I, I will move that language that you just said if it comes back to us. And I, I like what Vice Mayor Cummings wants to get you know up to speed, up to, you know, yeah. I, I also would <laughs> want to know more about this committee. So my understanding is then you'll be withdrawing your motion at the time, which was to move the item as presented. Um, and would that also withdraw your second? And what you're now moving is what I originally recommended. Did you catch that language, Bonnie, or would you like me to repeat that? You, you, can, oh, yeah, you I, can't I, make the motion. I know, I so motion. I mean, that, that's, <laughs> that's the language I would use that we uh, continue the item to January 22nd that on um, the, we postpone the meeting for January, that's scheduled for January 30th for the Charter Review Committee. Um, and at that time we, um, make a decision about whether to add members uh, or not, or to change the um, the charge of the committee. If I may just add, and then I'll, I'm sorry, I'll turn to you. If January 22nd turns out to be a very full agenda, if the will of the council could be that at the earliest time it could be agendized to give it adequate timing, would you be open to it being potentially later? If it turns out that we have a number of items already coming back, which I already know is the inclusionary housing item. I mean, I'm sorry, the ADU item. So I think I just want to be car careful before committing that that would be agendized, but I would just maybe ask that the council prefer it be agendized on the 22nd um, or at earliest potential availability, is that okay? It, well, it's it, it's an item that can go on the afternoon if we have the ADU at yeah. night. I, I mean, I don't know what else is on that agenda. But. Me, me either, so that's why I'm kind of reluctant to commit. Okay, Council Member Matthews. I'm sorry, Council Member, Vice yeah. Mayor Cummings and then Council Member Matthews. Mayor, do we have a second? Did I will second that. Okay. I was gonna make the suggestion that we actually um, provide more time for mm -hmm. Council to actually um, kind of identify what are some of the uh, topics that we want to um, have this committee address, given the fact that uh, myself, Council Member Myers and Glover will be away in Sacramento for a training from the 16th to the 19th that wouldn't provide us um, with time to actually be engaged in this process of trying to identify what are some of these topics that we would like to, the committee to address. And so I would actually suggest that we meet and we bring this up at a later uh, then the 22nd. Like okay. Would the first something. meeting in February be okay? If that, that At the earliest, I would suggest either the, the first meeting or the second in February. Yeah. So the discussion right of the time, And then we po postpone. Um, we'll just work at trying to agendize it. Say at February. the earliest feasible time. Understand. Earliest feasible yeah. time, ideally sometime in February. Are there any additional input or comments at this point from council members? Council member Matthews. Yes, yeah, so is what's going to be discussed at that meeting going to be both the scope and charge of the committee and its composition? That's my understanding, correct? Is right. that what everyone's yeah. understanding is? Or okay. review scope and charge and see if we want to add anything or, what needs or to be subtract. In well, that, that's included. Yeah. Council Member Brown, do you have any additional comments? I, I, I believe the way uh, Council Member Matthews originally put it, review scope and charge, was, I mean, that was what you said, and that's my understanding. Okay, so we have a motion on the floor by Council Member Crone, seconded by myself. Um, do you need any further clarification on that motion at this time, uh, Clerk? Okay, at this point, I will uh, turn it to a vote. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? Seeing none, that passes unanimously. And we are now at 5.30, so at this point, or 5.40, excuse me, at this point, we will be breaking for oral communications. Um, let me just find that on the list. <coughs> So I will um, just make a brief statement about oral communications and um, allow those who've, who've been asked to have additional time uh, come before the council first. So the um, oral communications is the time. Okay. I'll go ahead and let you, I I'm gonna go ahead and, you'll have your chance for oral communications. <laughs> okay. I want to, uh, please, excuse me. Uh, okay. Use that gap. All right, I just want to let you know that 
One second, I'm gonna make a few statements and then we'll have a chance to hear from the community. So the oral communications is a time for members of the community to speak to us on items that are not listed on today's agenda. If you could please hold the conversation, thank you. Um, are there any members of the public who wish to address the council? And please line up to the left as you see, and you will each be given two minutes to speak unless you've been asked, you've asked for additional time. And we request that you sign in so that we're able to capture the spelling of your name accurately. Um, however, I want to also let you know that that is not required. At this point, I will ask that those who've asked for additional time, they will get their four minutes. Um, I will have Serge Cagno from Stepping Up Santa Cruz come forward to um, have his four minutes. Are we shooting to be out of here by when? I ordered dinner. <laughs> hey, my name is Serge Cagno. I met some of you before. Um, I wanted to talk about homeless stuff for a minute. Um, when you have a public safety commission, um, and I hear for a lot of those topics, uh, there seems to be an implication, you know, violence and safety. Oh, sorry, I'll talk louder. Um, putting homelessness on that list, um, it feels a little like that's a safety issue towards the community. It's a safety issue towards the homeless people, which feels a little different. It's more of a social service issue. Um, you had a, ta a citizen's task force at one point, and you had a report on that. Um, I would suggest the idea um, of um, having uh, an ongoing task force or an ongoing uh, citizens group um, that's able to give feedback and to brainstorm um, to come up with ways to solve the problems that balance it for public safety and, and police issues, but also for the social service level of issues. Um, <coughs> you have a lot of stuff going on at the Ross camp. You have a lot of stuff going on in town. Right now it's the city manager's office that is trying to solve those problems and putting a lot of effort in in the parks department, and that's not really their mandate or their specialty. Um, this year is the least, ser least number of services for winter shelter that we've had. Uh, and I understand there's lots of politics in that, but there's no services in the city of Santa Cruz, which is half of the services that were before. Um, and it hurts me uh, that, like, it's not a topic for today either. Uh, the rains happen and there are a lot of people that I know that I see downtown and they ask me what's happening for winter shelter and I say, oh, I can, I can send an email to try to get you a reservation because there's not even an intake spot that you can go to and get out of the rain and talk to them. You can go sit at Coral and Lime Kiln at 615 where there's nowhere to sit, nowhere to get out of the rain, no bathrooms, and you can hope that they're going to pick you up. But you can also, if you have stuff, you're going to have to go to... Uh, Brent Adams storage place, drop your stuff off, and then you're gonna have to go and sit there in the dark and hope that someone picks you up. And if they don't, you're gonna have to go back and get your stuff. Um, I'm just asking that there becomes, you allow more people to uh, get past the uh, opaqueness of how decisions get made for shelters in uh, Santa Cruz, in the city of Santa Cruz. And to me, it's an immediate problem. It's winter shelter, but it's also the Ross camp talking about brainstorming, talking about getting other people in who, without the politics, are trying to solve the same problems. You solve somebody on a social service point of view, you're also solving it on the, you know, discarded trash and all that kind of stuff issue too. Um, yeah, so that, that's my, my main point of just trying to get that conversation going because it's raining and, you know, this is not something that we should have to try to solve later and their bumps in the road of starting. This didn't start in November 15th like it started for the last few years. Um, we're late in the game right now. Um, there's also quite a lot of money. There's 10 million coming in and it's your city manager who rep is represented on the HAP executive committee and how those programs get decided for the city, how the site gets decided and all that stuff. Um, uh, having that be a more transparent process of people trying to brainstorm and solve the problems. Just putting that out there. Thanks. Thank you.
I'd like to now, okay. I'd like to now invite up um, Phil Posner from Conscious in Action. You'll be given four minutes as you've requested in advance. Up to City minutes. Manager Martin Bernal and old city council members and new city council members. I'm Phil Posner. Uh, I want to thank you for allowing we members of Conscience in Action and others to address you regarding the issues of homelessness as it relates to individuals who have to sleep in their cars or vans, the continuing lack of bathrooms for the homeless, and the desperate need for a real campsite instead of the present mess of tents, tarps, and mud that currently exists by the Ross parking lot called the Ross Camp. I ask for your empathy. I know that you're good people. I know that you must see the mess by the Ross Camp. Can you imagine yourself sleeping in the mud and during the rain, et cetera? We are also here to announce that this Thursday at 1.30, Conscience in Action and Huff are sponsoring a rally to bring individuals together who are surviving in vehicles to, show their, to share their experiences, how to survive, and to meet with Chief Mills, who has graciously consented to be present to answer questions and concerns. The flyer says, are you being pressured or threatened to move your vehicle more frequently than the legal resting period of 72 hours? Are housed neighbors declaring that you don't have a right to park on public streets? Is your attempt to sleep in a van or a car, not in one of our nice houses, being interrupted by pounding, shouting, or banging in the dead of night? Is your family or loved one being made to feel unwelcome when you have parked for less than the legal period of 72 hours? Lastly, unsuccessful with the previous council, we are also asking that one of you on this new council, either today or at the next council meeting, move to appoint a task force that will discuss and formulate a realistic proposal that will address homelessness, bathrooms, security, maintenance, et cetera, in the city of Santa Cruz. We will bring to the table a list of suggestions that we believe will help the task force implement the plan, but we want to listen to everybody concerned. We are suggesting that such a task force would consist of representatives of the council, Parks and Rec, the police department, the city manager's office, the homeless community, the Association of Faith Communities, our Conscience and Action Group, and I know that Steve Pleitz and my son Micah and others have agreed to accomplish, to work on this. To accomplish this, we believe the task force should be given a realistic time frame to meet and bring a proposal to you for your approval. As I have previously said, as has Police Chief Mills, with empathy and compassion, I believe together we can do this, help alleviate the present suffering of so many that comprise the homeless community in our city of Santa Cruz. Oh, thank you. Thank you. Okay. <laughs> the uh, additional person who asked for time is uh, Mr. Robert Norris. You'll be given f up to four minutes. Members of the community and city council. A new council majority but the same staff, the same city manager, the same city attorney. The same restrictive rules of procedure and decorum, the same anti-homeless laws unchanged. Increased police power with gray-shirted volunteers. 
The same unconstitutional curbside punishment powers by police and rangers who can issue stay away orders at will for the most minor infractions weeks before a court even hears the case. We have the same city council grounds and the library across the street forbidden to enter at night, unless there's a meeting going on, in what was a blatant administrative action taken without public notice, public comment, or public vote. Done to eliminate homeless protesters and more recently homeless survival sleepers outside City Hall two years ago and to spare the city manager and his minions, as well as the city council, the public shame of seeing its lack of services and punitive laws in full squalid array outside these chambers. We have the same restrictive curfews at night in the parks, the Poganip and the levee, making criminals of those who seek shelter to rest and sleep in a city that has legal shelter for less than 20% of its homeless. We have the same parking bans, targeting homeless people in Cynthia Matthews' permit parking plague, which denies the entire community parking spaces at night to cater to the prejudices and fears of the privileged in the neighborhoods. And we still have closed bathrooms locked at night. There are no open bathrooms at night. There are three ill-lit porta potties not accessible to disabled people. The Loudon Nelson bathrooms are still closed. I'm speaking to Mr. Elliott who runs Parks and Rec and to the city council. The Loudon Nelson bathrooms are still closed to those favored, except to those favored by Izeth Ray's staff as properly documented program participants. Grant Street Park, I'm told, is still closed. The plans for any meaningful shelter other than the Ross Camp and the camp's homeless people themselves has set up throughout the town has been babbled about extensively by this council. Housing, 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 chitter, chatter, chitter, chatter all day long but abandoned after complaints from neighborhood biggest, I'm talking about the car park, and of course the campground that we had. We have no city funded facilities for laundry, for storage, for showers, for most folks outside, but lots of money coming in, mind you. Endless talk about housing. And the council, at the council, we hear appointments being rushed through, ignoring recommendations by one of the more liberal members of the new majority. Procedural rules have been contorted in the last few decades to target dissident activists and journalists here, and in so doing, the general public. The public has the right to demand a full discussion of one of the many important agenda items on the consent agenda, which has been now reserved solely to privileged council members, except for your two minute little bit at the beginning. A new strange consent public hearings category has been added to extend the cutback of public comment time to public hearings. Rules threatening those putting an audio recorder here, it's against your rules to have this audio recorder here, that officer over there has on a pa past had me arrested, not this particular gentleman, but another one, for having this recorder sitting right here. So. I'm gonna pass this speech around, which is twice as long. I don't have time to give it all. You should be giving groups five minutes. That's what was previously the reality, three minutes and five minutes, until it was cut back by the Matthews Rotkin councils of earlier years. So it's the community that has to change this. It's not gonna be the council unless it's well pressured by the community. We've already seen council getting outvoted. Thank you, and you've had your so phone. Thank you back. very much, and please try not to interrupt me even if I'm okay. going over by a sentence, it's okay? My, thank my, you very it's much. It's my job, and um, no, it's not. at this point, I'd like to get a sense of all those that are in the audience who are interested in um, testifying or speaking before us at, during oral communications. Are there any additional folks who are in the um, is sitting down. Okay, sir, in the in the jacket in the back, you will be our last speaker. I'm sorry. Okay. Okay, you'll be the last speaker, and um, I will be uh, giving you 90 seconds, and the reason being is we have a 7 p.m. agenda item as well as one additional item from our earlier um, uh, uh, agenda, so you'll have, you'll be given 90 seconds. Go ahead. And if you can, please, uh, if you feel uh, interested, it, no, no pressure, but you're welcome to sign in for accuracy. I should be uh, less than 90 seconds. My name's Eric Godberg, good evening, council. <clears throat> As a new council, you have a choice. There's a fork in the road. You're on the fork of divisiveness or conciliation and true problem solving. 
around rent control and just cause eviction. You can respect the will of the voters and engage all stakeholders. Oh, if you could pause, pause. This is actually for items that are not no, on the I, agenda. I'm not addressing the item at seven o'clock. I'm talking in general terms. Okay. I'll go ahead and could let you continue, but if you're going to go into that. I'm not going into it. Okay, go ahead. So this is around general terms about how you're gonna handle this uh, as a council. And if you respect the vote of the people and you engage all stakeholders in sincere dialogue, there are people of goodwill on all sides. Or you can engage in tokenism and ram through your own program. I'm gonna go ahead and pause. This seems very specific to the it's evening not. item. It's, it, 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 it it's is. not, it's <laughs> not. I'm not talking about one thing because that's what's happening at seven is a temporary interim ordinance, right? I'm not sure what you're addressing then. What are you speaking to? I'm talking about in general. We're talking, you've been talking about, you wanna have a dialogue on around rent control and just cause eviction, right? I'm not talking about whether you should approve the item, item number one at seven o'clock. I'm talking about what you're gonna do in general. Are you going to like, engage the community? Go, you can go ahead and pause. Uh, Mr. Kondati, my understanding is that if we're gonna have uh, oral communications, it's items that are not on the agenda. A just cause, a process associated with just cause is on our agenda for this evening. So which case I would say that your comments aren't necessarily appropriate for the oral communications portion of our agenda. If you'd like to return and speak then, happy to accommodate you then. I would just point out that there's also a discussion this evening on the process moving forward right. for considering additional public engagement and uh, discussions concerning additional tenant protections. And that starts at 7 p.m. So uh, I'm, we'll we'll, I'm going to go. So you're saying that I am addressing something that's on the seven o'clock. That's right. Thank you. Thank you. Next speaker, please. You'll have 90 seconds. Fast. I've never done this before. Oh. Uh, my name's Alicia Cool. Alicia, thank you for coming and welcome. And if you can just please um, bring the uh, microphone to. I am one of the people that they're speaking of that I do live in my RV. Um, I have experienced things like this when I have not been parked for 72 hours. I do feel like it's a push. Um, to get homeless people out of the area, even though it is our legal right to park. I'm here to request um, for you to consider a safe parking program. Um, I would volunteer myself to manage that program. Um, I do see parking signs all over the place, permit parking, no parking midnight to 6 a.m. Um, I feel like Delaware would be a perfect spot to allow people to park. It's industrial, it wouldn't bother anybody. Um, and I would just like your assurance to make sure that people who have been parked for less than 72 hours aren't getting harassed. Um, there was some talk about the Ross Street shelter, and I feel like people who are housed in their vehicles, um, it doesn't do any benefit to harass them. It's like, why would you want them to lose their vehicle? Giving them tickets and stuff like that just pushes them towards a tent in the Ross Street shelter. Um, I feel like the push should be to help those people and not force them into a worse situation. Um, and that's all. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, next speaker. Nicholas Whitehead again. I would point out that the previous speaker, Alicia, does have serious management experience. So. She'd be a good one for that. <clears throat> uh, we're approaching the time of year when we mark the existence of a truly great American spirit, Dr. Martin Luther King. We honor his existence, an eternal existence. City Council, I have no doubt that each one of you <clears throat> is a noble <coughs> human being, a sincere representative who hears the voice of your constituents. I have no doubt you wish to serve the needs of our future Santa Cruz. I, it will take the utmost care and mutual respect to achieve a workable harmony. Everything you say and do or neglect to do will rebound throughout our community. Please always show respect for divergent views, philosophies, and inspirations. Above all, like a good doctor, do no harm. 
try to overcome the divisions. We need harmony, not dissension. We know that on all the major issues, you will have to form committees, subcommittees, subdivisions of your total. Th thank you for thank you for your remarks. What? And you're welcome to to submit them if you have if you would like the councilman to not let me them finish. Then. It's kind of an no, unusual. I, I have, no, we have making an unusual plea. No, I, I I understand. Well, I Asia, shan't be back. No, okay. I shan't be back. And uh, we'd have the next speaker for oh, wow. 90 seconds. Thank you. Thank you, welcome council members, and thank you, uh, Mayor Watkins. Um, my name is Denise Ellerick, and I'm here with Mayor uh, Mary. <laughs> Mary Mason, Mayor Mary Mason, <laughs> Mary Mason. Anyway, we're very excited and I'm very excited to hear you talk about uh, health and wellness in all policies. And um, we're with the Community Prevention Partners and SafeRx Coalition of Santa Cruz County and we're very excited about a survey that we'll be releasing on January 29th and we'd love to follow up with an email and invite all of you to share this information with your constituents on the social media page. Um, the, and it involves um, drug storage and disposal policies and Sharps disposal policies and what people's habits are and we want to collect more data. We have data from a couple years ago and so we want to collect some more data so that we can learn more and that one of the things that came out of that data was the extended producers ordinance which you all signed on for which is um, highly successful and the survey will have links to the 52 disposal places for people to drop off their prescriptions and narcotics and Sharps and we're gonna be going to all the other cities in the county, Capitola, I don't have to list them all, but, um, and we would like to return in March or April with a follow-up to this, but it's a very exciting time, and we know that youth have reported in surveys that they have easy access to storage of narcotics in their medicine cabinets, but we know that number is going down. Youth are using fewer prescriptions, and we think that part of it is decreasing access, so thank you very thank much. You. Thank you You'll very be getting much. an email from us. Thank you. Thank you very much for coming. Next speaker, and those that may have came in late, I want to remind you um, or let you know that we are in the finishing up oral communications. Our last speaker is on the left, and we will then return to our general business and um, reconvene at 7 p.m. for our evening session. You'll be given at 90 seconds. Go ahead. My name is Dave Willis. I just want to say, like, pertaining to commissions or whatever, when the, um, Ms. Myers was saying what she was saying, if it's that minimal of getting somebody on the committee, then you should definitely, it should be that easy to do it. To let somebody pick their own, they should have a person they're representing themselves. And also, um, <clears throat> I'm from a city of gangsters, which means that Mayor Daly was a mayor when I was coming up. And the way to keep people out of making decisions is to, okay, let's create this so that they can't get on that committee and this committee and we keep them down. That's dangerous, don't do that. You all, you got votes to be here. You have, you've earned the right to be here. So you should have everything that you should have. And um, I want to say, um, try to keep your sanity and be strong and um, do what you know, feel, think is right. And hopefully you'll be all right. Thanks. Thank you. Next speaker, please. Um. Can I say one thing really quickly before the timer starts? Nope, you're giving okay. 90 seconds like everybody right. else. <laughs> Good try. My son and I have lived at the tannery for five years and have walked the levee hundreds of times. I and all the parents that I've spoken to at the tannery can no longer let our kids walk there alone. I'm going to describe the handful of times that I've walked by the camp in my experience as well as my son's. A month or so ago, my son, who was 13, and three of his friends wanted to walk to Java Junction alone in the day as they've done many times. I love watching them as they prepare to venture off on their own, how excited and empowered they get before their journey. I hesitated this time because of the camp, though I, as I said, it was new and they had not yet walked by themselves. There were four of them, it was daytime, so I allowed them to go. When they returned, they were all visibly shaken and afraid. They explained to me that when they passed the camp on their way to Java Junction, they encountered an angry woman, clearly out of her mind, screaming, kicking a bike, and shouting the N-word. One of the friends was black, and this did not make him feel safe. She also screamed, you're gonna just let these four kids walk through here? On their return trip, they had to walk by a man swinging around a machete right next to their path, and this really frightened them. I'm, not, I'm gonna skip my experiences that were also scary. Um, 
and go to the conclusion, many kids from the tannery walk or bike along this path and some take it to school. The children now cannot go anywhere by foot or bike alone without crossing the huge freeway intersection. Many people, not just from the tannery, use this path on their daily commute. This camp location does not seem like an appropriate long-term solution. The city has directly participated in creating this camp by providing resources, bathrooms, et cetera, yet they are not taking the appropriate steps to regulate what they have created, thereby creating a public safety hazard. Thank you. Thank you for, thank you. All right, next speaker, and you'll be given 90 seconds as well. Thank you, good evening. Coral Brune. I'm uh, very glad to be here to um, address number one, the Ross camp, and possibly uh, I would like to second the uh, idea of task forces or similar. Uh, well, I feel in my time living in Santa Cruz, I've been in several different roles. So I would like to offer my expertise in roles to um, just make some observations. Um, I, I also now live at the tannery. I have for five or six years this January. Uh, it is, it's been a, 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 you know, different change every year. Um, the same levee path, um, the same uh, structure at the Ross uh, and PetSmart and businesses there at that, that particular place. Um, I, I'm an adult, but um, sometimes I ride my bike, I walk, I uh, don't always, and I'm wasting a lot of time here. I would just like to say that, um, I'd like to suggest that kids walk in groups with parents with an adult. Also that um, if we work together, we can get to uh, some kind of an agreement and find uh, um, you know, an improvement <coughs> because the camp could be improved and there are a lot of um, drug inf inflicted people which we shouldn't treat as, as criminals. Some of them singly could be and I think we should talk to them about that. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you for your comments. And then I'll just remind the I'll just remind those that are in the audience that um, we are concluding our oral communications. I see that you came in last. We have closed it after the speaker, the woman before you, and we'll reconvene at 7 p.m. You're always welcome to reach out to the council by email. Go ahead, and you'll have 90 seconds. Yes, hi, my name is Linda Cover, and I'm also a resident of the Tannery Art, Tannery Art Center. Um, I want to say quickly, uh, we also had our the uh, River Street camp last year, and there were absolutely no complaints about that camp. It, I volunteered over there. I consider that a really successful camp. I know it was a lot of money. You don't need to spend that much money. You didn't need to do all those services, but showers and bathrooms are important. Now I want to address the Ross camp. Um, uh, immediately before you get ready for that River Street camp that I want you to do, immediately um, you need to address that there's a huge overflow of people on the levee that make it unsafe for our families to go by. They need to be off the levee. And you can do that simply just like they did in San Lorenzo Park by having a fence that goes from Ross to the highway and people would be behind that fence and, and people will be able to access the levee. The bathrooms are still there. You needed to go to the bathrooms at San Lorenzo Park by going up on the walkway, so that would not change. The bathrooms are available. I don't, that's not a humanitarian place for people to be for a long term. Right now, I'm trying to address both communities, the Tannery and the Ross community. Uh, okay, thank you. Thank you. I want to also just remind those that have walked in that oral communications will be closing after the person who is in the stripes, and um, we will reconvene our uh, session at 7 p.m., and you can always reach out to the council by email. So we are no longer accepting folks to line up for oral communications. Yes, uh-huh, that's right. And you'll be given, and you'll be given 90 seconds. Hey. My name is Elise Cosby, I'm gonna talk fast. I think that public comment is one of the most important, if not the most important time on the agenda. As much time as possible should be given free to hear from the public. To restrict to a half an hour, which I believe you all have just voted for, when you just voted for the oral communications on the uh, agenda previously, my understanding is that you limited it to 30 minutes. I think that's dangerous for democracy. I also wanna say that I think it's time that we got a new city 
city manager. My understanding is that Martine Bernal has fulfilled this position for an extraordinarily long period of time. If we are going to have anything like a new paradigm with input from the citizens and actually have decisions being made by the council and by citizens informed committees and bodies, I think we need to recognize that we have a city staff that is extremely accustomed to running the city. I would like to talk about the library at this time. The public voted for Measure S. It was funds to build a new library. After that, the city staff set about stacking a hand-picked library committee to go along with their recommendation to combine a library garage with the public library. This is not what the public voted for. Also, I'd like to say that thousands upon thousands of books are being dumpstered, and the public needs to know that. They are donating their books thinking that they're going to be preserved, at least the ones that are in, in reasonably worth preserving and they're being dumpstered. Thank you. That's our cultural Next. heritage. Thank you very much. Next speaker. You'll have 90 seconds as well. Hi, my name is Gary Ingram. I'm a tannery resident also. Um, it, until I wasn't aware of this kind of problem until I moved into the tannery and we found that there was so much in the way of homeless people and and uh, on the camp. I've been accosted myself a few times uh, to the point where people were, I thought, going to hit me and I just kind of walked away. But it's a problem for everybody at the tannery who lives there. We have uh, people, one person showed up uh, three weeks ago, slumped over his cart, overdosed on heroin um, in our parking lot. Uh, we need to do something better. We need to get them into the other camps or do something because we're having to run the gauntlet now, the people at the tannery, to go to town. That's the way we go to get our groceries. And it's difficult. It's difficult for the kids. It's difficult for all of us. Um, thank you. Okay. And you will be our last speaker. Thank you. Hi, I'm Cynthia Berger with Santa Cruz Tenants Association, and I'd just like to talk to you about the nine plus million dollars that's coming into the city uh, that will be fed through the HAP, and it's for homelessness uh, and probably homelessness prevention. And um, I, I often hear people in, at this podium make a lot of claims that are unsubstantiated, and I think that we need to start collecting much better data about renters, in this, and that includes people living in their RV so that I would like to rep to, uh, I, I don't know if the people in the HAP are just going to keep doing what they've been doing, but I think that you should take a look at these groups, what they do. For example, rental assistance has been extremely low compared to what people actually need, and it's been very difficult to access, to, to get access to. And um, I think, you know, you, you might need to get some new people in to, uh, you should talk to Steve McKay, who you know, who is a uh, sociologist, and they know how to collect data. I'm sure you have staff that do as well. I also think that you know the city um, sold land in Scotts Valley for eight million dollars, and I think some of that money should go towards homelessness prevention as well. I know that the Economic Development Department has their idea for what that should be spent on, but I would like for you to um, consider using some of that uh, to help out the renters here. I know that you know some of you really don't care. A renter is just someone who can be replaced by someone else. Um. Thank you. Okay, so that will now conclude our uh, portion of oral communications and we'll return back to our consent agenda item um, for the last item that was pulled, which is item number nine. And I'm not, was that you, Council Member? No, can we um, ask staff to get back to us on a few of these items that people brought up? If, um, is there really no intake spot? Um, there's a continuing lack of bathrooms. There's no bathroom open at night in, in anywhere in the city. Could could we please hear about that if that's if that is in fact true? Um, and then also, it seems like uh, I hope staff is in contact or could be in contact with the Tannery Arts people because it seems like there's a, um, a big problem going on. I know Council Member Glover visited. And I can tell from the head nod that staff is definitely going to be in contact with Tannery and that item will be forthcoming to the council. Okay. Um, so item number nine, uh, did you want to, um, did you pull the item number nine, Council Member? I did not. 
Uh, I'm sorry. Did just Council Member Brown. Okay, Council Member Brown, apologies. So my intention in pulling this when I did, I wasn't anticipating it coming up this late, um, is not to uh, oppose this or to belabor it, but what I do want to do is make another try uh, at getting some information about the parking deficiency program. Uh, you know, it seems to me that we, you know, and I supported this, um, uh, this change, so I don't have a lot of questions. Uh, thank you, Claire, for being here. Um, but what I would like to see is um, the, a little bit more information on the, you know, the impact. So, you know, so here's some questions that I'd like to get answered. And if I could, I mean, I don't know if I need to move this because since I've asked the questions and have not had them answered in the past, I feel like I need to formalize it. So I'm gonna um, move the item with a request that staff get back to us uh, with the following information. And hopefully somebody will second it. We can have the discussion and move through this quickly. Um, so, you know, I would like to know, um, you know what the money from the deficiency fee, um, uh, you know, what, what the money f is, uh, uh, sorry, the overall, I, I wanna make this clear, Bonnie, for you. Um, so, <laughs> you know, I mean, essentially I'm trying to get at, um, uh, you know, income and expenditures from the parking, parking deficiency fees, um, how the change impacts specifically downtown employees who are now absorbing what I consider to be an absorption of the, um, the cost because they're now gonna be needing to pay for permits um, rather than the businesses. Um, so if businesses are no, no longer paying for that parking, then who will? It seems to me that's um, being covered through um, metering and the, the increase in the uh, hourly rates. Um, but I'd like, an, I'd like a little bit more information on um, the overall, the parking deficiency fee um, reductions impacts. So that, you know, so, so where, the, you know, where the money is coming from um, overall, and um, in, I mean, I know that the money is intended to pay off bonds um, and for a new garage and ostensibly for um, enforcement, um, but I just would like to get an overall financial picture. And so if, if I'm hearing you correctly. Mm -hmm. So okay. does, that, does that make sense? Yeah, and I can, I can answer all that and, this and, evening. And you know, I, I just would like to yeah. see that in writing. We just haven't received it and I've asked and so, um, it doesn't have to happen tonight. But. Okay, so, so if I can, if, if I may, what I'm hearing is uh, interest in moving the item and then having the staff respond staff in writing to the questions that you posed. Is that correct? Just, um, it, you know, if we could agendize it and have that. Yeah, I, I, would, and I would like to second it, but do we need the information before the item is passed? I don't think so. Okay, I mean, we've, I, I've already, I mean, maybe you do, but I, I mean, I'm, I'm not opposed to doing this. I just want some information. And, and can we also add to that um, what, can the money be used for? Is there is is, is there within a you know what is the what are the parameters? So yeah, I, I will move that. So okay. I will second it rather. Okay. So uh, there is a motion by Councilmember Brown, second by Councilmember Crone. Councilmember Matthews, did you have just briefly? The parking deficiency fees are only a part of the overall budget of the parking district, and so I don't know if you want yes. a bigger picture. Okay. And that yes, that might be suitable for. Um, a one-on-one -on -one or a, a smaller group meeting with some staff who want to see the big picture of the parking district finances, income and expenditures. Well, uh, you know, I'm, I'm real okay with doing it one-on-one, -on -one, but I actually think that this, because the council is asked to make these decisions, you know, I think it is worth the entire council and for the general public to have that overview. Um, so I'd like it to come back to the full council. Okay, so we have a motion and a I second. Any additional comments? I'd like to see if any members of the public are here or interested in speaking to item number nine on our consent agenda. Okay, seeing none, I will, did you have a comment? Yeah, Council just uh, to echo uh, Councilmember Brown's statement about public involvement. While it's fantastic that we as council members have the ability to reach out to staff and have one-on-ones and get the information that we need when we need it potentially, but it sounds like Councilmember Brown's been having some trouble there. Um, I think that it does the greater community a disservice by making it non-transparent and making it more difficult for them to be able to understand all of the diverse applications of the parking funds and how the parking district operates. So I 
support uh, making as much information public as possible. Okay, are there any additional comments at this time? Okay, seeing none, um, we'll go ahead and call the vote. Um, all those in favor, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? Seeing none, that passes unanimously. At this time, we will be recessing um, for our 7 p.m. evening session. Oh, do we have something? Am I missing something? I the item 11, which is the calendar, just a note, there were no, there are no changes oh, to the calendar. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Okay, item 11, there's no changes to the calendar. Okay, so um, we will now recess and uh, reconvene here at 7 p.m. for our <coughs> evening session. 40 minute break. Time to go on coach. Uh, City Council meeting. I just want to let folks know that we are over capacity. And so we're going to have to ask that if some of you could please either move outside or to the overflow room in the Tony Hill room at the Civic Center, it would be very much appreciated. Mr. Vice Mayor, could we get the TV on out there for folks and maybe some chairs too would be really good to have out there. We don't have time for chairs. Okay. And, and it's cold. Is there any ability to move to the Civic Auditorium? Tony Hill room is open at the Civic. No, but can the council meeting move to the Civic Auditorium? <laughs> We've heard this a lot in the past, and I, I hope that we do this in the future, we make a, a you know, a, amends. I did mention it to the city manager, he's not here, but a couple days ago, and he was gonna look into it, but maybe maybe something's scheduled over there tonight. And it, okay. well, and it, uh, we appreciate your, we appreciate your compliance with that, knowing that we cannot have the chambers too full, and we'll go ahead and postpone beginning until we're able to meet the safety standards necessary to continue. They say they can sit there. Yeah. So if you guys are standing along this wall, we're going to ask you guys to come outside, please. Not against the wall, then please yeah, uh, everyone else okay. standing currently needs to be able to let people back in. Each one of those pews holds 10. Yeah. Way more than that. Way more than that, yeah. 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 For an hour. It wasn't a very contentious. <laughs>
Mr. Lynn Renshaw. Outside. Gail Faz, they called your name. I know. Like Our 7 p.m. session. So good evening, everybody. I appreciate your understanding. We do have, as mentioned, overflow capacity at the Tony Hill room. Um, if you're interested in going there, um, as, our, as you can see, our chambers are full. I want to welcome you to our 7 p.m. session of the January 8th, 2019 City Council. And I would like to ask the clerk to now please call roll. Thank you, Mayor. Council members Crone? Here. Glover? Here. Myers? Here. Brown? Here. Matthews? Here. Vice Mayor Cumming? Here. And Mayor Watkins? Here. Um, let's see. So the first item on this evening's agenda is general business. And just want to remind the uh, community that the order of the present the order of this evening is we will hear a staff presentation and that will be followed by questions from uh, four staff from the council and then we will have an opportunity for public comment at which time we will return to the uh, council for action and deliberation and the rules of decorum are on the left my left in terms of how um, my job is to maintain order and um, and consistency and flow within this, this evening's proceedings. I wanna also uh, let you know that generally if there is a disruption to the meeting that the mayor will give a warning, which I will, and if there is continual disruption by an uh, individual that I am able to um, acknowledge, then I will ask our Sergeant of Arms to please um, uh, remove that individual. So it goes by warning and then removal. And the level of decorum and expectation of decorum is that to be consistent with those who are observing in our outside area as well as those in the to Tony Hill room. So we will ask that you maintain the same level of decorum as if participating in the meeting as if in chambers as you would if you were here and we could see you. So I will consistently um, it, ask that you, and respectfully ask that you adhere to those, those uh, decorum uh, policies. So at this time, I will go ahead and ask our um, staff to uh, present the item. Thank you, Mayor and Council Members. I'm Lee Butler, I'm the Planning and Community Development Director, and I'll be presenting jointly today with Assistant City Manager, Tina Scholl, and also with our City Attorney, Tony Condotti. You're all well aware of the many efforts that the city has been uh, undertaking to address the city's housing crisis. Uh, we had uh, 99 recommendations that came from a uh, uh, outreach maybe, effort. Maybe just hold just one second sure. while, we get the while we get the sound figured out. Thank you. I think we're good. Okay. Okay. So we had 99 recommendations that came out of a very extensive outreach effort uh, that were presented to the council in December of last year, or excuse me, December of 2017. And then uh, prioritization effort uh, was undertaken by three council members uh, as the housing blueprint subcommittee that included a check-in with council, multiple meetings of that group, a community outreach meeting, and then a set of prioritized recommendations that came forward on the June 12th, 2018 agenda for the council that um, we are currently um, 
just really at the beginning of implementing because there are so many different recommendations. But this is um, one of the things that um, has been uh, addressed as part of the city's efforts. Um, one of the many things that the city is doing to address the housing crisis is looking at the potential for just cause eviction uh, criteria. So a little bit of the history of that here in our city. Back in February, the city adopted the, February of last year, uh, the city adopted the interim just cause eviction ordinance and that timeline was tied to Measure M. <clears throat> and as you know, Measure M contained its own just cause eviction provisions and the interim ordinance was set to expire um, either upon the effective date of the uh, Measure M provisions or upon the council certification that Measure M had failed. And so on December 11th, the council certified the results that Measure M failed and the interim just cause eviction ordinance uh, expired at that point in time. As part of the December 11th council direction, uh, the council voted to have staff come back with two items on tonight's agenda, and that's what we're here to talk about. Um, the first is a community process to uh, discuss just cause eviction, and um, that was couched at the time as uh, a process to evaluate um, the uh, procedures for implementing a task force and um, Assistant City Manager Tina Shaw will, will talk about that as one of the options that the council um, can pursue. But really we're looking for some direction in terms of the outcomes and goals. And then the second part of that council direction was to come back with an interim order and our, our city attorney, Tony Condotti, will uh, brief you on that ordinance. Um, but essentially it mirrors what um, was um, in place as the interim just cause eviction ordinance with a couple of exceptions that we'll talk about. Because there wasn't an opportunity to discuss the items at uh, the December 11th meeting, this is now the council's opportunity to have that discussion. It wasn't on the agenda at that point in time. And so council now has the opportunity to um, provide direction and um, to uh, undertake the first reading of an interim ordinance, should the council choose to do so. So at this point, I'll turn it over to Tina Schull. Good evening, Mayor Watkins, council members, community members. I hope our audio um, settles down. I apologize for that. Yeah, 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 and we are working on it. Thank you. But you can hear us okay. It's just the, the, the feedback sound. Thank you. So uh, thanks for that setup, Lee. Um, I'm here to talk about the community portion or community process portion of the agenda item. They're presented jointly for you this evening because they influence one another. So your decisions on one may influence the other, so that's why they're jointly presented. So uh, we were directed, as uh, Lee mentioned, the council didn't have a chance to discuss this amongst yourselves because it wasn't agendized. So you weren't able to provide a lot of in-depth direction at that time. So we came back with what we had, met as staff before the, the winter closure of City Hall and talk through what are various processes, task forces, et cetera. What are we trying to accomplish in this? And we realized that we wanted to come back to you to get some clarity around some key issues. And as you may have seen in the staff report, there are a few areas, and they're here on the slide, in particular, where we would like council to discuss and provide guidance because uh, what you'd like to get out of these areas will help us develop um, the best tailored process for you. The first is, is goals, is, is discussing what would you hope to achieve from this process. Having a very clear goal statement really helps with the scope of whatever process you come up with, be it a task force or something else, but it also helps the participants be very clear about what you're asking them to do, and it helps us in the design process and to know was it was um, something, um, was the goal accomplished at the end. So here are some possibilities we came up with, um, just to kind of throw ideas out there. The first is you could ask uh, this task force or process to develop consensus around specific tenant protection policies or an ordinance even. 
So you could have them go and do the actual work of trying to craft a policy or discrete specific recommendations that could come from some consensus basis, represent a wide variety of array of viewpoints, that that could be presented to you as a policy action to take. Um, another goal could be um, coming up with a set of values and priorities that you can consider in any sort of future housing uh, policy discussion. A third goal could be improving communication around um, opposing viewpoints. This has been a very charged issue, and that could be an objective as well, is to find a place to mediate between interests and have an opportunity to have not only that conversation, but ongoing conversations. And another goal could be just gathering more information and stories. I think you've heard a lot through the, uh, the voices in housing in 2017, but there's many more, there's so much learning to still to be done. So this could be a goal as well. So those are presented just as, as potential ideas you could explore, but we look forward to hearing what you would like to achieve through this process. Um, the next is what outcomes do you want to see from this process? And specifically, what sort of work product? Are you hoping, again, to have information? So you get, as the slide says, just a collection of information to help you in the future as you work through things. Do you want specific policy recommendations? Are you looking for some data-driven report? There's many different ways that a, a process can conclude. And typically, there is some product backed back to the governing body. And so any specificity around that is very helpful. As you saw in the examples that were appended to this report, there, um, there were reports back to the city council with the public safety task force. There was a report with recommendations with the housing report. There was a report with the 99 um, recommendations that Lee referenced. Um, but again, it's tied to your goals. If you don't want a product, if you don't want recommendations, that will um, influence what sort of what sort of uh, information or report you want to see back to you. And then, <clears throat> my apologies, a third element where we see council input is on the level of community involvement. There are um, a variety of different community processes and mechanisms, and they've got varying levels of community involvement. You know, do you want community members involved in every aspect of this? Do you want a smaller subset of people to work through this? Um, it really it can influence what this looks like in, um, in a profound way. And also, this process, I, I didn't get to this yet, but this process also drives timeline and cost. And so we, we need all those, those basic foundational ingredients to be able to come up with here's a recommended process and here's the cost of doing that and the timeline of doing that. So I, I will say that what was contemplated in December was think about a task force for three months. And um, our experience with task forces is that that's a very aggressive timeline. And I know that was presented just the exigency of the issue and wanting to be responsive and responsive to all the community members here in the audience who really want some action on this. And there's been a lot of discussion and um, policy uh, communication and outreach already, as you saw. Um, in the beginning of this report, but three months is very aggressive. Um, if you think about the steps of a task force, I can walk through that very quickly. You first have to decide, well, your goals and your scope, so we know what, what, what you're asking the individuals to do. Then you have the application and selection process. So or do you put out an application and that is published and there's some application period of time, you know, I would say at least two weeks in order for people to be able to respond and applications come flooding in, I imagine. And then who selects that? Do you have the mayor make those appointments? Does it come back to the city council? So just that piece of it can take some time. And then once you get going, you have conversations of, is this a facilitated process? What's the work plan for the process? So uh, to fit in with the, the three month that was originally suggested, again, I think responding to the urgency of the matter, that would have something coming back to you at your April 9th meeting. Um, and that would, lots can be done <laughs> when there's a will. And um, if that was the case, you would need to have your, your task force, if that's the way you go, in place, I would say, by early February. And that might allow, if scheduling aligns perfectly and people are willing to meet on a pretty aggressive timeline and thinking about just time to prepare information in between meetings, maybe two meetings each in February and March to bring it back to you in April. So that was a request to bring back a proposal and that was the best kind of back of the envelope, just working backwards through time what that might look like. Again, not having a sense of 
the scale and the scope and et cetera. But in thinking through that, there's also other mechanisms that the, the council could think about, again, driven by your goals. And I'll go through this quickly as well. I know you're, you're um, eager to hear from the community. So a few that we came up with to present are, are um, on this next slide, there's a table, and this is drawn directly out of the staff report, if people saw it. These are just three different ideas. Um, and we just wanted to present, this is what something else might look like that the council may wish to consider. You could have mediation, where you have um, a smaller focus group of individuals get together, professionally facilitated, and it's negotiations, and they really work through some interests, and then you have a sort of negotiated settlement at the end of that. Typically, that can take four to 10 weeks, um, and so that fits within that timeline that was discussed. You can see the cons of it is that it's typically closed to the public. It's hard to have a, a mediation between groups with um, hundreds of people there in the room with you, so that, that's, but that's one possibility. Um, another one is public survey, and this could be, the benefits of this is just gathering broad base of data and information, getting a sense where the community is and maybe how maybe people respond to different policy ideas. So that could be a mechanism, um, and it would help you in a very clear and transparent way identify possibilities and areas of agreement and disagreement in the community. Then you have the typical drawbacks of survey instruments. How is it administered? What's the survey bias? Are, are we actually paying a professional surveyor to do it, in which case we're talking um, at least tens of thousands of dollars to do this as opposed to a survey monkey, but that has lots of survey bias involved in that. So um, I know other statisticians up there, so you understand that's even better than I, but that, that's a possibility as well. And then there's um, a discussion circle idea, and this is something that I haven't seen done um, in the city, but this is a, another technique where I, the product of this is to make sure a lot of voices are heard and there's a sense of coming to understanding between opposing interests when you might have an, a, a time of low trust and you don't have a facilitator, it's really community facilitated, where it's literally a large circle of people. Everyone gets to go to the center and, and speak their mind. And people just take turns throughout the entire evening until everyone has a chance to speak. And that doesn't necessarily come up with a policy agreement. I guess I suppose it could if everyone has a chance to keep talking and talking and talking. But it's really a, a chance that's a very community-led effort. So I wanted to present those, and I won't go through all the details, you can see them here and there in the report, just to say that depending on what the council wishes to do, we can tailor a lot of things for you. And, and the way tonight can go, if you have something in mind, you can direct us to go do it tonight. If you wanted us to take your input and come up with alternatives at your next meeting, we can do that as well. So I want to present that. So with that, that concludes the part I wanted to outline. Again, I know there'll be more discussion after public comment, so I wanted to get through this quickly, and I'll turn it over to the city attorney to talk through the interim ordinance. Right. So <clears throat> I'm going to go briefly through the substantive provisions of the ordinance, um, and just <clears throat> as a preface, they are substantively virtually identical to the emergency just cause eviction ordinance that the city council adopted on February 13th of 2018, uh, with a couple of exceptions, uh, including one inadvertent omission that I will go over. Um, the first thing that uh, I'd like to say about the ordinance, however, is that it's not being brought forward as an emergency measure. Uh, it's contemplated that this would be uh, subject to a first reading, second reading, and then have an effective date 30 days <coughs> um, after the second reading, assuming that <coughs> it gets majority approval of the council. Um, secondly, the uh, <coughs> ordinance has an expiration date of 90 days from the date of its enactment. And lastly, uh, to address the concern that tenants might be preemptively terminated and evicted from their uh, residences while this ordinance is being contemplated or before its effective date. Uh, section seven of the ordinance has a provision stating that it will take effect 30 days following its final adoption. However, it shall apply retroactively to any notice of termination of tenancy with an effective date on or after December 11th, 2018, and any unlawful detainer action <clears throat> brought pursuant to a notice of termination with an effective date on or after December 11th, 2018 that is 
still pending as of the effective date of the ordinance. In other words, it's conceivable that an eviction proceeding could be commenced and an unlawful detainer uh, action could be brought, tried, and a judgment entered during that pending period, and this ordinance would not capture um, that circumstance. So there may be um, <clears throat> a handful of cases that uh, that this ordinance does not cover that um, are, tr are adjudicated before this ordinance fully takes effect. So um, I will briefly go over the ordinance that the city council adopted in February. Uh, as I said, there was an in inadvertent omission and I'm gonna point that out. And council member um, Brown has requested that the council consider reinserting that provision into this ordinance for your consideration tonight. Um, the, the essential uh, provisions of the ordinance are that it prohibits a landlord <clears throat> from taking any action to terminate a lawful tenancy, including making a demand for possession of a rental unit, threatening to terminate a tenancy orally or in writing, or serving a notice to quit or notice to terminate or bringing an action to recover possession, except for specified grounds. So unless one of these grounds are present, then it prohibits a tenancy from being terminated by the landlord. First, failure to pay rent would be a ground for terminating a tenancy under this ordinance. Secondly, the breach of a material term of a rental housing agreement would constitute the basis. So if a tenant is violating some provision of a rental agreement, um, then that would be the basis for termination. There's an exception to that rule, however, if, the uh, breach is solely the obligation to surrender possession of the unit on proper notice as required by law. So essentially the expiration of a rental agreement would not be the valid, a valid basis for terminating a tenancy under this ordinance. That is typically associated, is a, is a creature that's typically associated with a rent control ordinance that's designed to protect tenants from having their tenancies uh, preemptively terminated at the end of a lease merely for the pretext of increasing the rent. This ordinance does not contain a rent control provision, but it does nev nevertheless carry forward that same uh, provision. Um, the ordinance goes on to say that notwithstanding uh, any contrary provision in the ordinance, a landlord shall not take action to terminate a tenancy based on the tenant's sublease of the rental unit if the following requirements are met. One, the rental <coughs> unit continues to constitute the tenant's primary residence. Two, the sub lessee replaces one or more departed tenants under the rental housing agreement on a one-for-one -one basis. <coughs> or three, the landlord has unreasonably withheld the right to sublease following written request by the tenant. Um, and then if the landlord fails to respond within 14 days of receipt of the tenant's written request, the tenant's request shall be deemed approved by the landlord. The ordinance goes on to say, a reasonable refusal of the tenant's written request may be based on, but is not limited to, the grounds that the tenant has replaced one or more departed tenants with short-term sub-lessors, the grounds that the total number of occupants in a rental unit exceeds the maximum number of occupants permissible in uh, under section 503B of the Uniform Housing Code, which I believe is one tenant per 50 square feet of uh, square footage of the rental unit. There are additional grounds that are prohibited for being the basis for a termination. Uh, the landlord may not terminate a tenancy as the result of the addition to the rental unit of a family member, such as a child, foster child, stepchild, ward, parent, grandparent, etc. Uh, another ground for termination is that the tenant has continued after being provided by a notice after being provided notice by the landlord to cease uh, to permit a nuisance uh, in or about the, the, the unit or to cause substantial damage to the rental unit or the unit's appurtenances or the common areas of the property. Uh, number four, if the tenant's conduct uh, is so disorderly as to constitute uh, violations of state and federal criminal law that destroy the peace, quiet, comfort, or safety of the landlord or other tenants of the property. <coughs> Uh, number five, the failure to give access um, after the tenant has been provided with notice to provide access by the landlord 
uh, and if the tenant refuses to grant reasonable access as required by state or local law, then that would be grounds for termination. Number six uh, would be necessary and substantial repairs requiring a temporary vacancy um, where the landlord has obtained all necessary permits from the city and provided written notice to the tenant that it needs to make repairs and that the repairs are such that they necessitate a vacancy of the unit for a period of at least 30 days. Um, number seven, that the owner uh, seeks to move into the unit and use the, the unit in good faith for use and occupancy as a primary residence by the landlord or the landlord's close relative, such as a child, foster child, stepchild, ward parent, et cetera. Uh, however, no eviction may take place under the landlord move-in provision if the same landlord or the enumerated relative already occupies a unit on the property or there's another vacancy on the property. Um, another provision, the landlord may not evict a tenant for the owner move-in purposes if the tenant has resided in the unit for at least five years, or the tenant is at least 62 years old or is disabled uh, or certified as being terminally ill by the tenant's treating physician. However, those uh, would not be the basis to prohibit the landlord from moving into the unit if the landlord has those same conditions, i.e. is either 62 years old or um, has a disability or is or a terminal illness. Lastly is an exception under the uh, Ellis Act, which is a provision of state law that's, that basically prohibits the city from restricting a landlord's ability to cease using the entire property as a rental. So if there is a, uh, uh, a duplex that the landlord intends to have occupied by owners exclusively, then that would be a provision that would, uh, would enable the, t the termination. Um, there are other provisions regarding retaliatory evictions uh, and, um, and I will talk about the exemption. Uh, on the February 2018 ordinance, the council <laughs> at the meeting added an additional exemption which is set forth on the screen above you. Um, the reason why I said that this omission was inadvertent in the version that went into the packet is that for that meeting, the version that was in the agenda packet did not have the exemption. It was added by the council by motion at the time of the hearing. Um, so the exemption was a rental unit which constitutes the landlord's sole rental property and the following categories of rental units if the landlord lives on site in either the same residence, a duplex, or a single family residence with an accessory dwelling unit. So um, that is language that's proposed to be included back into the ordinance for your um, consideration uh, at the time that it's introduced uh, this evening. Again, this is not an emergency ordinance, so it would not uh, take immediate effect this evening. It would come back for a second reading and go into effect 30 days after it's uh, finally adopted. And the ordinance also has a provision uh, that calls for its expiration uh, after 90 days from the effective date. <coughs> I'm happy to answer any questions or respond to any council member uh, comments. And that concludes my report. Thank you for um, your report. And uh, thank you staff for your report. <coughs> At this time, I'd like to ask the council if they have any questions of staff before we open it up to public comment. Questions, Council Member Cohn. There's no relocation assistance in this ordinance, right? That is correct. Thank you. That is the next item on your agenda. Okay, that's what I thought. Additional questions for staff? Vice Mayor Cumming. A question regarding um, nuisance and um, number three of the ordinance and uh, was wondering if um, nuisance would be able to be extended to neighbors and adjacent properties. The council certainly could add language to, the, to that effect this evening prior to its introduction, um, and then it would be incorporated into the ordinance to be brought back for the second reading at the next meeting if that's the pleasure of the council. 
Councilmember Glover. Uh, just, <clears throat> I was having a conversation earlier today with someone and we were talking about the ability for people or landlords to remove tenants uh, and the, the validity of a lease. And so here under the breach of lease under number two, uh, when it says that <coughs> it's a violation of any material terms in the rental housing agreement, can you specify the spectrum of what those material agreements could include that the landlord could specify in their lease that, you know, is there like a limit or an example? Um, well, that it really varies depend on depending on the, the tenant, but the landlord could include specific restrictions on, for instance, modifying the interior of the building to, to puncture walls or to change paint or carpeting, um, uh, damaging the, the unit, um, those sorts of things, or, or routinely, um, Yep, assuming that it's included in the lease, routine, routinely parking in a, a space that's not designated to exclude others that would have the right to use that space, those sorts of things. And would something like uh, the express concern that they had brought up was if they had uh, moved a tenant and they turned out to be someone that kept terrible care of the property and uh, they used the term, what, they were a hoarder. So what if they were filling the space up so that it damage the interior and all this other kind of stuff. So could there be a provision in the lease that says you have to keep the property up to a certain standard? Yeah, and, and I think that <clears throat> there certainly can. And then the question is under this ordinance, whether or not the the tenant that is, you know, messy or, or, or brings a lot of miscellaneous material onto the property, whether or not it's substantial enough to constitute a nuisance and the standard there is not really entirely clear. It's, it's basically whether or not it's objectively unreasonable to a, to, to a, a you know, reasonable person. Um, so it, it's not entirely clear and it's not clear how that would, would play out in the courts, but, but that's the standard. And there are a lot of cases that have addressed different conditions that constitute a nuisance. Um, hoarding would certainly be one. Thank you. Councilman Myers. I just have a question about section four, the enforcement procedures. Um, so my understanding of how this is written is that um, the city really, it, this is, would be a discretionary action by, by the city at this, the way it's, the way it's uh, drafted here. Yes, it does not. Um, compel the city to take affirmative action to enforce the ordinance. Uh, for this interim period, it's contemplated that a tenant would basically have the ability to hold up the requirements of this ordinance where a landlord seek to seek to evict that tenant um, under circumstances that are not allowed by the ordinance. And then a court in adjudicating that uh, matter would have the ordinance and would be required to make a determination as to whether or not the eviction is permitted under the ordinance. That's the same way that a just cause eviction uh, ordinance um, that's accompanied in a rent control matter is, is utilized. Um, I would also point out that a tenant who um, raises a violation of the ordinance either by bringing a civil action, a, an affirmative civil action against the landlord or in a defense to an unlawful detainer provision and prevails would be entitled to recover uh, reasonable attorney's fees and costs. And that is to basically incent attorneys that take cases on a contingency fee basis to, to take a case from a tenant, uh, whereas um, in the absence of a potential attorney's fees recovery, uh, a, a lot of attorneys that don't specifically represent tenants in residential um, unlawful detainer matters just wouldn't take it on because tenants typically have trouble paying for, for lawyers' fees. Thank you. Mayor, come in. I had a question around the timeline. So if this is retroactively implemented for, let's say, December 11th, right. would then that 90-day period be up around the beginning of March? No. No. The expiration measures from the effective date, and the effective date is a defined term uh, in the ordinance as being 30 days from final adoption. So it gives you 
30 days, assuming that you adopt it at your uh, January 22nd meeting. It gives you 90 days from that date. Thank you. And Mayor, if I could just point out that the 90 days stemmed from the direction from the council to um, come up with a solution within 90 days. So it is within the purview of the council to modify that uh, interim period should you choose to do so. Are there any additional questions from council members at this time? Okay. Seeing none, um, this would be when, this is the portion when we'll be opening up um, the item to public comment. And before we do, I just have prepared a few comments and then um, Vice Mayor uh, Cummings and I will read over some of the council adopted policy protocol around decorum. Um, I'll just briefly state that I have been on council throughout numerous meetings um, and have witnessed the divis divisiveness of this item. And one thing I do know that everybody here really does share a common value and commitment and love of Santa Cruz and um, have earnestly disagreed on how the best pathway is in terms of moving forward in terms of policy action, but do share uh, a love of our community, a love of our city. And we are, we're each other's neighbors. We see each other on the streets in the grocery stores. And I just wanna remind uh, you all and us that we are in this together and it is our job to hear from you and then to do the best we can in deciding the best course of action at this time. Um, and we can disagree, we may not agree with what each other has to say, but everybody has a right to be here without threat or experience of a discomfort and we um, have a right to listen to them and we don't have to agree. So that is what I will um, aspire to as I uh, preside over this meeting this evening um, and respectfully ask the uh, community to also um, rise to that as well. Um, um, and I do wanna just also say that the council has previously adopted rules of procedure for conduct for city council business. And um, not often do we read those before, um, you know, these types of divisive meetings, um, but I'd like to take an opportunity to do that right now. And I'll start with the first, which is to be respectful. And that is to treat each other with respect, even when, and especially when there is a disagreement. We also encourage people to engage in open and honest communication. So be direct, straightforward, and transparent with each other. To be honest and truthful, to act with integrity and authenticity, and to be ethical. To address difficult issues, confront challenging topics directly, avoid talking around them or not talking about them at all. To find areas of common ground, to seek areas of agreement, identify shared interests, values, and positions. Be open to different perspectives. Keep an open mind. Be willing to change your views with new information, data, et cetera. To give benefit of the doubt, freely give credit for good intentions and avoid ascribing bad intentions. Role model good leadership, be professional, adhere to standards of civility, demonstrate effective leadership for the community. Be considerate of each other's time, manage expectations about responsiveness and availability, recognizing the time limitations and constraints of our colleagues in our community. So I appreciate you uh, listening to that. So I'll just remind um, the community that this time is now the time for public comment on this item. I'd like to get a sense of how many people here are interested in speaking to the item. If you can help me count. Thank you. There's 10 additional. There's also a lot of people in the library as well. Okay. I got at least 35. Okay. 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 So I, what I'll do is I will allow for a minute and a half so that everyone has an opportunity to speak um, up to a minute and a half. I know that there's gonna be likely 
over probably potentially hundreds of a <laughs> hundred or so who want to speak to it and want to make sure everybody has a chance to have their voice heard. Um, and then I'll just remind you to please refrain from um, disrupting the speaker at their, their time to speak and address the, the council. You will have your time as well. Um, if there is a disruption and um, I am able to observe who made that disruption, I will give a verbal warning and then ask our Sergeant of Arms to please uh, remove uh, that individual if the disruptions continue. And if there is a type of disruption that's happening, um, we will take a recess and pause in order for us to reconvene and, and do business. Okay, I had heard from, uh, and I, I, I think I include everybody, but I heard from um, Lynn Rinshaw from Santa Cruz Together requesting additional time in advance. Uh, Gail Jack, uh, Affordable Housing Now, also requesting additional time in advance. And Foz, I'm sorry, I don't have your last name. Remind me your last name. I'm, okay, excuse me, I'm, okay. And you're representing movement for uh, housing justice, correct? And I believe those are the three folks who contacted me in advance um, requesting four minutes and I have um, acknowledged their request and we'll start by um, asking uh, Lynn Rinshaw to come forward um, and she'll have uh, four minutes as she represents Santa Cruz together. <coughs> Okay, so Lynn Renshaw, SantaCruzTogether.com. As you are well aware, Measure M was overwhelmingly defeated by city voters, 62% to 38%, basically two to one. 70% of the votes for city council members went to candidates opposed to Measure M. The interim just cause eviction ordinance includes the worst part of Measure M. Passing Measure M provisions is an insult to the vast majority of voters that opposed it. This new city council is losing public confidence before the very first meeting. Santa Cruz Together conducted professional polling that found very high awareness and the following objections to Measure M. 78% of voters objected to allowing renters to move in other renters without the owner's permission, even beyond the number on a lease agreement. 74% were opposed to making it difficult to evict problem renters. 72% opposed making leased end dates unenforceable. Homeowners should be aware that this ordinance says if their home has been rented for more than five years, they may not be able to move back into it again. Excuse me, Lynn, I, I'm sorry to interrupt you. Bonnie, are we, no. okay. This, this is obviously and patently unjust and possibly illegal. Do not force just cause eviction provisions, essentially Measure M, on the city voters who rejected them. Ignoring the majority vote while discussing a community input process is disingenuous. If the council is willing to ignore the city majority, why should we believe that you care about community input? Rent increases can be limited without overreaching eviction laws. For example, Los Gatos successfully uses a mediation service to limit rent increases. Passing Measure M will lead to further loss of rental housing, which will cause rent increases to accelerate since rents are unlimited on 75% of the rental housing stock. Remember, California state law, Costa-Hawkins, mandates that rent and rent increases are always unlimited on houses, condos, and newer apartments. Also, rents are unlimited on apartments for every future renter. You are not gonna be able to hide these facts from the electorate. If you pass the equivalent of Measure M, you are willfully ignoring the sound research and evidence that shows this policy will make the affordable housing shortage worse. A few of you express interest in adopting evidence-based policies, but unwillingness to study how this policy will impact the number of rentals and rent is telling. Policies like Measure M ultimately displace hundreds and even thousands of renters. A sustainable solution is one that doesn't drive people away from renting their property. You will continue to hear more and more stories about people losing their rental houses. If the city council passes the Measure M equivalent, then you will be responsible for the evictions that occur as houses are sold to owner occupants. 
Remember, the California Ellis Act is the superseding state law that lets homeowners evict renters when withdrawing from the rental market. The local city council cannot prevent such Ellis Act rental withdrawals. The council should honor the majority vote and reconsider passing Measure M provisions tonight. Homeowners that want to be able to choose what to do with their houses should join our newsletter at santacruztogether.com. Thank you. Excuse me. Okay, I'd like to now ask Foz to come up and you'll be given four minutes as well. Thank you, council members. Um, just to kind of address the statistics that were just mentioned, I mean, I think it'd be helpful to see the survey and make that publicly available so we can check the credibility um, of that survey. I'd be very interested in seeing that. Um, uh, anyways, hello, council members. Uh, my name is Faisal, I go by Faz, and I want to thank the council for agreeing to put this incredibly uh, crucial item on the agenda tonight. Um, I wanted to start by addressing some of the things that have been said against this item. Uh, for starters, Measure M's defeat is not a mandate against tenant protections. Uh, voters in the city of Santa Cruz voted by a majority of 53% for Proposition 10 in 2018, uh, the statewide initiative to strengthen and create more effective rent control in cities that have it. Um, uh, the, the fact that city voters supported Prop 10 and voted against Measure M means that voters actually support some form of rent control and uh, tenant protections, but were hesitant about M. This is actually a mandate for, not against, enacting some form of rent control and just cause eviction policies, but it is also a mandate for the council and the community to uh, go back to the drawing board and do it differently. Uh, uh, this is, uh, oh, sorry. Um, uh, measure M's defeat also does not imply that the council is going against the will of the voters. The ordinance is not Measure M. The ordinance does not include rent control. It does not include a rent control board. And the just cause eviction protections are written differently than in Measure M. This vote tonight does not defy the will of the voters. In fact, during our time in the 2018 campaign, as we were knocking on doors and talking with voters, many people that we spoke to who were against Measure M personally told us that they support some of former rent control and tenant protections. Uh, this ordinance is a temporary and very necessary placeholder for a permanent ordinance in the future um, that we can all be happy with as we begin creating the community conversation around this issue. Uh, tonight, the Movement for Housing Justice urges members of this council to pass the temporary just cause eviction protections. Since the certification of the elections last November, already many tenants are facing evictions, either directly or through skyrocketing rent increases. We all know we are living in a housing dystopia in Santa Cruz and it will only get worse. While the intentions of the council were good in enacting an exorbitant rent increase ordinance, sadly, Sadly, the loopholes and lack of teeth in the ordinance have done little to nothing to actually protect renters in this community. Let's not forget who these people are. Renters are your friends, your families, your neighbors. They are your waiters, they are your librarians uh, and baristas, your park rangers and maintenance workers, your teachers who teach your children and nurses who take care of the ill in our community. Uh, these are the people who make the city the lovable and beautiful place that we all cherish. They are taking care of us, but we are not taking care of them. Uh, they, uh, during my time as a temporary city employee, I discovered that over half of our city workforce cannot afford to live in the same city it serves. That is incredibly, incredibly disappointing. As city workers are entering negotiations, a pay increase will mean absolutely nothing without equally providing protections from price gouging rents and unfair evictions. If we don't act soon, we could be living in a town completely barren of all those people who make Santa Cruz the place we know and love. It is unfortunate that many of our local well-intentioned homeowners and mom and pop landlords have bought into the vicious and misleading propaganda from the California Apartments Association and the Association of Realtors, two of the biggest multi-billion dollar wealthy special interests trying to rig our local government in favor of their pocketbooks. These special interests have advanced a division in our community for their own personal gain. This is why I hope that tonight the City Council, in addition to bringing back tenant, uh, temporary just cause eviction protections, will also consider the formation of a tenants protections task force so that we can create the community conversation and education that we so desperately need. This is not just something that's supported by the Movement for Housing Justice. This is also supported by the many homeowners and mom and pop landlords who are sympathetic to tenants' rights but are disappointed that the former city council did not take initiative on the issue and create an uh, that community conversation. Uh, but in the, in the meantime, we're gonna need something to, in place to protect renters. After all, if we lose our renters, then who are we creating tenant protections for? Um, for and for all those who are against this, uh, who are in our community who are against Measure M. Thank you very much. I'm sorry, yeah. your time is up. Okay. Thank, Thank you, you very much. I appreciate right. it. Thank Take you. Care. Okay. Now invite up 
Gail. And Gail, uh, thank you. Okay, thank you. Gail will be representing affordable housing now. And Gail, you'll be given four minutes. This thank morning. you. Thank you very much. And uh, I'd like to welcome the new members on the council. I'm speaking tonight on behalf of Affordable Housing Now. We're a coalition of organizations and community members who have been working together for now over three years to increase affordable housing options for people who live and work in the city and throughout Santa Cruz County. In August of 2015, we encouraged the city council to make some real changes to housing policy in order to help residents who are being priced out of their homes. Two of the 10 suggestions we made at that time are being addressed today. I quote, implement a rent stabilization measure similar to Bay Area communities such as Richmond, Redwood City, San Francisco, et cetera. And secondly, expand tenant eviction protection through the implementation of a rent review task force made up of community members and city staff. Again, last November, we urged the council to make changes in the proposed ordinance by lowering the trigger rent increase rate and increasing the amount of tenants relocation assistance in the event of eviction. We believe that the temporary ordinance your council is considering tonight is fair and balanced and can be acceptable for all parties concerned. It is an ordinance that we can support. Affordable Housing Now also supports the suggestion to convene some sort of community outreach process on rent stabilization and tenant protect protections. However, some of the techniques suggested by staff seem lacking in innovation. If you are really committed to community participation in this process, a task force kind of committee with a facilitator should be convened principally with tenant, landlord, and others from the community with a small number of staff. It should be made clear by the council as well what their goals and missions are for this group and exactly how the outcomes of the group's deliberations will be utilized. And I just uh, had a thought about how you find members of the task force. Uh, you could have a nomination process from the community. You could have five people from tenants, five people, whatever numbers you decide and get nominations. And from those nominations from the community, you guys decide who will be on that group. Thank you so much. Thank you. Okay. We'll now move on. That is the end of all of the requested additional time. So each member of the community will have 90 seconds uh, to speak before the council. Sorry. And uh, just a reminder, we have a right to hear everybody's perspective, um, agree with them or not. Um, we will listen and then we will move on to the next speaker. So, sir, you are next. Go ahead. Uh, welcome, City Council. And uh, you have lots of decisions to make, obviously, on just cause evictions. Uh, what do you call it, subleasing that isn't approved by the landlords and stuff. And what I want to bring up when you're making the rules for these decisions, just remember that uh, uh, we ha we're in a, a severe housing shortage. The problem is we don't have enough rentals. So in my opinion, I think we should preserve the existing rentals, encourage conversions to rentals like ADU, ADU units and encourage building new uh, rental housing. So when you make these decisions, think about what you're doing to the supply. And when we talk about the supply of housing, also remember uh, uh, Crone, uh, Chris Crone had mentioned at the last meeting that, that Santa, uh, UC Santa Cruz has 20,000 students. They only house half of them on campus. The other half are taking up a lot of rentals in Santa Cruz. And you, I believe you said they're planning on going up to 30,000. So what is this doing to the availability of housing? I don't know what the city council can do about that. Hopefully you can do something about that. Also, there's also, I've, I heard that there's 8,000 single family homes that are being rentals. The more you lean on, on the landlords, you're gonna force them or put them in the position of them, they're gonna sell them to, to homeowners. So that would pull those units off the market. You just only pull half of them off the market. That's 4,000 less rentals. Uh, and then the, uh, uh, there's 20,000 rentals, I believe, total, and there's 5,000 for the pre-1996 rentals. Uh, so anyway, my message is think about the rental supply and how your decisions are going to affect landlords and whether they keep Thank them you. or sell them. Thank you. Yes. Okay, next speaker here. 
No. Can we take one from that side, one from this side? Nope. There's, we will line up on that side. Yeah, okay. So, uh huh. Let me go ahead and clarify. If you're interested in speaking, please line up to my left, and we will have each person have 90 seconds to speak. Speak. Oh, okay. You just feed that line around. Okay. Okay. So they should. This is the line. Oh, this is the line. Apologies. Okay, so you are in line. I just FYI, I'm sorry, I didn't realize it wrapped around this way. We will get to you as we get through everybody. Okay? Okay. So at this time, we'll allow for you to have your 90 seconds. Um, Linda ahead. Robinson, I'm a landlord, and I just wanted to say that I have worked 33 years in this community, overtime, double time, just got off a 12-hour shift um, in order to purchase a home, and, an order, and I'm a great landlord, and I don't see any problem with rent control being, you know, a, a monetary amount every month, but I can't fathom you telling me that I can't move back into my home that I'm planning on retiring in, and, um, or that my my renter can go ahead and ask any of his friends to come in when there's only one parking, one bathroom, one everything. So I, I, did, I wasn't gonna speak, but I just thought I'd tell you that I'm one of those nice landlords who I do think you should have rent control with monetary rent control. Like we shouldn't be gouging renters and we should have a place for them to come and everything, but, but not, I mean, I have 600 square feet. That means I can have 12 people in that place with a one a one parking and one bathroom. No. Excuse and me. I mean, that that okay, I sorry. Pause. No. You there. I just want to let you know that you are unable to. Please do not bang on the windows or disrupt the speaker when they're speaking. Thank you. Okay, go ahead and continue. That's pretty much all I have to say. I just there's a few things in this whole uh, measure M that I don't understand, and I've just worked my whole entire life really hard to be a, a homeowner and to give a tenant a great place to live. And I don't think that I should not be able to get rid of somebody if they're. I just I, I, anyway, I'm done. I'm good. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Hi, my name is Mara Alverson. First, I wanted to let you know that I'm a supporter of the homeless shelter and support all efforts to build more affordable housing in our community. And to enforce the law with regard to affordable units being included in new apartment complexes, which I understand is not being done very strictly. I voted in support of Measure H. I also support reasonable rent increase control measures. I feel that our housing crisis is serious. I'm writing to let you know how my life would be impacted by the adoption of just cause eviction measures. I was only able to afford to buy my home because it has an ADU in the backyard, which I've been renting. This unit is six feet from my bedroom window. So noise, smoke, et cetera, has a big impact on me. If I were to lease it to someone who on first evaluation seemed to be a very responsible, considerate tenant, but who turned out not to be considerate, my living situation would be severely impacted. Having to pay two months rent to evict them would be a severe hardship on me. The addition of additional occupants without my consent or the subleasing of the unit would be very disruptive for me. My daughter will be back from grad school in a couple of years. Oops. Okay. Thank okay. you. Your Thank time's you. Up. Thank you. Next speaker, please. Hi, Council. Uh, my name is William Robb, and I just want to put my two cents in, meaning uh, I think that Measure M. Uh, was and in and is still a very angry bill. And I think it was written in anger, written by a group of people trying to solve a very serious problem. I believe both sides probably should have gotten together first to identify the problem and then come up with a fair and reasonable solutions that would benefit all and not completely distress one side of the issue. Um, thank goodness the good people of Santa Cruz saw through that badly written bill and voted against Measure M, and again, in overwhelming numbers. The passage of Measure M would have been devastating, I think, to landlords, renters, homeowners, investors, probably broken up many families, and added to the city budget, all 
while helping a very, uh, in my opinion, limited amount of people. More important, and I think it would limit the choices we all um, hold so deeply. I can't understand why the city of Santa Cruz has decided to take it upon itself to solve our community's housing crisis by assuming that any part of Measure M would help. I just, that's, I just don't understand it. It's not right, it doesn't work and against the will of the Santa Cruz voters, as we've urged. Uh, so I urge the board to recognize the need for further public discussions and possibly help from form a new citizens uh, committee to discuss the issue in an amicable manner uh, to all. So don't limit the choices, we still. Okay, thank you very much, thank you. Uh, next speaker, please. Good evening, Council. My name is Patty Robb. I am a landlord. Um, I please respectively encourage the City Council not to adopt any new rent control ordinance or just cause eviction ordinance. Please respect the Santa Cruz City citizens vote in November 2018, which resulted in Major M not passing. Um, I would also like you to please consider the cap on the rent increase. Um, You've got a three and a half percent Excuse increase. Me, I'm going to pause your time. That will be an agenda item that will come up after. So you oh, can after. speak to that item after. Oh, At this okay. time, it's just this item that you just, can address. Okay. Thank you. Um, Go ahead. Jeff. And so then um, I'll speak on that later. My other comment is when you're adopting and considering an ordinance like this, it seems like these, I feel my tenants and I are on the same team. I respect my tenants, my residents. I... You know, I can't, I hear these stories about these landlords, these minority of landlords that are raising astronomical rents. I can't fathom it because I'm on the same team with my residents. I've had my residents for many, many years. So I would urge you to consider a penalty. Why can't there be an ordinance with a penalty for the minority of landlords out there that are gouging and excessive rent increases and taking advantage of residents to urge you to come up with some kind of a penalty for the minority because the majority of the landlords out there value their residents and we shouldn't be penalized. We shouldn't be put in a basket and be subject to this severe proposal of an ordinance. Uh, the minority that's causing all this should be penalized, but the majority of the landlords do not act. Thank you very much. My name is Mickey Larson, and I would like to thank the City Council for saving me about $100,000. <clears> that would be the approximate cost of constructing an ADU. I have a large lot behind my house, and I was considering building an ADU. The city has encouraged these dwellings <clears throat> by loosening restrictions on permit fees, setbacks, parking, etc. But with the push for extreme rental restrictions and council's shim-sham slide dance to resurrect defeated Measure M conditions, an ADU is out of the question for me. The city needs housing. It's encouraging ADUs. At the same time, it is promoting restrictive rent control. From my perspective, the city is operating at cross purposes to defuse the housing crunch. <clears throat> no intelligent person will build an ADU and be held hostage to the council's proposed rental restrictions. The council needs to reform its act and consider the unintended consequences of its decisions. Some members of the council may view their role as progressive towards rental reform. This is naive and dangerous without studying the unintended consequences <coughs> of decision making. Case in point, an initiative to keep seniors or five-year residents uncontested in their rentals. This is virtually a guarantee that landlords will not rent to seniors. It may be discrimination, but try and prove it. In the end, the rich stay rich. Thank you. Thank you very much. Your time is the rich now over. Stay, Thank the you. Rich Your time is over. Rich. Thank you. Excuse me. Yeah. Your time is now over. Your time the is now over. Middle class gets screwed, no, no, and housing and seniors lose stop, under the misguided misguide, <laughs> politics of a just okay, cause. I'm going to go ahead and turn off your time. You, you have each person is allotted the same amount of time, so I appreciate you adhering and respecting that. We have our next speaker. Please go ahead. <clears throat> It would be disrespectful to the democratic process and to the majority of Santa Cruz residents to approve an eviction ordinance that contains objectionable rules from overwhelmingly defeated Measure M. The tenant sublease rule and the family member addition rule in this ordinance violate common sense leasing standards and are as objectionable now as they were in Measure M. 
There is no need for a new temporary eviction ordinance and the justifications for putting it in place are hearsay and not supported by any hard data. The right way to move forward to heal the city from the divisiveness and bad feelings around Measure M is to convene the task force with a cross section of stakeholders, support them and build consensus. The proposed <coughs> eviction ordinance is exactly the wrong approach. <coughs> It is not appropriate, wise, or fiscally responsible for the council to attempt to override all the active leases in the city, especially without buy-in from the majority of Santa Cruz residents. This temporary eviction ordinance will taint the task force process by <clears throat> indicating that the outcome is already a done deal. Thank you. Thank you. Next speaker. Good evening, Council. I'm Linda Hodge, and I'm a, a, a landlord. Um, I, um, I would like to say that uh, process is important and democracy is important. Um, I'd like to see changes like this. Since we just had Measure M, I'd like to see changes made on the ballot. And I would like to see like this lady, she was describing how you get groups together to negotiate and figure out what the issues are. And uh, I'd, I'd like to see that happen. Um, and I'd like to see um, <clears throat> uh, the council work on supply. I'd like the state to force UC to build some dormitories. And finally, the last thing is most land, the, the ordinance, it hurts the landlords because it kind of assumes that most landlords are bad. I have to deal with people, I, I haven't evicted anybody but I do use the, the uh, perspective of uh, eviction when two tenants are knocking on the walls and fighting with each other. I've got a 67 year old man and I'm 65, so I don't give him any slack. He's drunk and falling down and disorderly on the property. And when after the ordinance expired, after Measure M was defeated, he stepped two. He's behaving himself now because he knows he could get evicted. We, we need to manage our units where two people or 26 people or 50 people live in proximity. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, uh, next, next speaker, please. Hi, everybody. My name is Alice Terrell. I'm a renter here in Santa Cruz for 20 some years. And I, support rent control in this town. I think we need it. But the just cause eviction proposal and the emergency measure and measure M is unfair to landlords. Completely unfair to landlords. Because people who have owned property in this town, many of them live on site and they have a right in my opinion anyway, they have a right to say who lives on their property, that, that, they, uh, that they are good tenants. And that to, my understanding is that the 50 square feet per person, less kitchens and bathrooms is overcrowding and overpopulate, over parking issues and that it'll be detrimental to the neighborhoods if you pass this like this. I think we need something, but this is not it. And I also think I am like one of the previous speakers. I think that if you... Okay, thank you, thank you. Okay, our next speaker, please. Hello, my name is Josh Brahinsky. I'm also a landlord. Uh, and I'm a part of a group of landlords who supported Measure M. Uh, there were a bunch of us, although not, you know, probably about 40 or 50 of us on our list. Um, but there were dozens of other landlords who came to me throughout this process and said, you know, I really support rent control. I really think there needs to be some kind of eviction protections, but there's a couple details in Measure M that just get my goat and I'm having a hard time with that. And that was person after person after person after person. And they said, that's why, I mean, we all know that the, the campaign against Measure M, right, was not don't do rent control. It was, it's too expensive and it's too extreme. 
And we know that rents here are too expensive and too extreme. <laughs> and, but we also know that there are all these small-time landlords here who really, really care about the people who they rent to. And they want to build a community that's kind and a community that's stable. And they bought that rhetoric, right? They believed it. They're like, yes, this is too expensive and too extreme. So right now is the time to bring those people and the renters together and build a community process where we can figure out what's not too expensive and too extreme, but actually protects people, that takes care of people in this town. Because everybody we talked to agreed, I, I don't think I talked to a single person out of the you know, hundreds and hundreds in the last year that didn't agree that we have a massive crisis, that people are being kicked out of this town at an incredible rate, and we need to fix it. Okay. Hi, council members. My name is Melissa Freebaron, and I am your local nurse. I grew up in this town. I've been a renter for over 20 years, and the voters have spoken with no on Measure M for a reason, because not all of the landlords in this town are slumlords. Many of them are local moms who were single moms, who worked over 30 years to own a property, who now this council can come and adopt an ordinance and tell them what to do with their property if they had a tenant for over 13 years that decided, you know what, I like my rental. You won't sell it to, you, to me, I'm not gonna move out. I'm gonna do everything possible to make it impossible to move out. We are your working unseen people, your nurses, your firemen, your law enforcement, your city workers. I worked at the jail, juvenile hall. I know I can't afford a place to live here unless I go to work every day and I earn it. I'm a single mother. I work every day. I know that these things will not be handed to me living in a coastal town. I grew up in this town and I can't even afford to live here. And I serve this town. So I want you to be aware, I'm speaking out for all those mom and pop landlords who are not slumlords. They're your local people generations of people who fought to own a home here and they don't deserve you to just adopt an ordinance. And I voted for all of you. So I'm, pa I'm paying attention. We're paying attention. I am your constituent. Thank you. Hello, my name is Elena Cohn, and I'd like to start out by thanking you for your statements at the beginning about rules of civility and respect. I think it's a really important uh, first step to try to heal some of the problems that existed so deeply um, with the last election. And so towards that end, um, I actually um, encourage, I think that the uh, options suggested about community input uh, in the, rep the agenda report were very helpful. I actually would like to suggest um, support for the mediation approach. I'm concerned that the um, task force in terms of how it's going to be selected uh, may create problems. I'm concerned about the uh, quality of the surveys. I um, had participated in programs uh, in the summer where uh, Santa Cruz uh, together representatives met with the, um, with the city representatives and I wish that the Yes on M people had participated Participated too, and I really encourage that approach as a way to um, try to resolve this problem respectfully. Um, I'm glad to hear about the ADU uh, exemption continues. I'd like to see that continue. Um, and um, and then lastly, um, I just think it's really important that we all try to improve um, uh, building affordable housing, and I'm concerned that this interim measure will actually discourage that. Thank you. Thank you. Good evening. My name is Deborah Wallace, and I am a housing provider as well as a property manager. Uh, since last February, our housing supply has been significantly reduced as a direct result of the emergency rental provisions adopted by the previous council prior to the voters defeating Measure M. Many owners either sold their properties or withdrew them from the supply of rentals. It is my hope that the new council does not further reduce our existing housing supply by passing this counterproductive ordinance, which reads very much like Measure M. 
What you are currently proposing will cause even more owners to remove their rentals from the market. More homes will be sold or left vacant. This is permitted under state law and nothing compels owners to continue to offer their, offer their properties for rent. You should be doing everything you can to encourage mom and pop housing providers to stay in the market, not withdraw from it. Investors and developers should be encouraged, not discouraged from owning rental properties. We need more rentals, not fewer. Fewer rentals equals higher rents. The laws of supply and demand apply here, just like everywhere else. A large majority of people have spoken loudly and clearly on this issue, okay. and it is Thank time you. for you to listen. Thank, Thank you. you. Good evening, my name's Mike Marcus. I was born in Santa Cruz. I've lived here all my life. I'm a homeowner and a landlord. We have talked about loving Santa Cruz. I don't love it so much anymore. This has been really, really bad on our family, the stress that it's caused. When no one am means no one am. I just don't understand it. The democracy is not working. So to get to the point, I wanted to retire. Worked here all my life. I'm gonna sell my home and move somewhere else. Thank you. Okay, excuse me. We have a chance to hear from every person one, one by one, and now it's your turn to speak. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, my name is Paul Kunze. I'm a rental property owner. I kind of have to echo the same uh, assessment. I want out. I'm, these are just crazy rules that you're trying to apply. It's hard enough to be a good landlord. This just makes it impossible. Um, I recommend you guys look at the New York City Rand Institute uh, study, the MIT of 1970, the 1995 study of MIT from MIT of rent control um, in Cambridge, Massachusetts, and the 2017 study in a Sanford Graduate School of Business. Um, they all basically say the same thing. You can get two economists, economists are wildly opinionated. You can put two of them in a room, ask them the same question and get six different answers, but all, most economists agree rent control is bad. I would like to suggest a solution. One of the problems we have is, or micro homes would be sustainable. I would like to suggest that we put a college program together where the students get to build their own home, where they actually get to live in it while they're going to school. I think it'd be a phenomenal program. The second part to this is, I work in a construction type industry. We have an impossible time to get anyone who knows left from right of a hammer. I mean, they just, this, these aren't school skills that are taught anymore. To get a handyman around here is near impossible because there's just so few of them out there. <sighs> I don't know how else to say it, and I apologize, I get a little stage fright here, but I hope my points come across. Thank you for your time. Thank you for your time. Hello, Council. My name is Julian Prino Stoll, and I am the co chair of the Democratic Socialists of America Santa Cruz. Today, this council has an opportunity to initiate a democratic and expert informed process to enact long overdue tenant protections. You could do this by creating an advisory committee that would provide recommendations for effective rent stabilization and just cause protections, and to protect tenants in the long term. Meeting times should be advertised and accessible for working people. Its composition should include representation for students, proportional representation for tenants and reflect the racial diversity of Santa Cruz. As an organizer, I know how essential good facilitation is to running a good meeting. That's why it is so important that this committee makes use of a professional facilitator to keep this urgent work moving and to craft the best policy recommendations possible. Additionally, I would like to say that strong just cause eviction is necessary for preventing evictions in the meantime, and removing the exemption proposed by former council member Naroyan would make just cause much better. All of this, of course, assumes that the opponents of Measure M were serious when they said that they want to wipe away the battle lines that have been drawn in our community. 
So demands to recall council members or to run a referendum on any policy which has been passed by this council would be done in bad faith, and it would be a shame to see such hypocrisy. Let's remember that no community process will let us hear from all those who have been displaced in this city. Although they are not here tonight, I ask you to do your best to hear them. Thank you. Greetings, council and staff. Thank you for all of your input on this. Uh, I'm Marvin Christie. I was born and raised in Santa Cruz. I am involved in the housing industry and I'm very passionate about this subject. I'm also very saddened by the div divisive nature of this current dialogue. I think you guys have a big task ahead of you and, and I'm looking forward to seeing how it all comes out. I'd like to be a part of the solution. Um, unfortunately, I'm seeing firsthand the, the tenants that are being hurt, the great landlords who are being hurt. This, this just cause is, is not helpful for anyone. It's not helpful for either side. It's, it helps a few, very few tenants and it hurts everybody else. I really hope you take that seriously. I hope you put back in the exemptions for owners who live on site. It's, it's, a, it's a huge thing. The ADUs are, are a great asset to this community and, and you just don't hear about them anymore. No one's building them. Why would you? It's crazy. You, you, you have to do something about it. The statistics, I, I'd love to know the statistics. I'd love it if someone could come up with those statistics. How many were, were built before this proposition and how many are, are being proposed now? How many permits are being pulled? I'd love to know that. That's something you guys need to know. You need to know what the effects are of the current conversation. I do look forward to finding and expanding common ground. I, I hope that this works and I, I think you guys have a huge task ahead of you and I hope you can bring, bring both sides together. Thank you. Hi, my name is Gerhard John Phillip, and you might not like what I have to say. I um, don't get any part of the just cause eviction, and the uh, the reason I don't like it is, in my opinion, it's unconstitutional. I think you should talk to your city attorney. I think that ex post facto criminal law is banned in all legislatures everywhere in the United States. And the fact that you may not prosecute people makes it just sort of a threat that you're issuing, but you're not gonna go through with it because you know you'll lose. And the other unconstitutional part of the ex post facto nature is the contract clause, uh, which says you cannot interfere with a contract. So if a uh, landlord gives notice in that you know, retroactive period, uh, that becomes an obligation of the tenant to move on that date. And if, you, if they, uh, you're dangling money in front of the tenant saying, sue the landlord, sue the landlord. Well, if they do it, you, they're gonna turn around and sue the city. And you uh, have no idea what you're doing. You don't know how, what's in those contracts. You don't uh, know how many people will bring suit. Uh, it's like going to Vegas, uh, you know, playing crafts with the people's money at three in the morning, except you don't know the odds and uh, you don't know how much you're betting. Okay, that's one thing I don't like about it. Um, I also don't like the whole idea that landlords. Thank you for your time. That time? Thanks. Yeah, that's time. Mayor Watkins, city council members, members of the community. My name is Tom Powers. I am a homeowner. My wife and I also own a duplex in Santa Cruz. Um, like many people, I've been on both sides. I've come up through the ranks, going from uh, moving out from home to renting a house with four of my friends on o right off of Ocean Street, um, working hard, you know, to many many different jobs, uh, going to school, um, working really really hard just to achieve the dream of home ownership with zero help from family. Family and just doing it just, uh, you know, just on my own. So me and my wife on, my, on our own. So anyway, so it's really, really disconcerting and it's been so polarizing. It's turned into an us versus them, um, you know, where, where the supporters of Measure M have pretty much uh, categorized all landlords as, as greedy, scum sucking, you know, scum of the earth. You know, I mean, basically looking to raise rents at every opportunity. That's, I think that's really an unfair, unfair portrayal landlords. I think uh, you know, most landlords um, are mom and pop landlords. Uh, 
and uh, care about the community and basically um, you know, as most tenants are good. So it's a symbiotic relationship. As a landlord, we need good tenants and as a renter, you need a nice place to live. So I think what we need to do is come together you know, and come up with reasonable solutions other than just you know, trying to ram down our throat um, just cause eviction, which the voters resoundingly rejected. Um, thank you. Hey, Tony. Uh, my name is Randy Strong, and I've lived here uh, over 30 years, raised my kids here in this community, and uh, we've worked really hard to uh, build our uh, home in Santa Cruz. I started out as a carpenter uh, at $18 an hour, built our first home, and we tore it apart from scratch and uh, raised our kids in this home for 20 some odd years. Uh, that then became a rental to provide for another beautiful family. They were there for seven years, and uh, they we treated them fairly. Uh, unfortunately for us, <clears throat> uh, the, the house took on a totally different shape during that seven years. The house was completely uh, changed on the inside. The exterior was uh, totally demolished and, um, and changed from what we had, which was the nicest home on the block, became what was not the nicest home on the block. And so anyway, with that in mind, we uh, opposed to uh, wanting to be a, a landlord again because of course the, the, the big expense of restoring this property. So I now have moved my kids into this house, which is now off the market. I, I apologize for that, but it is. Uh, we have other rental properties and we are very, uh, all our rental uh, uh, properties outside the community, outside this community are below market value. We uh, rent to a, an elderly, we rent, rent to uh, another business and, and those uh, costs are well below. Uh, the problem with that now is uh, to fix up that home and to keep it uh, looking good. Thank you. And do it with okay. Hi, my name is Dave, and uh, I live near the university. And I, I want to state that if you want to address the issue of rent uh, increases, you need to build more houses, specifically for the students. Um, uh, what I'm saying is. is Sorry. Okay, go ahead. You, when you, I don't want to distract from your time. You can go ahead and All speak right. now. Go ahead. Uh, you, you need to address housing by building more houses, uh, specifically for the students. And um, the only renter or landlords that I've seen abusing renters <laughs> are actually um, students that are renting houses from a landlord and then subletting to other students. Those are the ones gouging for prices. They got 12 people living in a house, three people in a garage, and charging outrageous prices and profiting from it. Thank you, Council. My name is Rob. I'm a lifelong Santa Cruz resident. My wife's born and raised, and we have three units in Santa Cruz. Uh, and we are on the teetering point right now with uh, two bad experiences we just went through. I don't like the dialogue of villainizing landlords. Uh, we are what would be considered a mom and pop landlord that are proactively involved. Our tenants like us, we take care of issues that come up. Uh, but we just went through two nightmare evictions, one for non-payment, uh, found out convicted felon after she moved in, uh, it took us four months to get her out, cost us $14,000. I mean, it's economics 101. Where does that money come from to pay for that lost rent? So shortly thereafter, we had another tenant that um, moved two dogs into the property, tore the place apart. It was a cooperative eviction. It wasn't fun, uh, but it cost us $4,000 to put new carpet in this place after 11 months putting it in there. So I just don't like the dialogue of villainizing landlords. We're mom and pop people that have worked here. I've been gainfully employed since I was 13 years old in Santa Cruz. My wife's worked here. We've worked hard to save money, to have a couple rentals to help us in our retirement. And I think it's wrong to villainize landlords in this whole process and you need to bring people together to work together. So that's what I encourage you guys to do and um, not throw the baby out with the bathwater and just, just assume all landlords are bad. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. My name is Elizabeth Walsh, and I'm a 25-year resident of Santa Cruz County. Um, and uh, I've been managing 
multifamily housing for 32 years in Mountain View, and we have rent control, and it's destroyed the community. And it started just like this with a, an emergency just cause eviction ordinance, and it was a slippery slope, and it didn't work. And my tenants, who I love, who I've had for 20, 30, I've had tenants who have been there for 35 years because I treat them well, and they've turned on me because pro bono attorneys have taken them over and promised them no rent increases. And I can't pay the bills because my buildings are older and I can no longer do the things that need to be done in my buildings. I built a little multifamily housing unit over here hoping I wouldn't be around Mountain View, even though I had to keep managing over there. And now it's followed me. It is a Trojan horse. It will ruin your community. It will become divisive between tenants and landlords. It's not the way to solve the problem. Supply and demand is the only solution to this. We have a housing shortage and we cannot fix it on the backs of landlords. It's a community problem. The landlords should not be required to fix it. And please take that into consideration. This will not work. Thank you. Hello, my name is Matt. I'm a homeowner here in Santa Cruz, relatively new homeowner. My wife, uh, born and raised in the Seabright area. I'm here today to encourage you not to implement the Just Cause Ordinance. I took the time today to tediously read through the 510 pages of public correspondence published on the city's website in response to this matter. I counted all 489 emails sent to the council, and of those emails, 474 emails specifically urged the council not to enact the Just Cause Ordinance. That's 96%. Of the 13 emails calling for rent control protections, few of them actually I'm just, identified. Me, I just want, you can go ahead and start. I just wanna let you know, when. please just allow him to speak so that his time is his time, and every individual who wants to speak will have their time as well. So please, go ahead. Of the 13 emails calling for rent control protections, few of them actually identified just cause evictions ordinances, which is what we're reviewing today. Instead, focusing on the high cost of rent and rent in increases, which is a separate matter. Are you listening to the community that you represent? Renters and landlords all want a stable environment, but how can this happen when the rules keep changing? Council previously instituted a mandatory rent freeze that was supposed to expire after the election if Measure M didn't pass. It didn't, and now we're here reviewing the same language that was opposed to placing controls on one's property. I believe that some limit on rent increase is something that we can work together and work through and be agreed upon, but the just cause eviction language copied and pasted verbatim from Measure M is some of the most divisive for the community by hastily invoking major controls over one's property. Retroactively denying a homeowner move in if a tenant has rented for five years is ludicrous. The end date. Thank you. Next. Hello, my name is Robert Kavoris. I'm a tenant here in Santa Cruz. Um, and I want to applaud the council for starting this session by proposing a community process to protect tenants and to protect the community and stabilize the community from the kinds of effects that we get when there's high tenant turnover uh, and when tenants don't feel like they can even be a part of this community. So I applaud you for that. I don't have that much faith that a consensus will be easily reached. And there are two reasons for that. One, because we're talking about a consensus that would naturally include tenants, but I don't see a lot of tenants in the room. And I suspect that's because tenants don't currently feel protected enough to even engage in a process like this. I don't think you can have a process like the one that's proposed without an interim ordinance that protects tenants. Two, I hear a lot of landlords as well as other people saying time and time again throughout the election season, well, I would support tenant protections, I would support rent control, but not this. I would tweak it like this, I would change it like that. And yet every time the same people come up here and trot out the same talking points, regardless of what's actually under consideration, by the way, and uh, oppose every effort to protect tenants. So I don't think some of the people who are participating are participating in good faith, but I do believe in the council that was elected. I do think I know what your values are, if not everyone shares those values in this community. Uh, and so I hope you Thank will you. do what you were elected to do. Next speaker. Thank you. Thank you. Hi, 
Hi, my name is Mark Agnello, and uh, I grew up here. I went to Santa Cruz High School, lifeguarded with uh, Tom, who was just up here on the main beach 16 years, and went through the nursing program at Cabrillo, and I was able to get a rental. And I just wanted to, you know, reiterate uh, is my understanding that the council is poised to adopt almost all the extreme provisions in Measure M that voters rejected by over 60% just last fall. As a constituent, I expect the council to remember and respect the majority's vote and not force through new rent control or just cause eviction measures without having public discussions, what you know, we're doing. Uh, however, I, 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 it's my understanding that the city, the city council canceled plans as December 4th um, established to require the landlords to give tenants 90 days warning before evicting them um, due to litigation. And, uh, you know, I only donated 20 bucks to, uh, you know, the, the measure against them, but I have a pretty good uh, feeling that almost everyone that's come up here is willing to donate, like I'm willing to donate 200 bucks right now uh, for litigation. And I just hate to see it go that way, but you know what? I, I feel, you know, there's no doubt it will. Uh, we voted. Uh, we can vote again, but if we vote and you guys turn it over, you know, what are we going to do, right? I'm, yeah, I'm, I'm complete. All right, our next speaker, please. Hi there, my name is Stacy Falls. I'm a renter in the city of Santa Cruz. Um, it's a little hard for me to be up here right now to talk about uh, rental issues because less than a week ago I was served a notice to vacate my home of 12 years. And, um, Man, 12 years, you know, we've planted gardens, we've planted fruit trees. Five days before I got the notice, I buried my cat in the backyard. So, you know, I, like I would love to buy a house and set down roots and know that a 30 year mortgage is gonna protect me and allow me the luxury of being able to have a stable life. But I, who can afford, who can afford 20% down when the average housing price is $900,000? I can't, I'm a teacher, I can't afford that. So the best I can do is, is rent and rent from a good landlord. My landlord probably would have told you that she's a good landlord and she takes care of her tenants. Less than a year ago, she told me she had no intention of evicting me and that she cares about having stable, uh, responsible renters and that she cares about having stable community members and that you know having good teachers is important to her. And here I am, I'm out of a house. What do I do? You know, what, what are we gonna do? What are you gonna do for me? So, you know, please pass this so that we can have a community conversation without people like me being in fear of retaliation for speaking out. And please get rid of the, like, sole rental property exemption. My landlord only owns one property, but she is not struggling. She owns two properties worth over $2 million in this, prop in this town. You. She can handle it. Thank you. Okay, excuse me, I, I wanna just again remind everybody that each person has their time to speak and we will hear from everybody who wants to speak here this evening and to allow the person to speak without any disruption. I, I, I sincerely ask you would please do that. So go ahead. My name is Dave Willis and what I've been hearing is like a lot of words, like it's obvious to me that some people do not know or understand how serious this problem is. Like talking about hiring somebody as a consultant, we got activists here who can tell you the information that I guess you're you asking. And if you don't already have that information, after all of these years, look outside the window. The problem is here, it's now. You wanna pay somebody, we got activists, pay them. This is how I see it. You get seven people one from each category or three. And you, let's say like you have three homeless advocates, three from the other side and one person in the neutral. Get them in the room, let them come up with some writings because I'm figuring that we can all get along and we can be smart enough to figure something out. And we need action now. Yesterday, people are hurt and they're hurting now. We walk around with worries we don't need those worries. Let us put something else positive in here and with our emotion. People going to the moon, et cetera. People should be smart enough. We don't need nobody be talking about consulting two weeks, three weeks, or three months. We need action now. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Oh, 
Hello, I'm a preschool, preschool teacher and a renter. For over a year and a half since I moved to Santa Cruz, I have lived in fear. Fear that kept me from speaking up till now. My old landlord, who I'm li I lived with, had mental issues, something I never knew until recently. So I never knew who I was going home to. Yet I did know who I had to go home to harassment and his messes, which he demanded my roommates and I to clean up after him. I am here to urge you to support just cause of eviction so others don't have to live with that kind of living situation due to current renting laws or even face an eviction threats because one does not have good vibes to the house. Hello, um, welcome new council members and congratulations to our new mayor and vice mayor. My name is Carol Paul Hamus, and I also was a single parent who worked two jobs to buy my house and was lucky enough to build an ADU for my parents for the end of their lives, at which I now run out as a single rental to a UCSC professor. Um, I also worked for the County Office of Education developing career training programs for at-risk youth. We made tons of decisions about changing programs. We never made any decision in the absence of data. The city does not have any data on actual rent increases. I'm not talking about Zillow. I'm talking about real data on actual current tenancies as well as new ones. There is also no data on evictions. City Council previously voted against conducting a study of the potential impacts of the passage of Measure M. And when discussing rent stabilization just prior to the election, Council's decision was to wait and let the voters decide. Well, the voters did decide. And now in spite of election results that rejected Measure M two to one, you're still considering just cause evictions, which in my opinion was the primary reason M failed in the first place. Making laws in the absence of data results in bad legislation with unintended consequences and will set up the city for expensive litigation. The overarching goal is to increase the availability and affordability of housing. Don't lose sight of that. If you continue to alienate housing providers. Okay, thank you. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Next speaker. So Bula Bula, which is a uh, Pacific Islander ceremonial term for the Kaaba ceremony, which I've now been a part of uh, this week. While I do enjoy smoking camels in a pinch, I'm definitely a Marlboro man. Marlboro headquarters now has $4 uh, discounts every uh, Sunday it is, I think it is, so every week on your phone, PayPal, Apple, WePal, whatever. You can get four dollars in Marlboro discounts. The word exemptions really, in my experience with government service, uh, brings back m memories of, you have no idea how big a meeting can be with the FAA. None. Uh, and a very impressive picture would be to go like Google Images FAA meeting and you will be stunned at the machinery that is represented in a FAA meeting. Uh, anyway, that goes back to my years with Colonel Comer uh, right after Y2K. Uh, really what I wanna talk about in my uh, 17 seconds is that it's so great working for a lawyer as a boss. Uh, debutante status really is not the issue. The issue is what was done in law school. When your boss is a great lawyer, everything gets so much easier. And the bottom, okay. thank you. Thank you. Okay. All right, next speaker, please. Hello, my name is Henry Lopez. Um, I have a friend named Greg Nielsen. Who, I have a friend named Greg Wils or Nielsen in um, Oregon. And uh, you know, I never knew the guy, I never met the guy in my life. But uh, one time, uh, I mean, I had money in my pocket and stuff, but my friend broke his wrist working for him, and uh, I decided to help him because I felt bad for his wrist. I was like, yo, dude, I'll cover you know your spot or whatever, it don't matter what kind of job it is. And then this guy was actually getting evicted at a 30-day notice, and like, he had lived there for 30 years, 
and his whole lifestyle was just like totally natural, like straight from Hawaii, which was cool. And uh, you know, I, I when I first seen him and met him, he was just so pleased to have someone actually there to help him, you know, help him move his stuff. And like some people don't have money here to move their stuff. And like I watched his 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 body, like. I've, I don't know if you've ever seen someone's chest plate break and their heart stick out of it from the, you know, actual pain that they, they feel from losing everything, their love and that energy just being ripped away from them at one moment in time. And I, when I noticed, visualized that, you know, I, I gave him a hug and I felt his, I felt his chest click. I felt his heart heal. And honestly, if all these people are going to be gone thank and you. lost. Thank you. That's what they're okay. feeling. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Go ahead. Hello, my name is Tom Donahue, <clears throat> and I urge the city council to pass this ordinance, but in order to ensure that tenants have equal protection under the law, the single property exemption must be removed. The purpose of this ordinance is to protect tenants, not their landlords, who already hold all the power in that relationship. This exemption would give those landlords free license to upend their tenants' lives, most often for no other reason than to take in even greater profits. And there's been a lot of talk about the supply problem. Well, if you really want to address that, then the city needs to address the fact that too much of the housing supply is being artificially restricted by rampant speculation in the housing market, which is consuming what little available supply there is to be used for something other than its intended purpose, as a shelter for human beings. Far too many homes and rental units are being kept off the market because that restricted supply drives prices higher. And the lamentations about pulling rental units off the market is nothing but a terroristic threat. Essentially, housing providers are threatening to exacerbate this crisis if they don't get their way so they can keep their renters on a puppet string. I agree that we need more respect. Respect for tenants' rights, including the right to live in a stable, affordable environment, as well as their property rights to not be bilked out of their last dollar every month. And if you want statistics, my rent increased 30% in four years. I have now been forced to move and pay $200 a month more than that in order to avoid another $560 rent increase, which my landlord is putting the, the rent up, unit up for rent for now. Good evening, council members. My name is Rick Longinati. Um, I was named to the Water Supply Advisory Committee at a time when the, it was a really contentious issue around desalination in this city. And the 14 members were uh, stakeholders from pro-desal, anti-desal, business community, environmental community, and other residents of our city, a lot of people didn't think that there was much hope of, from that committee that, of reaching any kind of agreement. Um, my group included, we were the alternatives to desalination group. There was a lot of skepticism as to what could come out of it. We were unanimous in our conclusion out of that committee in our recommendations to the city council, which were then adopted. Something kind of magical happened and it needed professional facilitation in order to do that. That's a really important ingredient for success and what you're considering tonight. It needed ex expert staffing. I'm, I would suggest to you that if you're gonna do a task force to protect tenants, that you get expertise in how to do that. And, you know, be, you know, be able to inform that committee and the public about what, what is done elsewhere, what different kinds of innovative things can be done so that we can have a homegrown version of a tenant protection set of recommendations to come back to you. Thank you very much. Hello, my name is Michael Levy and um, I have, I uh, lived in Santa Cruz since 1979, most of that time as a renter. I recently was able to buy a mobile home. But I understand the vulnerability of being a renter, especially now in this market. And it's clear that something needs to be done to protect renters. Um, and it's, I would like to address one point that's been raised, which is that the thing that can help renters is, has something to do with supply and demand. 
I wish that were the case, but I don't think it's true. Housing gets built very slowly <coughs> in this community. There are many, many people that need housing and cannot afford it here. And the idea that housing, especially because most housing that gets built is, um, is not affordable, and uh, we have not been able to change that yet, um, it's never going to correct the problem purely by supply and demand. So we need um, some kind of regulation to protect renters. I think that in this uh, situation that we find ourselves in, which is extremely complex, there's no way to, uh, have, there's no simple solution to this. We need an intelligent body such as a task force to study this and to take uh, input from landlords as well as tenants and other stakeholders into consideration. I support what the last speaker said about something similar to the Water Supply Advisory Committee um, with professional facilitation. Thank you. Members of the community and the city council, um, we've heard all about the need for data, and I think that's certainly clear. How many evictions, how many, um, what, the real issue for me is how high have our good mom and pop landlords raised their rent in the last few years? Surely the people in this audience who honestly have that information can give it to us, and yet not one landlord has been specific about that. Now this, this committee needs to find out that just what's going on around that issue. What are the real costs that landlords claim justify eviction raises? I'm sure there are real costs, but we haven't heard any specific stats given about the reasons justifying the rent raises in the last few years. So if there is such a huge hardship here, it needs to be documented. And I think that this commission, if that's what you're doing, needs to do that. Thank you. Good evening, my name is Steve Schnarr. Been a renter in Santa Cruz since 2001. I was served with a eviction notice last week. Um, it is definitely an immediate need for lots of renters as it has been for years to have eviction protections and just cause eviction. The, the just saying the words doesn't make it the same uh, if you formulate it in a different way than Measure M. So I hope that you pass these temporary ones and work with a task force, bringing a lot of diverse people together to have a long-term solution. I also wanted to comment, um, I appreciate um, Mayor and Vice Mayor, your opening to this and calling for civility and all that. I understand and hosting a public meeting and would, you know, it's hard if people are all shouting at each other, but it also struck me um, to hear about, you know, that we all need to have respect uh, for each other and we all need to be able to feel safe and part of this community because I don't feel like that as a renter and I think thousands of other people who are renters don't feel that. And Measure M, the, I was a part of that. Nobody said all landlords are bad. No one said that. No one said this was an attack on landlords. It was about protecting tenants because they need protection. And uh, you know, mom and pop landlords are not the victim here. Um, they have a lot, um, much more power and money. We need to bring all the sides together. We also need to be realistic that there's some fundamentally different interests there. And I hope that at the end of the day, um, some form of protection that both keeps costs down and protects people like me against arbitrary evictions uh, is passed. Hi, um, good evening council, my name is Clayton. I am a renter in Santa Cruz and so Prop 10 passed within the city by a majority and Measure M failed. What does this mean? This means that people support rent control, but just some, every person had some specific reason that they didn't like Measure M. So how do we fix that? We go in with the pieces of Measure M one at a time on a temporary basis, just like this. We pass, we you know see how they work, see what people actually do, see how people react, and then we can figure out like, okay, how does it actually affect the you know supply, the market, et cetera. So we do pieces one at a time until we get something that doesn't work, then we repeal that. We don't just reject the idea of rent control. Um, and another thing I wanted to point out is about this issue of reducing the housing stock. Um, we don't really care about the housing stock because we want a certain number of units if we remove everybody who currently lives in them, right? If we sacrifice the people who live here now by letting them be evicted for no reason, then there's really no point in uh, keeping that rental on the market for some new person. It's exactly as da damaging as if we took it off the market and sold it to somebody. So it's, it's important we... 
keep that in mind. The people who actually live in those units now are being evicted, they're being replaced by someone else. That would be the same no matter whether it was removed from the market or whether they just got evicted normally. So making it so they aren't evicted. Thank you. Sorry, we had a, we had a thing, but your time is up now. Thank you. Okay, go ahead. Hi, my name's Abby Samuels. I would like to give you respect. Um, you mentioned that in your, when you uh, were put, uh, your opening speech or acceptance, whatever you wanna call it, you mentioned it twice. So I know this is important for you. So I'm wondering if you could let people finish their sentences or their paragraphs when their par buzzer goes off. That would be very respectful, especially since our time has re been reduced to one and a half minutes. I would love to be respectful. I'm wondering since this is a known heated topic and a lot of people would show up, I believe it would be more respectful to have, to have been prepared and instead of kicking almost everyone out, and, and separating us into the inside, outside, and the civic, that maybe we could all be in the same room and prepare, that would be extremely respectful. And there's a lot of people who aren't in this room that are outside, as you can hear, that are renters that are more poor because they have jobs or they, can't, they don't have time to sit around and get here at 6 p.m. so they can get here early. Um, I'm a renter and I'm not poor. I tried buying a house though and was priced out by uh, cash offers uh, selling over the offer price. So I'm for the just cause eviction. I just have one issue that you brought up, Justin, about the nuisance complaint. My neighbor has been bringing up a lot of, he's been trying to get me evicted and now I can't finish my paragraph. Thank you. Okay, next speaker please. Hi, um, my name's Neil Langholds. Uh, Excuse me, can you pause the time? Yes, please, if you, if you don't mind adjusting no the microphone. Thank you. Um, my name's Neil Langholds. Uh, voters opposed draconian measure M by nearly <laughs> two to one. Just cause evictions are the most problematic and objectionable part of measure M. By passing <laughs> just cause evictions, the city council is abusing its power and ignoring the will of the people. This reckless action will create more uncertainty in the rental housing market and will accelerate the loss of rental housing already underway. In the correspondence to the council, an MHJ proponent describes losing her rental house. An owner who rented her house for years now chooses to exit the rental business and the home will likely be sold to an owner occupant. Had it not been for Measure M, she may not be in this predicament. California state law permits people to exit the rental business by selling rentals. The city council cannot do anything to change that. Uh, those behind the extreme rental laws are in fact uh, going to hurt more renters than they help. According to the city of Santa Cruz housing element, renters depend on 8,000 rental houses. These can be converted to owner occupied use. The city has no ability to stop the evictions for that pur the purpose of withdrawing from the rental market. Passing Measure M will cause more of these evictions and the city council will be responsible. Thank you. Next, spe next speaker, please. Good evening, Mayor Watkins and members of the new council. My name is Brennan and I'm here tonight in strong support of the temporary just cause ordinance before you. Enough is enough. In the last few months, we've seen far too many people thrown out of their homes in this city. I know tenants who have been evicted as obvious retaliation for their work for Measure M, as well as tenants of all political persuasions who have been confronted with crushing rent increases or eviction notices since the expiration of the temporary rent freeze back in December. While we work on long-term measures to address the housing crisis, keeping the status quo is simply not an acceptable option. The status quo is not working for tenants who every day are waiting for an eviction notice on their door in their mailbox. It's not working for students who plunge themselves into debt just to literally live in a room in this city until graduation, hurting our mental health and academics. It's not working for seniors and people on fixed incomes who have no place else to go when evicted and can't just get a job or move away from their support services. The list goes on. 
on. This temporary just cause ordinance, while it's obviously not a permanent fix, will change that status quo enough to actually afford some meaningful protection to myself and all the tenants who are speaking to you tonight. Enough is enough. Let's pass this ordinance. And please think twice before you propose or adopt any weakening amendments that will leave tenants vulnerable. Please vote yes, thank you. Hello, uh, my name's Robert McNeil, homeowner here in Santa Cruz with an ADU that is currently not rented. So with all due respect, um, I really have to say that I feel it's really unconscionable that that uh, city council is trying to go against the will of Santa Cruz community that's overwhelmingly expressed their opinion. Um, feel like it's something that you, basically makes me question the overall intention of, of what's going on. So I feel personally, you know, un uncomfortable about that. And despite you know any moral or ethical comments I could make, I mean, really, realistically, what it comes down to is is economics at the at this level. Um, because of, of this, I'm keeping my rental unit off the market and to have an industry, you know, basic economics where that you're adding additional, you know, legislation and liability for me and it, I'm gonna, you know, if I do d decide to go back into the rental market and put it up for rent, I'm gonna make sure I get top dollar for it, right? I'm gonna make sure that i extremely selective of who, who I do and only you know rent to people that are willing to pay the most amount of money. So, I mean, overwhelmingly, despite all the you know objective evidence around it, it's definitely affecting the bottom line, the bottom line community for Santa Cruz. And, you know, it's a cottage uh, community here. It's not some big city, you know, that we're looking at. And it is, you know, homeowners that represent the largest portion of, of, of these things. And so, okay. well, thank you. Good evening. My name is Mary Hesketh. We recently moved here. We had hoped to do the same thing as we did on the East Coast, buy a property that needed a bunch of work, do that work, then rent out part of the house to help pay our mortgage but we really are less and less inclined to do this since the Santa Cruz City Council seems bent on a mission to subsidize renters by enacting ordinances which are absolutely punitive to landlords. We are just working people like many of the renters you claim to be trying to protect. My husband is an elevator mechanic and I work on our rental properties. We can't risk the possibility that a lease would essentially have no expiration date if the tenant decided they didn't want to leave. What if that tenant is just a bad fit to live in an apartment that shares a common wall in our home? Too bad, we just can't wait until the end of the legal lease and no harm, no foul will go our separate ways. We are in effect stuck with that tenant forever, so it looks very much like your decisions are influencing at least one potential rental unit to never enter the market. And I'm sure that many other potential landlords all across the city are assessing the risk involved in making the same decision in passing these ordinances, you're actually going to decrease the number of housing units on the market, thereby hurting the renters you desire to protect. Hi, Council. Um, my name is Kim Fleming. I'm also a local resident here and a landlord. I'm a teacher in the community as well, and I also work uh, part-time doing art and coaching because it is a very expensive place to live. Um, I share a property with my brother, and we are opposed um, to the ordinance. Uh, we have some wonderful tenants, and we've also had some tenants that have given us quite a bit of trouble um, via pets, via noise, um, also doing things that are nuisance to other um, people in the adjoining building and the building next door. And I think it is a shame. It does concern us as landlords um, that our rights are limited in as far as evicting somebody that might be harmful to other um, tenants and neighbors. Uh, it is making us consider withdrawing that property as well and leaving the community. We don't want to do that. I have lots of friends that are fellow teachers and students, and I know there's a housing shortage, um, but it's a big concern for us, and we're definitely opposed to it. So, thank you. Good evening, Council. Um, there's something really kind of tragic going on tonight, and it's best, um, the emblem is just what's happening Look at this. We're all sitting with our backs to each other, and we're each telling you our own best story. 
my partner, a 60 year old, was evicted from the west side by a nice landlord. She was homeless, 60 years old, working woman, therapist. She lived with me for a year until she got subsidized housing. I have my story, it's a really bad story. We've heard them tonight. And I hear the mom and pops who work really hard. My dad was one of these people, so I kind of know that perspective too. Why don't we just talk to each other? I think it's wonderful that you've presented to the community the opportunity at least to talk to each other, to have the kind of task force that DSAL had, where it was a really um, strongly, clearly structured um, group, where they had clear professional facilitation. They practically were locked in the room. They had to talk to each other, and they were charged with reaching consensus. You know, they couldn't just vote. We've got to get rid of this we, you know, win-lose model in our heads. Thank you. And I have more to say. Thank you. My name is Curtis Relaford, 831-246-4240. 831-246-4240. My concern of being here, I'm hearing a lot of money, money, money. When we cut down all these trees, pollute the ocean like it is, what are we gonna talk about then? I've been down the last few days, I know where all you renters can get some free rent, down on the riverfront, down by the levee. I've been working down there with the homeless people down there. They need all the help they can get. That's free rent down there. And the people who charging these folks for this high rent, do bring it down a little bit, have some love, compassion, empathy, I haven't heard any of that up in here. Anybody love anybody? Anybody thinking about anybody else outside of money? There's a way, if you pay me 3%, I can solve this problem. <laughs> right now, all I'm bringing up in here is my heart and soul. And I heard somebody talking about a handyman. I'm a handyman. I'm a landscaper, and I'm having, I'm catching all kinds of, you know, blankety blank doing this, even serving people and helping people. Hey, you guys, we got a long ways to go. Thank you. Okay. Hi, my name is Bill Welsh. And I just want to congratulate Drew Glover and Justin Cummings on winning their election to get on the city council. I also want to say that most of the people here are well-meaning, but they were deceived by all the propaganda from the opponents of Measure M. We're talking about the California Apartment Association and the California Realist Realtors Association. They spent over a million dollars attacking Measure M and Measure H. And a lot of what they said was a fraud, was lies, was fear. And no, it's not against the landlords. I'm not against the landlords, you're not. And I just wanna say that, you know, that we all need to work together. I've seen the homeless camp, you know, up by the river. I go there, I'm starting to go there on a daily basis, bring them food, bring them clothing. And to sleep out there in this kind of weather is horrible. And what we need to do is that we need to stop these evictions. We need to have rent control. And in closing, I just want to urge you to pass this resolution. And thank you very much for your time. So uh, we're in a housing crisis. Um, there's simply not enough uh, rental stock, not enough rentals. <clears throat> and I hear a lot of people uh, removing, you hear stories about uh, landlords removing rentals from the market. Just the more, somebody said earlier, um, the more restrictions you put on rentals, the less rentals you're gonna have to put restrictions on.
Hi, I'm Susan Karen. I just drove from over the hill in the dark and rain to be here and speak before you tonight after spending the afternoon with a four-year-old and a six-year-old granddaughter. So if I stomp my foot and glitter comes out and I whine a little bit, please excuse me. So here we are again, and I'm really not sure why this debate is continuing. The vast majority of the electorate of voters in Santa Cruz voted Measure M down. The components of rent control which carried the most controversy and divided our city are the very ones you're still trying to push forward. Why is that? We put our trust in the process, and some of you seem to be ignoring that. This causes many voters great distrust, and if you don't stop, it'll take a very long time to win that trust back and to reunify our city. I know you're tired of hearing the same messages from opposing sides on this issue. I understand that. What I hope you decide is to show some respect for the process and for the voters, and to use a collaborative process to determine what is right for this issue. You have available to you scores of people who are literally experts in rental housing, whether as owners or managers, some on a small scale and some as a business on a slightly larger scale. None of us appearing at repeated city council meetings are greedy and heartless as characterized and criticized. We do not unjustly evict tenants. We honor the conditions and the ends of leases as required by law. Thank you. Hi, my name is Sasha, and um, I want to appreciate everyone who's come up here and talked about coming together and listening to each other and finding a way to have consensus around this issue, because um, we do have a housing crisis, and I think that this ordinance will give us more time while protecting tenants um, to come up with some solutions and hear from both landlords and from tenants. I myself is a, a tenant. I supported um, Measure M, but I couldn't vote in it because I was living in Capitola at the time. I didn't understand how important just cause eviction um, protection was till the end of October when I myself also received an eviction. Um, and our landlord to told us many times we were the most incredible tenants. When he evicted us, he said we were like family, which is funny. Um, it was really stressful, it was really hard, and to move during the holidays as well. Um, and another point is the market, we were there for five and a half years, the market then and now is so different. And so anytime people are getting evicted, it causes hardship, it causes a lot of stress. We're paying almost $700 more than we were paying a couple months ago. Um, and so it's, it's, it's a real challenge, and I just want to say that I would love for this to pass just so that we have time to hear from everyone in this community and find solutions. Thank you. I'm Daryl Darling. I uh, am fully conscious of the fact that this ordinance was passed because uh, we were facing a housing crisis passed by the council that just concluded their terms, uh, and it's carried over in order to stabilize the, uh, uh, until we are able to, get, to improve on the uh, problems that uh, Measure M had. I was a uh, signer on the ballot measure I'm proud to have been uh, to have signed that. I fully recognized difficulties that that measure had, but the the crisis and the potential inaction uh, really overtook my reluctance to sign Measure M. I'm confident that this council has heard what you need to hear. We'll move forward judiciously and fairly, and I'm confident of this city. Uh, to likewise move forward with genuine care and creativity. Congratulations on your elections. Uh, the two of you were elected specifically on Measure M. That means the community really wanted action on the housing crisis. Thank you. Thank you. Hello. If I can, Bonnie, before we get going, I wanted to see who is still um, interested in speaking at this time. Okay. <laughs> I just wanted to make sure, I know that we have some folks in the Tony Hill room um, 
It's, if there's not a whole bunch, there, please let them know they'd be welcome to come fill in. Okay? Uh, okay, Bonnie, we'll go ahead and restart the time. Thank you. Uh, my name is Ben, and I would like to just thank you for the opportunity to talk. And uh, I just had made some ob observations, and it seems like uh, generally there's a lot of fear around this issue, because everyone just wants a nice place to live, somewhere to call home. And uh, b both for renters and landlords. And something that I did keep hearing uh, for people who are against this uh, ordinance were that they have had issues with evicting problem tenants. And I just wanted to remind everyone that this isn't gonna make that more difficult. If there is just cause, you can evict a tenant. It's, it's, it's only trying to protect people who just want a home. That's all. Um, hi, everybody. My name is Danny. Uh, I grew up in Santa Cruz, born and raised, as they say. Um, so I've been listening tonight, and again, like I say this every time I speak here, it's really jarring listening to a lot of people come up and speak with a lot of flowery language uh, directly to protect their profits and protect their property, while a bunch of other people like come up here and cry and beg for survival, right? Like, there's just such a difference between those two kinds of public comment. And it's really tough to see that. Um, so I obviously support this just cause eviction proposal because we're about to engage in the mediation process, which I also support, a process to create uh, some kind of rent, rent control measure. And we have to fix the deeply unequal power dynamics that are currently in play here if we want to have a real process to build something that works for everyone. If you look tonight, there's a lot of landlords here and probably a lot less tenants because it's not safe for us. And if it's not safe for us to come speak somewhere like this, how are we going to engage in a process? How, when they have all of this leverage over our lives, I don't see how it's possible for that to be fair. Um, and I think that's deeply related to the election we just had. No one's mentioning how the opposition to Measure M put almost $800,000 down in a city of 35,000 voters. I have a lot of friends that do organizing in Illinois, and they don't, even in Chicago, the middle of Chicago, they don't deal with ratios like that, of that much money against that much voters. So I don't see how that is actually a democratic process that we should respect. Hello, Council. Um, my name's Owen. Um, I obviously am also, I also live in Santa Cruz. I'm a tenant. Um, I'm also an organizer, and my main political focus is in attempting to reduce harm in this community. Um, so keeping that in mind, if I had to choose between policy that keeps somebody in their home, keeps them from being arbitrarily evicted, or protects someone from getting their flooring damaged, I would choose a policy that keeps someone in their home. Luckily, in the case of the ordinance in question tonight, those two things aren't mutually exclusive. There's an exemption in the case of material damage to the property, which would allow for that person to be evicted. Um, and so keeping that in mind, I think we need to step into this decision-making process ethically when it comes to mediating competing interests. Um, we need to keep in mind which party bears the greatest degree of harm. Tenants in this community are hurting. We know this. We know that there is an asymmetrical relationship that tenants are hurting generally more than homeowners. All right, so if we're mediating between those two competing interests, we need to side on the group that is hurting the most. So listen to tenants and make your decisions accordingly. Hi there, my name is Liv. I'm with Students United with Renters. Um, we've heard a lot tonight, really sad stories from landlord, land owners, landlords who are sad because their right to profit, their income is being challenged by our right to survival. And I just wanna remind you that it's their choice to make it so their income is reliant on someone's well-being and safety. Like that's a choice and it's really frustrating to hear them being like sharing so much sadness about how they're not allowed to throw around their wealth as they please when we're talking about people's right, like survival and comfort and right to live with their families. Um, and these people fear losing profit. It's like, it's not an equal playing field. These two conversations shouldn't be had, shouldn't be compared in the same context. And we're still here having this conversation because 
tenants still need protection. And we'll st these measures were written by tenants and we'll keep telling you what we need. Thank you. Hello, uh, council, and congratulations to all three of you for being elected. Nice to have new faces up here. Um, I'm a former employee of the city of Santa Cruz, and I've seen personally the struggle of fellow city workers um, and how hard it is for them to afford to live in this city. And the ones that are not commuting from far away are literally just <coughs> clinging on um, with everything they can to stay in this town. And so having a protection against evictions that are not just cause is I think extremely important when you look at um, w workforce and keeping people who are working here in their housing. Um, I've heard a lot of speakers today talk about Measure M. This isn't Measure M. Uh, we're not talking about rent control here. This is just a small piece out of it. And what's really important, um, another piece that people kept bringing up is the Universal Building Code. This is a federal code that deals with occupancy limits, has nothing to do with what we're talking about today. And let's just keep that in mind. Let's try to be fact-based as much as possible. Um, I think that a temporary ordinance is reasonable. I think it's extremely reasonable. I think it um, closely resembles non-temporary ordinances in other cities throughout this state. Um, if you look, the city of Glendale, the city of San Jose, the city of East Palo Alto, the city and county of San Francisco, the city of Emeryville, the city of West Hollywood, the city of Santa Monica, the city of San Diego, the city of Hayward, the city of Petaluma, the city of Pacifica, the city, another small coastal town, by the way, uh, city of Fremont and others all have just cause evictions protection. So let's pass it. Okay. Hello, council, members of the community. Uh, my name is Zav Hirschfield. I'm a tenant advocate in the community and was very involved with the uh, campaign for Measure M. Um, the first thing I'll say is that it's really hard to be up here. Um, I'm sure that's true for everybody who has come up to this podium tonight. Um, I wanna to speak to two things and I'll try to be brief. The first is the question of whether democratic process is being followed. Um, and I'll just repeat what um, Mr. Darling said that two of these new council members who are sitting up here in front of me today were elected saying they were full supporters of Measure M. I, I fail to understand how pushing for further tenant protections that are not Measure M, such as this Just Cause Ordinance, which strips major or aspects of Measure M out of its law, such as the ever contentious relocation assistance, uh, is a miscarriage of the democratic process. Uh, when voters <laughs> heard you saying you supported this law and still decided to put you into these seats. Uh, the other thing I'll talk about, and I only have 20 seconds, is the question of safety, which also has been brought up many times. And I'll just say that I was told by a friend that my ex-landlord uh, called into a radio show that he was speaking on when he was speaking in support of Measure M and said that I was evicted from my home because of activism for tenants and on part of Measure M. So please consider the Just Cause ordinances in that context. Um, my name is Al. I'm a tenant here in Santa Cruz. Um, have been for the last three years. I'm quite nervous, and I just like to name that. Um, but I would like to share anecdotal evidence of the very um, unequal power dynamics between tenants and landlords. I've lived in my current apartment for the last um, since September, and um, the day after I moved in, I had not yet signed a lease. I had submitted um, my rent for the month, which had not been deposited, so I had no rights as a tenant. My landlord came without providing 24 hours notice, um, inspected the apartment for, I think, um, our fuse box. It was very invasive. I was very vulnerable. Um, two weeks before that, she had tried to increase our rent um, I live in a duplex, and so she had tried to increase our rent more than the allotted amount under the temporary rent freeze, and when my housemate confronted her about it, she yelled at him and still continues to refuse to talk to him. Um, as soon as she could after the election, she issued a notice that um, we would be receiving an 8% rent increase, 
and um, we had a Measure M sign in our apartment. Um, I was involved in the Measure M campaign, and I live in constant fear of an eviction. So please pass this. Thanks. And before, Bonnie, before we get started, if those of you who haven't spoken yet are interested in speaking, please do um, feel free to line up to my left, um, and we will continue. Okay. They're all here. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Uh, my name is Marta Aguilar. I'm a resident here of Santa Cruz, and the temporary renter protection expired on December 12th, and I received an eviction notice dated December 12th, just like I said I would when I was here last time. Housing is a basic right, and the just cause eviction not being considered an emergency action is appalling. If renter protection is put into place according to the process you outlined tonight, those of us given eviction notices in December fall through the cracks. We get left out of anything you put into place that actually protects renters. So please keep that in mind. And I would love for you to reconsider making this an emergency action or moving on it quicker than you proposed tonight. I think there can be a win-win. I think leases can be honored, and I think renters can be protected. Leases are legal documents, and I can't understand why it's so difficult to have them uh, enforced and honored. You've asked us to play nice tonight, and you're asking us to play nice on a basic need. I'm asking you to stop playing nice and to be bold in the actions of protecting renters, your most valuable and vulnerable members of this community. Thank you. I want to speak about this in a way that's slightly different. Um, as a salesperson who had been forced into a sales career because the mental health field was ab absolutely privatized and more or less demolished by Ronald Reagan in the mid 80s, and we have never recovered, I was about to embark on a real estate career and took the requisite courses after selling art in La Jolla. But I realized that I could not quite fully get behind the idea of property ownership. And it's not that I'm completely opposed to it, but here's why I'm talking about that tonight. We have just seen one of the most unfair, unjust, imbalanced, absolutely not a democratic campaign. That was won by money. We have no, absolutely no idea what the community would have what would have come out of a process that wasn't so completely polluted, adulterated, and become, become something that was so oppressive? I just want to end that I resist the current state of violence and oppression. And this battle is, one, is about the third massive battle in my life where I just want to say I want human beings to evolve to a place that's remotely like where we can come to. Thank you. Thank you. Pardon me, I have to <clears throat> read off my phone. Um, at the risk of a little over bravado here, I, I'm the most qualified person in this room to talk about evictions. <clears throat> and I'm going to focus on the word emer emergency. Why? I'm a registered process server here in town, and I work for a company that serves 70% <clears throat> of the active attorneys. So <clears throat> being active in this housing debate and rental debate, a year ago when the rental freeze, rent control is uh, becoming very um, uh, prevalent, I started keeping my own metrics. Let me read to you some. <clears throat> so. I started, I started keeping metrics on my landlord tenant serves when the rent control, like, sorry, I'm, re, I'm repeating myself. Okay, so given the histrionics of the pro G, uh, just cause for eviction camp, I expected a spike in notices and UDs before the rent freeze and certainly after December 6th when the um, county confirmed the defeat of Measure M. <clears throat> Nothing of that sort happened. 
There is no change in the tempo of my three-day notices, 30, 60, or UDs. Let me give you some real statistics here. Now, I don't claim to serve, of course, all the notices and all the UDs, of course, but it is a representative sample. Um, I served 38 three-day notices, 32 for non-payment of rent, and six for lease breaches. I served 15 30 or 90, 30, 60 or 90 day notices, mostly for landlords who passed away and, and the heirs who wish to simply sell the property or owner simply wishes to sell or Thank move you. back in. Yeah. Okay, that's Thank your time. You. Thank you. Next week. Okay, okay. I'm going to read my. Thank you. You'll have your time. Hi, uh, my name is Stefan Bianchi, and I, uh, just listening to this, I, I don't know if this would be. Okay. I don't know Go if ahead this would be. Go ahead. Time. Go ahead. What? Okay, it's now your time to speak. So I'll ask that we please let you okay. have your time. Yeah. So um, I don't know if this is legal or practical, but it seems to me that we have specific people that have been, um, uh, you know, have lost their 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 rents and have been put out on the street, so to speak. And it would be very interesting if you could find out, you know, if you could like call for these people to, to, you know, tell you their stories and then find out what the landlord's story is on it. So that then you know specifically why these people are, are, uh, are, are getting kicked out and, and uh, you know, what, what the reasons are so that then you can solve those problems. You can either work with the landlords or just find out sort of what's going on. Cause otherwise it seems to me like you're, you're trying to solve a problem, but you're not quite sure what is causing or what it is. Thanks. Good evening, Council, and welcome to our, our newest three members. Um, I also undertook the Citizens Initiative to review all 576 pages of public correspondence as of 4.45 p.m. today. And I think this data bears repeating. Uh, after subtracting out for 17 duplicate letters and accounting for 16 letters with multiple signatories, I counted two neutral positions, 19 pro JCE positions, and 534, five signatories that expressed concerns ranging from mild disagreement with, to horror with a proposed ordinance modification. Whether a policy is temporary or permanent, the objective should always be to produce policy directives that are thoughtfully designed and well positioned to succeed. As a community, we have not yet undertaken the due diligence effort commensurate with the issue at hand. We lack the hard data we need to understand the scope and extent of the problem and have not yet researched or reviewed best practices designed to tackle the issue we face. In the absence of unbiased data, I fear that it would be virtually impossible to measure the effectiveness of any policy modification. Anecdotal information, no matter what the source, should never take the place of empirical data. We need robust objective data that would get to the heart of such questions as exactly how many rental units would be subject to the ordinance modification, how many renters have been have received eviction notices since December 11th that would have been spared by adoption of the ordinance, how many residents support rent caps but are opposed to JCE Thank or the Thank establishment you. of a rent board. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Go ahead. Good evening. Uh, my name is Mike Polhamis. I'm a teacher at Santa Cruz High School, and it's, I just want to say, first off, it's really cool that two of the city council members know me. I'm, I'm really glad about that. I'm really glad to see you guys up there, and congratulations to the uh, people who were most recently elected. Um, I would just like to address the issue that rents are high in this city because landlords are concerned about their profits. What I would like to bring up is the fact that the most, probably the thing that owns the most property in Santa Cruz is the banks. Okay, so let's start there. Mortgages are what mortgages are, and if you're lucky enough to have a home, right, you pay it. Otherwise, you lose that property to the banks. Okay, and so for me, myself, I got really lucky. Uh, my grandmother died and she left me a life insurance policy and I had a down payment for a house. And I threw myself on the mercy after being bought out uh, with cash with other homes, I threw myself on the mercy of this one seller and he took my offer and I got really, really lucky. And I used to rent my house out for $1,000 a month. It's on the west side, which I think is a pretty good price. And I didn't raise it for three years. And then once Measure M came about, I let the lease expire and the tenant moved on and I haven't rented my house since. And the reason for that was a just cause eviction, you know, protections. Um, I just, I just want to bring that to your attention. Thanks. I'm 
hello, council members. My name is Rosanna Bruni, and I own a number of rentals here in Santa Cruz. While my preference would be that you do not pass this measure this evening, if you're going to consider it, there are three modifications I would like you to take into account. One is I strongly um, support Sandy Brown's amendment. I think it's reasonable and fair. Um, the second issue is has to do with the number of tenants in a unit. I cannot tolerate as a landlord the prospect that my 1600 square foot house could have up to 20 or more people living in it. Um, it so I would like to suggest a, a, a reasonable standard that's used in the property management field, which I was a part of for 10 years here in this town, um, which is two people per bedroom plus one. That is a reasonable standard to be held to as a <coughs> landlord. And the other item I'd like you to consider doing differently is having to do with subtenants. Um, I just I agreed to a subtenant situation with one of my rentals where one student was leaving and another student came on board. I'd like for it to be to stated that it not be unreasonably withheld, that a landlord provide his permission that it not be unreasonably withheld instead of just giving it carte blanche. Okay. Thank you. Evening, uh, congratulations new council members. Um, I, I just want to be clear that uh, I think that most people, I've said this before, uh, have not enthusiasm, but they have a, an understanding that this is a difficult situation for everyone, and most people that I know are not against rent stabilization of some reasonable form. However, just cause eviction regulations are one of the main and very specific reasons voters rejected Measure M. I was going to restate the letter I sent, but I hope you'll read it on your own and offer some statistics to dispel the myths being peddled about rent control ideas being proposed by M supporters and how they compare to other cities. Richmond City Ordinance, ADUs and any homes exempted under Costa Hawkins are exempt from being controlled units. Santa Monica City Ordinance exempts most units for which construction occurred, uh, was completed after April 10th, 1979, as well as for most single family homes, condominiums, and owner occupied properties that have three or few, fewer units. Mountain View exempts all homes built after 2016, all properties of two units or less, all single family dwellings, ADUs, condominiums, and duplexes. Oakland City Ordinance, exempts all units first occupied after 1983. Berkeley, city ordinance exempts most owner occupied duplexes. Alameda allows no fault eviction if subsequent tenants rent is no more than 5% more than previous tenants agreement. Uh, East Palo Alto exempts single family dwellings, homes occupied after 88. Anyway, there are oh, thank you. Thank many, you. many different thank approaches. You. Honey, let's go ahead and pause it. I want to see who in, uh, is still currently sitting that is interested in speaking. If you wouldn't mind raising your hand. Okay. So as far as I can tell, then that would make um, you with the blue shirt our last speaker or is, are you speaking, standing up to speak? Oh, you are. Okay. And a few more. And then a few on. more coming up. Okay. 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 So you'll be our last. Are you going to plan to, are you planning to stay seated at this time? Okay. So we'll have you as our last speaker, and I believe that covers everybody, okay? Please go ahead. Okay, thank you. My name is Paul Hodge, and I wanna ask each and every one of you a question, and congratulations on your election. But I wanna ask you a question. Do you know what no means? Do you know what no means? Do you know what no means? Justin, do you know what no means? Cynthia? Sandy, do you know what no means? If someone says no to you, do you respect no? Do you go further? Do you stop when someone says no? This is a problem. Do you think the, the voters are stupid? Do you believe the arguments that they were bamboozled by thousands of dollars? And it's the same voters! Okay. It's the same voters! Pause this time, please. We have a right to hear everybody speak, whether we agree with them or not. Thank you. And everybody will get their time, and please proceed. It's the same voters that voted for you. Maybe not the same numbers that voted no, 
on Measure M, but they voted you over your opponents. So please respect democracy. Please stick to what the people asked for. Let's not do what Donald Trump in this great city of Santa Cruz and declare it a national emergency that we're gonna just have Measure M again. Thank you, I do respect you and thank you for listening to me. No, 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 no. make a comment. We'll go ahead and why don't we go ahead and pause at this point. Um, I want to remind you to that everybody has a right to speak without feeling um, harassed or um, threatened by coming and speaking before us and we will all take your time to speak. Um, it is now nearly 10 o'clock so I will ask that we have uh, after you, Cynthia, uh, you, sir, sitting down, you'll be our last speaker. Then we will take a short break and we will come back for action and deliberation. Okay? Go ahead. Thank you. My name is Andy. I am a renter and um, I came here and I really wanted to listen to the landlords and I did. And I um, listened to their fears and their concerns. And I also listened to the other people who, like myself, are afraid of not being able to live here anymore. And um, I wasn't going to speak, but I came in from outside and I sat down next to the person who had four minutes to speak on behalf of, um, you know, not passing this. And while the people who were um, on the verge of tears speaking about their fears, this person spent their entire time uh, looking at Facebook on their cell phone. And I wanna encourage the landlords to think and feel and hear the voices just like I've tried to feel the concern and pain of the people who are uh, landlords. Uh, the, I want them to, I don't know if I misspoke myself, um, to hear the pain of the renters um, and to try to feel that and uh, not ignore it as I have tried to hear their point of view. Thank you. Uh, good evening, all of you, and I've got to hand it to you all. I wouldn't want your jobs for anything. And I've been a business owner here for 40 years. I came here when I was 19 with my wife. I've spoken to you before. Uh, I graduated UCSC when I was in 75, and I've been working ever since. I'm 65 now, and I'm still working. Uh, we managed to get a place that we have, but I want you to take one of the issues that, w that everybody had with M, and it wasn't being bamboozled by big money. The issue about being able to sublet and or bring multiple family members in is a huge freaking issue. Think about if that gives every potential tenant the, uh, um, the, the, the incentive to lie and say they're single, and as soon as they're in, bring in you know, a whole family, you know, a whole group of family members. And, and in my case, I own an old Victorian that's divided up and it was never intended originally to be a whole home or a multiple houses, and it is now. So imagine having a, a whole family up above when you were only expecting two people, suddenly you have six, and then the, the other tenants down below having the, coming to me and saying, hey, I can't live with this. So there's issues, the ramifications to this, letting people move in without, um, without any uh, ramifications. Thank you. Thank you, council members, for the opportunity to speak tonight. My name is Linda Chatton, and I'm a property manager. I represent landlords in the city of Santa Cruz, and I also own my own rental properties. I oppose the just cause eviction ordinance, like the majority of individuals that have spoken tonight. I support the elephant in the room, which is increasing the city's housing stock <clears throat> I ask each of you city council members um, if you could tell me the number of increased rental housing that's planned in the city of Santa Cruz. I would ask you if you could tell me how many housing development projects are in the planning stage in 2019. I would ask that you tell me how many projects 
are in the implementation stage for 2019. I would like to know how many rental units will be built in 2019, 2020, and 2021. And I would like to say that this is the real issue on the table that we need to address. And I haven't heard an answer regarding this issue. Thank you. Good evening, council members. My name is Rosemarie McNair. And it is always in my heart that people get along and, and understand things. And one of the things that's very, very important to me and to everyone is understanding clarity and making sure that the law is being followed. It occurred to me that real estate deals with a lot of contracts and a lease is a contract just as the sale of property is a contract. When I first took the test some 40, 42 years ago, we had to learn about the statute of frauds, which said that all of those things have to be in writing because that way everybody understands what's going on and what is correct. If there is a law for a lease, you simply can't have a third party come in and usurp that. The, the agreement is between two parties, generally speaking. It has a beginning and an end. With, with this just cause particular thing, I think that it brings up a problem. Whenever a problem arises, it becomes a legality that could, you know, cause problems all along the way for both the landlord, the tenant, and the city. So I think we need to review all of those things and make sure that things are in order and clear and that we're not usurping some law. Okay. Thank you very much. Okay. Okay. Hello and good evening. Um, yeah. Um, First of all, for all of you needing data, there are many professional studies at your disposal. No place like home, for example, so check that out. Secondly, I believe it is imperative to pass this just cause eviction. There are no protections for tenants, and this is by far one of the most reasonable ones proposed. All we want is to not live in fear of unjust, unjust eviction and unjust rent increases. And if you want to talk about the word no, well, I want no more exorbitant rent increases. Yeah. I want no more unjust evictions. Renters are tired of saying no. Yeah. I want those most disenfranchised in our community to be protected, and I believe and hope that all of you want that as well. Thank you for your time. Next speaker. And I'm just gonna go ahead and pause. I believe that you two have joined. Are you planning to speak? Okay. Okay, so we'll have you four, including uh, you who are who's sitting there, um, as our last speakers, it, it's okay. So go ahead. I don't really have anything to add that hasn't been said already. But I've sat here and voted with my seat and my presence for countless hours now. I guess I feel like you could cut to the chase sometimes by taking a poll so that you knew who was here in support of what. But to me, this these are so tedious. I really respect for you all for your patience. Um, I guess I'd urge you to consider that housing providers may not be the problem. The problem is there aren't enough of us providing housing. And in our city, ADUs aren't being built. Large single family homes are slightly lived in all over the city. Builders are being thwarted and hundreds of second homes sit empty. We should be making it easier for people to provide housing and not harder. So let's stop the assault on the residents of our community that have been providing safe and regulated, and in many cases, below market rate housing to their fellow community members for years. I hear a lot about tenants uh, suffering sudden increases in rent, and I guess I always wonder how long, like the woman in Capitola earlier, who after five years had to move and realized that market rents were really much higher than what she'd been paying. Most mom and pop, most normal landlords were people we don't want to raise rents on fellow people. If things are working, we're gonna be happy to have good tenants. So I would just like to keep that, for everybody to keep that in mind. Thanks.
Hi, I'm Cynthia Berger. Um, our rental units which constitutes the landlord's sole rental property. How do you know they can own property in Hawaii, Connecticut, anywhere? So I don't understand that part of this exemption here. Is the tenant responsible for uh, combing all the records in the United States? Uh, that's a really, you know, that's a glaring error in that, and it should be fixed, I think. I think you can get data from all the cities that have rent, uh, that have just cause protection laws, and you can find out the average length of tenancy after a just cause eviction law passed. Is their tenancy longer? In the city of Santa Monica, which has been completely degraded by the Costa-Hawkins uh, law since they passed their uh, rent control a very long time ago, and that affects how their law works, uh, people don't live anywhere five years, and that happens in Santa Cruz. Long-term tenants are just a dinosaur. So, um, you know, if you wanna have long-term tenants, you have to have lower rents. Your average rent means X percent, you know, is below that and X percent is above that. So you know just how high they are. So those folks, maybe everybody who's providing lower rents is in the room, but the most, the most units in this town are owned by landlords that own a lot of units, not these folks here. Those folks don't show up. They're guaranteed, okay? They own uh, Hilltop or uh, they own Cypress Point and they do as they wish. Um, they may have some kind of uh, law, but they do as they wish. Good evening. Thank you, Santa Cruz. Coral Brune, tenant. Um, th there's been a lot of emotions in the room tonight, and time seems to be of the essence. I feel justified for the interim ordinance to protect renters that it be that it is necessary, but also feel that some of its wording can be approached um, using certain changes by the advice of community efforts. One of these best ways would be with facilitation, experienced community tenants, landlords, nonviolent communicators who have studied the intricate features of tenancy law contracts, other successful cities efforts with rent control, and, and to somehow not simplify, but rewrite the necessary words that would apply here, and to make Santa Cruz a truly beautiful place to live. It would retroactively help those who may fit in uh, who may have been erroneously evicted for no reason other than the desire to be re to have them removed from the tenant tenancy or the property a task force for landlord tenant relations is the best thing and this needs to be done within the next 2 weeks next speaker hello council members i'm nancy Crusoe, and um I'm here as speaking, uh, yes, I am here speaking as a renter tonight. And my first observation is that this has not felt to me like it should be a battle between tenants and landlords. Just cause eviction is absolutely necessary for the renters to exist in this town with any peace of mind at all. And we need a strong one and it needs not to be have added on exemptions. We have to have that to have any stability. So I retired after teaching for, at UCSC for 15 years and I do not wanna spend my 70s looking for a new city to live in. That seems grotesque to me to force that on your retired uh, um, employees uh, because I do plan to spend the rest of my years here if I can possibly afford to live here. Uh, I don't see it as a battle primarily because the eviction clauses cover everything necessary for a reasonable landlord to want to have in order to evict. I, don't, I have not heard of anything left out that is a reasonable cause for eviction. They're there, they're covered. So I don't understand the battle tone that we're having. I think we could easily see this as the same side most of us are on. Maybe there are a few opponents. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. So you're second to last speaker in our last. Oh, I thought I was last. Not quite. We uh, got one more. Okay, go right ahead. You'll get 90 right. seconds. Hi, uh, my name's Ken Rilling. 
I own uh, some properties here in the city. Uh, I developed them as a PUD, so I was able to build the houses that I wanted about 30 years ago. So I rent to college students, and most of the time there's five people in the house, and they're all, they'll always come up that somebody's going to leave for a while, maybe come back. So they use the term sublease, and I think sublease is a problem for them because my tenants become the landlord in fact. So if they got a problem with their new tenant, they're going to have to go to a board or see a judge. They don't generally have the money that I do. So I recommend that you change the sublease agreement to roommate addendum so they can sign the same contract that they had when they moved in. Uh, so knock, knock, who's there? Knock, oh, knock, who's there? It's your landlord. I brought in the plumbers. We're ready to fix the toilet. <laughs> All right, go ahead, next speaker. Good evening, I'm Scott Graham, and I think that you should have a uh, citizens task force look into this item, and I support this temporary measure because there's a lot of people out there that are in fear of being evicted. And the, the cost of renting right now is astronomical. I mean, if you look on Craigslist or realtor.com, I don't know where these landlords are renting their cheap places, but they're not on there, that's for sure. Um, and then, you know, we've got this thing called just evictions so what do these landlords want? Do they want unjust evictions? They wanna be able to just willy-nilly evict people for no apparent reason? Um, we don't like the curtains you put up in the living room, so we're gonna evict you. Uh, it's just, it's, it's absurd on the, on the face of it. Um, the other thing is that we have a, a housing crisis right now. So I think it's, absolutely justified to de declare a housing emergency so that you can take the actions you need to take to bring things under control. Because right now, everything, the housing market, the rental market is out of control. Okay, thank you. All right. Okay, so I want to say first that that concludes the public comment portion of this agenda item. I want to thank those who came to speak today for exercising restraint, and I recognize that this is a very um, <coughs> emotional topic, and I appreciate you allowing individuals to address the council and giving them their time. Um, at this point, I will ask that we take a short recess, and we will turn in about five minutes or so at 1010, and we'll return to the council for action and deliberation. So at this point, we're gonna be in recess. A lot of questions to answer.
All right. Who's the teacher in the house? Yeah. <laughs> All right. Sonny, are we back? Oh, we're missing Tandy and Chris. Attention, please. I will now re reconvene the meeting. Okay. Yeah, Melissa. Enough that you have a gavel. Okay. Let's do it. There we go. All right. Thank you. Okay. We're back on. Okay, thank you, I appreciate it. So at this point, we have heard from the community, so we have closed public comment on this item. We appreciate your input. I'd like to now return it to the council for action and deliberation. Are there any council members who would like to speak to this item? Councilmember just, Matthews. Just a question, and I spoke to you in advance. Um, when we get to the actual discussion and <coughs> deliberation and action, I'd like to request that we separate these two items because they seem to me quite different, so. That was my comment as well. Okay. Great. So is that the um, is that the action you're wishing to ask that we take at this time to address them separately and start with the first? Yeah. Okay. 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 Seems to make sense to me. Okay, great. So then now we will direct our conversation to the items separately and we'll begin with um, the first uh, element of the recommendation, which is to introduce for publication an interim ordinance requiring just cause, and that conversation can now ensue. I have a couple of things I wanna say, and then I'd like to make that motion. Um, <clears throat> so, I'm not going to say much because uh, a lot of it has already been said. I, you know, I, I've said here, and I, I, I'll say it again. I do not. I'm not interested in a postmortem on Measure M. Um, what I am interested in is moving forward um, with some modicum of uh, tenant protections while uh, the community does meaningfully engage in uh, um, a range of, of options for uh, rent stabilization and tenant protections for the longer term. So I'm just gonna start there. Um, so, I'll be brief. Words of one uh, illustrious council member who came before me. Um, so we heard uh, Measure M was too extreme. We saw, we've seen the outcome of that um, vote. Um, we, um, we also heard from a lot of people who said that they did support some form of rent control um, or rent stabilization, um, but not that me that particular measure. And you know, and I those voices don't seem to be heard as some of you are in this room tonight. Um, those voices don't seem to be heard quite as loudly. I'd like to take people up on that. Um, uh, their interest in community engagement. I am dismayed by um, what I have heard in terms uh, of, you know, uh, some people suggesting that this is an end run around Measure M because we're actually proposing something that's more extreme than Measure M. That's just simply not the case. Um, it, it just isn't the case for uh, in, in so many ways. and. I don't want to belabor it, but it, it's just, it's not. So um, that's not what we're doing here tonight. Um, you know, I've, and I could quote from them, but I won't. Um, you know, lots of people have communicated with this body about um, be, the fact that they are landlords and they do support some kind of, of rent stabilization. They do support um, uh, some protections for tenants. That means some kind of just cause eviction. I don't think that, um, 17,000 people voted no on Measure M because just cause was the poison pill. I, I mean, it's an empirical question that can't be answered, but I just disagree uh, with that analysis. Um, uh, you know, I wanna say that I am dismayed that there are people who have called for uh, an opportunity for engagement who have now um, sent out messages including the following. Don't be fooled. This task force is a sham and no landlord or homeowner should participate. 
that doesn't sound like wanting to engage in a community conversation. I'm just dismayed that that happened. Um, I, I hope that uh, the, the folks who have said they wanted to be involved in a meaningful conversation will step up and do that. And I hope that we can come to some agreement tonight on a structure for that task force. In the meantime, I would like to make a motion that we adopt, uh, or that we, um, we introduce for um, uh, the, um, we, we, we introduce this interim ordinance this is, whoops, oh, I just want to add one more thing for clarification. We are talking about um, uh, an ordinance that was has been on the books. I did not hear from one landlord um, during uh, the period from February 13th to December 11th that um, there was any hardship. We never received any requests, as far as I know. I could correct me if I'm wrong, staff, if we had any uh, requests for hardship exemption from that, um, that ordinance. I believe there was one. One, okay, so one. Uh, I never... two, two, but one was ultimately withdrawn, so. Okay. Um, the sky didn't fall while we had that interim ordinance on the books. While I believe we are in a, a, an, a housing emergency, an affordable housing emergency in this community, um, we're not asking that it be passed as an emergency measure. There are political considerations there and legal ones. So that's not the request on the table. I'd like to move that we um, vote, that we, um, adopt, we introduce this interim ordinance with the language change that the uh, city attorney included. So if you, um, for those of you who don't have it because it was public on the city council in the agenda packet, um, section 3.72, was that right? Three point seven, no, 3.7F, sorry. Exemptions, pardon, I'd like to- Pardon me, um, council member Brown. It's just <laughs> section 3F. 3F, yeah. okay. Well, it's not seven. I'm sorry, I'm confused. No. Why do I have seven and here? Three. Owner move in seven. Uh, three. That's uh, three A seven. Oh, okay. So three F. Sorry. Um, be um, um, introduced for publication. With with that, the with the language change that uh, that's right here before you. Thought you got that, Bonnie. In addition, um, I want to I want to add a couple of other um, uh, changes or additions, I would say. Uh, I'm, you know, I'm sympathetic to landlords who suggest that um, tenants becoming sub um, leasers, um, sub landlords, it can be problematic. And so I would um, add language that um, requires subleases to be approved by the landlord. I just want, sorry, I'm gonna pause for a second. Uh -huh. I just really wanna remind that um, the community that is here tonight, that we've had an opportunity to hear from you. And at this point, it is your opportunity to listen to us take action and deliberation after hearing that input. So if, p please keep your voices down while we have our opportunity for deliberation and action. Go ahead. Okay, and uh, finally, last but not least, in section seven, the effective date and expiration date. Uh, yes, we did uh, suggest the three months, and so 90 days is listed here. Um, I, um, I agree with uh, staff's analysis. Um, Ms. Scholl suggested that three months is, is an awfully short turnaround time to get this done, um, assuming that we, we have support for a task force to, to bring us some kind of proposal for the longer term. Um, so I'd like to say that the ordinance shall automatically terminate upon uh, the, um, uh, an, uh, upon uh, an alternative, a recommendation being made by uh, uh, the task force. Unfortunately, we don't ha we haven't voted on the task force yet, but I'm gonna just put it in there in the hopes that we get somewhere. So that's my motion. Okay, so there's a motion by Council Member Brown. Is there a second for the purposes of discussion? I will second it, but not even for the purpose of discussion, for the purpose of passing it. Okay, for the purpose of discussion and for passage for your perspective. And then Council Member Matthews. Just a couple questions. On the effective date, um, to say that it's effective until a recommendation from the committee, that recommendation will not be acted upon by the Council. It seems to me to be better to establish 
a further off date that's more specific. I put it to you guys over there. So it's. Uh... Uh, so they're talking about another part of it. So what I'm hearing though is, is Council Member Brown talking about a presentation of the work product yeah. to the council. Okay, so, um, and then um, Council Member Matthews, I thought I heard you say, well, but we would need time for the council to deliberate and act upon that. So that might be <laughs> earlier. So there might be need to have some language. Um, maybe, and we can ask the city attorney when he finishes the discussion, maybe, um, this shall be effective upon the effective date of an alternate policy direction or, or something to that effect. So um, Tony, what's being discussed right now is the effective date. So maybe something to that effect, would that cover that? Because I, I think you don't want to create yet another gap where this expires prematurely. There's still needed time for a process if, if more time is needed to, to happen, which is actually very common in these sorts of processes is that they get going and say, I need another month. I need a few more weeks at working on something. Um, um, okay, so that, that's what I would recommend. So Tony, could, could we fashion something to that effect where this would remain in effect until um, whatever alternate policy uh, direction taken by the council becomes effective and that is really open to whatever policy direction that looks like yes and i and i'm happy to formulate help formulate that language um in the meantime however i would like to also discuss the first not the first but the second modification that you suggested with regard to sub leases um that was going to be my other question. Where does it go? And I'm not the quite sure here? what you have in mind with respect to that, but I have a suggestion that's not exactly that same thing, but that um, addresses some of the concerns that were raised about um, multiple subtenants moving in to replace, uh, like if, if the rental agreement is for two people, then eight people moving in and sharing to a bedroom. And so I have some recommended language that's not requiring um, landlord approval of the sublease, but does address that issue. So, I, so could we touch that one first? Sure. Because I don't have an answer for you on the second one yet. Um, uh, if you look at subsec subsection 3A, 2, lowercase a, Roman numeral 3, um, or let me just back up and say <coughs> section, section three, uppercase A, two, lowercase A. The landlord shall not take any action to terminate a lease based on a tenant's sublease of the rental unit if the following requirements are met. One, the rental unit continues to constitute the tenant's primary residence. Two, the sub lessee replaces one or more departed tenants under the rental housing agreement on a one for one basis. The problem with the language as I see it is that there's an inconsistency between that language on a one-for-one -one basis and the next section which says the landlord has unreasonably withheld the right to sublease following a request by the tenant. And it says a landlord's reasonable refusal of the tenant's written request may be based on, but is not limited to the grounds that the tenant has replaced one or more departed tenants with short-term sub lessors or the grounds that the total number of occupancy in a rental unit exceeds the maximum number of occupants permissible under section 503B of the Uniform Housing Code. Question is, if a tenant replaces another tenant or subtenant with a number of subtenants that don't exceed the maximum number under that section of the Uniform Housing Code, that be a reasonable basis to terminate. And I see those as inconsistent um, provisions. So here's would be my suggestion. Leave Roman numeral two the same, the sub, the sub lessee replaces one or more departed tenants under the rental housing agreement on a one for one basis and and then continue with the language of Roman numeral three, but delete the last sentence of it. So it would read, the landlord has unreasonably withheld the right to sublease following a written request by the tenant. If the landlord fails to respond to the tenant in writing within 14 days of receipt of the tenant's written request, 
The tenant's request shall be deemed approved by the landlord. A landlord's reasonable refusal of the tenant's written request may not be based on the proposed additional person's lack of credit worthiness if the proposed occupant is not, a legally obliga is not legally obligated to pay some or all of the rent to the landlord. The landlord's reasonable refusal of the tenant's written request may be based on, but is not limited to the grounds that the tenant has replaced one or more departed tenants with short-term sub lessors, period. That works for me. <coughs> On the second, I'm wondering just um, for the sake of ensuring that the, because I think we, we can all agree that the, that the task force process is going to be difficult and particularly the part about reaching a consensus. And what I suspect might happen is that the task force might come back with a bunch of comments or a report and then the council will be faced with the dilemma of not just endorsing a consensus, but in considering the information and coming up with a compromise, which is another possible outcome of the task force. And, and there's also the possibility that the task force once constituted won't be able to come to any conclusions and the provision that makes it ambiguous as to when it would conclude would be in effect a permanent ordinance. So I might suggest a one year or 120 days or 180 day uh, expiration date and make the ordinance automatically uh, terminated upon the council's receipt of a report from the task force or however number of many days the council decides whichever is later, or whichever is sooner. Okay. That makes sense to me. Um, I'm gonna just go out on a limb here and suggest that we replace 90 days with one year for the uh, conclusion, uh, or uh, an alternate um, proposal being adopted by the council. I think Going that's out right. on a limb, just, try, just seeing where my colleagues are. I think that makes sense, and w with the understanding that well in advance of the one year expiration date, you should have a pretty good sense of how the task force is moving along, and if necessary, you could come back and extend the ordinance further if it looks like progress is being made and there's a reasonable likelihood of a, of a positive outcome from the task force. Is that then accepted by the seconder of the motion? Yeah, I mean, I'm contemplating that it's gonna take longer than, I mean, we had thrown around like ideas like 90 days, 120 days, but I think it's gonna be longer. So yeah, I accept that. Okay, so, so could you just restate the language? This ordinance shall automatically terminate after one year from final adoption or? Uh, upon the sooner to occur, of one year from the effective date. One year from the effective date or, or the <coughs> council's adoption of. Or council's action. The council's action on uh, a, an ordinance addressing tenant, additional tenant protections. This is very inartfully worded. Um, following the uh, conclusion of the, the work of the task force. Okay. Would you say uh, uh, the ordinance shall automatically terminate one year from the, its effective date or upon council's action on the task force recommendations? Is that? That sounds perfect to me. That's a pleasure of the council. Okay. <laughs> Does that work for you? Sure. I'm just trying to make it. Yeah, please. You're, you're. I'm going to look to see who's experienced in motion making. The language. I want to ask the city clerk if she's. Okay. Actually. Okay. Any other comments at this time? I have a question. Oh, well, go ahead. I had comments about language that I was um, wanting to consider to be um, added and removed from 
the ordinance. Okay. Um, one piece was, and just to um, provide some background, I have heard from lots of people having knocked on many doors and had conversations around rent control with both tenants and landlords and understand that this is an issue and having heard from everyone tonight that this is an issue that people want to work on within the community. Um, when I was on the campaign trail, one of the things that I said was that I was gonna support a community process and I'm hoping that we can get an effective community process to address the concerns of both landlords and tenants. Um, with that being said, um, some of the language that I was interested in changing within the ordinance is um, with the, um, let's see, with section three F, um, making the exemptions only for landlords who live on site um, and removing the rental units if, if it's a sole rental property of a landlord. So therefore, um, if the landlord lives on site, they would be completely exempt from just cause for evictions. But if the landlord were to have um, their own residence and then be renting out another house and that house was their sole rental unit, that that rental unit would not be exempt from uh, the just cause for eviction. Is that gonna be a friendly amendment to the motion? The make, the make yes, it is, because I accept it. Okay, so do we need clarification on that language then? Yes. The recommendation would be just <laughs> deletion of the first clause of that sentence, which reads, a rental unit which constitutes the landlord's sole rental property and, and begin uh, with the capital, the following categories of rental units thereafter. Okay. So it would, it would it'd be worded exemptions if the landlord lives on site in the same residence, a duplex or a single family residence with an accel accessory dwelling unit. Okay, go ahead. That's right. Um, other. Could, could you just type that out so we can look at it? Yeah, he's doing it right now. Yeah. Okay, great. Lee, just uh, thank you. Yeah, just delete. The highlighted language is proposed to be removed by Vice Mayor Cummings, and the remainder of it would uh, remain. And that was a, I'm hearing a friendly amendment. Okay. Assuming the second. Right. Thank you. And, and so if I could just ask your intention here. So that means if the rental unit is landlord's sole rental property, property, but it's somewhere else from. From where they reside, yes, yes. So the idea being that if landlords live on site, then they would be exempt. And I have a number of other. Sure, okay. Um, in addition to this exemption. Before you do a pause, sure. I, I just wanna make sure that was accepted by the maker of the motion. Is that accepted by the seconder of the motion? Okay. Um, in addition to that, if a landlord um, intends to reoccupy the site within one year or less, they would also be exempt from just cause for eviction. You want to add that? Yes. Where would that Where would that go? Um, so owner owner move in. You understand? So we're back to I believe you're looking at. I see. Oh. Um, section yeah. three seven. Yes. Seven owner move in. 3A7. 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 Thank you. 3A7. Okay. We, do you mind restating your? Uh, yes. That l landlords who intend to reoccupy a unit within one year or less will not be, um, would not fall under just cause for eviction. So if a landlord um, decides to go on vacation and wants to rent their house out or are away for a year for sabbatical or leave and they, they want to rent their ho their property out, that they're able to come back to that property within one year period. I appreciate the intent and I'm just trying to figure out how we can prove it. So we, if we can find a way in the language to, um, <coughs> and Tony, maybe you can help us out here, to, to word it so that the, so that there, I mean, because we can't really prove an in, a future intent, right? Um, so I'm just trying to think, on, and I'm not very good at thinking through these matters on my feet here. Um, how do we, how do we, how do we get out that without just saying? I mean, because anybody could say I intend to reoccupy. It's okay. It's we. This is the time for the council. Please, this is the time for the council to we, now. Uh, yeah, yeah. Take I'm, that's please. what I'm trying to get at here. It's not about you know. So how do we get at demonstrating that? So like if, if somebody did want to sub, you know, if they wanted to rent their home for a year because they're going away, um, 
just f trying to find language that would get us to that. I'm looking, um, Tony, potentially please. adding a second, uh, a number nine after the language withdrawing of the rental unit permanently from the rental market and perhaps wording along the lines of landlord seeks to reoccupy a rental unit after having vacated the unit within um, past year. the past year. And maybe there should be addition of language that they, that that unit can't go back on the rental market within 48 months or sorry, 24 months. Years. Years. Right, because now you're tra talking about trying to avoid uh, abuse of that for pe somebody who moves in for a month and then goes back and rents it out. Yeah. I would think there would be some measure of protection against that by the fact that this would only apply to a landlord who has occupied the unit within the past year. Landlord has occupied Provided that the landlord has occupied the unit for at least the prior year, the landlord seeks to reoccupy the unit within one year of, of having vacated. So the landlord would have to live there for a year in order to invoke um, the right to return within one year. So. always going to have concerns and you know uh, there's always possibilities that we're not um, envisioning right in the moment but i think that 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 does get at the your intention here for people who are wanting to rent for short term and move back in their primary residence so it doesn't require the landlord to live in it for an additional year but in order to invoke it they would have to they would have to stay there for a year anyway I'm not quite sure what the concern is because I don't think a landlord that owns a single family residence or a condominium unit that, that intends to use it as income producing property, that would, that would be a very odd business plan mm. to <laughs> annually. The you're trying to solve. Yeah. yeah. I think that the, the issue is that there are people within the community who, um, have expressed that there are times when they may have to, for work purposes or otherwise, leave their homes for a year and rent them out. And in those situations, um, if there are no protections um, for them under the just cause provision, then they would, it would seem that based on the language in this ordinance that they would have to provide, they would have to pay relocation assistance to those tenants who occupy that space. We don't have relocation in oh, this. This is, sorry. Just this is just cause. Th that they would not they would not be able to reoccupy the residence right. that they had just vacated and, and that would be particularly um, useful in a community like Santa Cruz that has a lot of faculty that go on sabbatical and and that sort of thing so I think the language that I suggested um, covers that but I'm hoping Bonnie was able to catch it about the reoccupying the unit after yeah. having Comes condition number nine. Yes. Okay. Is that an amendment? Then accepted. We're, we're basically talking about somebody needs to, they're, they're going away to work and they need to get their mortgage paid while they're gone and it would preclude them from actually being able to take that, that posi you know, short term position. What, that's what we're getting at. Or go on vacation. You're traveling grandchild. Yep. I was also going to suggest that we eliminate um, section three, 
number seven F um, uh, Roman numeral one that um, a landlord can reoccupy the unit even if the person has lived there for, for uh, more than five for five years or more. Friendly amendment to request. Uh, I just have a quick question. Um, so, uh, you know, I, I am also uh, sympathetic to the need for owner move in, um, even in the case that there are longer term tenants. But I, I'm, I'm just worried about, you know, I mean, if given that part of our intention here is promoting stability in the community, um, if you could just talk a little bit more about your, your rationale for wanting to do that, to, um, and maybe it'll help me be okay with the friendly. Sure. Um, one of the things that I had heard um, people had concerns with around uh, just cause for eviction was the idea that if they wanted to move one of their, if they wanted to, one, reoccupy um, the space that they had purchased and someone had been living there for a long period of time, that um, if they've been living there for more than five years, then they don't have access to their space. Um, additionally, if I've also received word from people who mentioned that um, these places have been purchased for um, allowing their sick family members to be able to move into or older family members to move into when they want to take care of them um, at later dates. And with under this provision, if someone's lived there for more than five years, they would not be able to have those people leave those spaces. And um, just in the um, with uh, in addressing the concerns that I've heard from some people, um, I wanted to bring that issue up for discussion. I'm gonna, I'm what? just gonna, I'm gonna ask the, or any other council members wanna weigh in on this before I make a decision about accepting as a friendly or voting on this separately? Just asking. I'm not sure if I understand because um, I thought we're, we're doing something in a short term and then going to look for the uh, a task force to come back to us. So we're, I mean, I'm not opposed to what you're saying at all, but it doesn't seem that relevant to right, right so, now. So, okay. Well, I'll, I'll let you respond. We split the, as you know, we split the discussion. And so this is simply on the language of the just cause. And then we'll revisit the discussion on the task force specifically. But the task force is not going to take up stuff like this and come back to us with something possibly different. It could. I think the point. Actually, so. <laughs> I'll let, did you want to respond? A year, I understand, but five years, it says. Taking out the five. Sure. Um, and so in response to that, um, people have family members that become sick you know, at any given notice or someone has something catastrophic that happens to them within their lives and they may need to move those people in to their home or, um, and given that, um, if the person's lived there under this ordinance, if the people, if the person has lived there for more than five years, then the owner would have no right to be able to either move back into that place or to move any family members in. And as a result, um, and based on some of the things that I've been hearing in the community, um, I was making the suggestion that we remove this from um, the current ordinance. So that was asked as a friendly amendment um, to the maker of the motion. I'm gonna remind you all that this is now the time for the council to deliberate and take action. I have to confess I'm having a hard time with this one because I my sense is that no matter whether we take it out or we leave it in, it's gonna be a moot point because this is a temporary ordinance that isn't gonna last for five years. So it's not about that. Okay, I, I just I we, we can take another recess so that we can have a chance to reconvene again. But I just want to remind the community members that are in the audience that we have had an opportunity to hear from you. And this is now the time, whether you agree or disagree with any of the comments that are made by council members up here, for us to deliberate and take action and discuss amongst ourselves. So th the next time there is a, uh, a call out or a cry out from the, from, the, from the community in the audience here tonight, we will take a brief recess and then we'll reconvene so that we can take action and deliberation, okay?
Did you have any additional comments? I just wanted to comment that although um, this may just last for a year, it will be relevant if the need arises within this year for someone whose house has been rented out for more than five years. That's sort of the yeah. reference. That's all, just a comment. Okay, I get, I so get it. A, so I it's mean, a friendly amendment. I don't know if that's acceptable. I mean, yeah, it's fine. That's okay. I'll, I'll accept so that was accepted. Did you catch that, uh, Bonnie? Okay. Do you have any additional changes? Um. <laughs> No, I did have a, a couple of questions, but I can wait until other council members can weigh in. So something that was brought up, uh, I have a couple things, but something that was brought up a little bit ago, and just since we're on this topic of owner move-in and the five-year, whether or not to make it five-year or not five-year, uh, one of the concerns has been brought up by people is the definition partner in both subleases moving in and in this language here of owner move in, of being able to move in any spouse or partner. So if we're going to remove the five year language, I think it'd be uh, important that we specify or remove the term partner from number seven uh, so that there can't be any mm, eviction on false pretenses of relationship. Uh, as well, and to address the concerns of the people that may be against the subleasing term partner, there may either be an addition of a definition of what partner is or remove partner from that so that, you know, to find a middle ground so that it's uh, equal on both sides. I just don't wanna see people coming, landlords coming to tenants and saying, I'm having my partner move in and then it's not anyone of any significance, it's just someone that said was their partner. But at the same time, I want to provide some form of security for uh, landlords uh, who have expressed that concern. But I don't know if it's really the same thing. Uh, anyway, I want to introduce that as a conversation piece to, to see what other people thought about that language and the definition of partner. I know that's been brought up as an, as an issue. Um, and so we could touch that first and I have one more, something after that or what do you think? I think we should, maybe let's go, let's go ahead and address that and then we'll go into your next issue. Mr. Kadani. A, a suggestion was made that the term partner <clears throat> be expanded to registered domestic partner. Okay. Does that cover what I, you're... I would definitely okay. support that. Okay. Does that... Does that... Okay. All good. Okay. So that would be an additional amendment to the motion. Okay. And... Can, um, so we've heard a lot of statements from the community tonight in support of the just cause eviction protections and against it. Um, there have been claims that we're passing Measure M. I wanna emphasize that to the community that we are not passing Measure M. Uh, there have also been claims that we're circumventing voters and I wanna ensure you that we are not working to try and circumvent voters. What we're doing is we're talking about an, a way that we can ensure stability for those in our community who are renters while we enact a transparent and democratic process that uh, the previous council failed to do, <coughs> thus causing this division that we face today. So for the most part, I think that we uh, are for more or less on the same team and wanting to find a solution, but in that mindset, we need to provide the space for the solution to be formed through that process. And in thinking about this, I wanna echo the statement from our brother Curtis Relaford, I don't know if he's still here or not, but that uh, he's one of the most giving men that I know and that we need more love, compassion, and empathy in this conversation. So this is going out to both tenants, but especially to those landlords that were talking about their bottom line compared to people being able to survive in Santa Cruz. Um, like with Curtis, I really resonated with some of the statements made by community members and was really disturbed by others. I imagine that we all are coming from a place of what we think we feel is right, but something that stood out to me was the number of landlords specifically that said that it would pull their units off of the market. Um, and then also the statement from the community member that said, having no just cause evictions is just like having no rental units on the market because you're pushing out a certain population that isn't able to stay in Santa Cruz. So the question is, do you want reduced housing or gentrification is essentially the, the, the ultimatum that you're offering when you say that kind of stuff, which is problematic to me in a lot of ways. And it does, from my perspective, feel like a, a way of holding the situation hostage, which is 
really troubling for people that say they want to come up with a solution, but to say that if there is anything enacted that even resembles protections of renters, that you will pull your units from the market. That, that, that does not speak to compassion, love, or empathy, and it does not speak to you caring about the other people. So with that being said, there was another community member that brought up the issue of those that are facing evictions now. Because even no matter what we decide with this process and the timeline that's been associated with it, the people that have been served evictions now will be without a home by the time the process ends. So I want to uh, open that up to discussion with our uh, body up here as to how we can ensure that we will protect those people that have been served eviction notices now until the democratic process has been completed to avoid them from facing homelessness. Uh um, Council, I, Council Member Cum Cummings has a couple of questions. Uh, Council Member Matthews has mm -hmm. a couple of questions. And, and Council Member Myers has any, some additional comments. Okay. okay. I just had a question regarding the water task force that was mentioned earlier and was just wanting to know how much time that task force um, was sure. in place. Uh, so if you are, if you looked in your agenda packet, there was if an may, attachment, and this may, is also. If I may, let, let's yeah. go ahead and pause that question and postpone it to the discussion around process. Okay. So oh, we'll yeah, go ahead yeah. and hold on to that and we'll make that part of that conversation. Thank you. Any additional conversation, any additional questions? No, I'm good. Okay. Yeah, thanks. I'd like to go to item, oh, I have to go back here. Section 3A. Two, three, and it has to do with breach of lease. Item A3, A2, and I'm just trying to understand it. Um, uh, let's see. Um, I have to go back and read the full sentence. The landlord, um, during the moratorium period, no landlord shall take action to terminate any lawful tenancy. Um, yeah, to um, notice to quit that we're served on a tenancy prior to the effective date. One reason is to failure to pay rent where, where um, that is considered a just cause. One reason is breach of lease. Um, and so that's two, breach of lease, the tenant has continued um, to substantially violate the terms of the housing agreement Notwithstanding any contrary provision, a landlord shall not take any action to terminate. Um, okay, I'm sorry. Notwithstanding any contrary provision in this ordinance, a landlord shall not take any action to terminate a tenancy based on a tenant sublease of the rental unit if the following requirements are met. The first one is the rental union co unit continues to constitute the tenant's primary residence. The second is the sub lessee replaces one or more departed tenants under the rental housing agreement on a one for one basis. But that doesn't require that the landlord even be notified of who that other tenant is. Correct? Which is something I cannot imagine. So. Are you proposing to add language? I to think that requires. Um, uh, Re, uh, replaces one or more departed tenants under the rental housing agreement on a one-for-one -one basis after approval by the landlord. That is and then number three, <laughs> so that would put it in there, and then number three says um, <coughs> the landlord has unreasonably withheld the right to sublease following a written request by the tenant. If the landlord fails to respond to the tenant, within 14 days um, of the receipt of the tenant's written request. The tenant's request shall be deemed approval by the landlord. A landlord's reasonable refusal for the tenant's written request may not be based on the proposed additional person's lack of credit worthiness if the proposed occupant is not legally obligated to pay some or all of the rent to the landlord. But that's the only criteria given for Refusing, it doesn't have anything to do with references, character reference, what was their, how were they as a tenant in their former rental, etc. So it seems um, to really restrain the reasons <coughs> for what I would say, honestly, in some cases, legitimately 
withholding permission. Are so you are, you, are you proposing? I think it needs work is what I'm saying is, which is the problem I've had with a lot of these clauses. And it's, uh, I'm hard pressed to think right now how to rephrase that. Um, maybe I should work on that in the next couple minutes, but. <laughs> Would the maker of the motion be um, open to you understand that what I'm saying there? Modified language. And I apologize to the audience. It's hard when we've got a letter and a number and a letter and a number and a letter, and we're kind of construct a whole chain of um, logic there. Yeah, I understand what you're saying, and it's it's kind of what you know when we uh, <clears throat> the the original you know, my response to uh, comments from the public about um, uh, landlord approval of a sublease was kind of trying to get at that and the, the number of people question. And we kind of took care of the, the number of people or the, we, we took care of the, um, the number of people question with the elimination of the um, uh, <coughs> uniform code. Um, so I do see what you're saying. I get what you're the intent, and I. Um, I am. So, yeah. So I mean, I would accept some kind. You know, I mean, again, maybe I don't it, know it, how, how. Maybe it just said to, this says, and, and even the whole sub lessee thing gets into the whole issue, do you rent to one person and they're renting to a whole bunch of other people or do you rent to the master tenant? People? Yeah, individually. Um, the sub lessee replaces one or more departed tenants under the agreement on a one for one basis uh, upon approval by the landlord. That could be number two. That just states that With the, the replacement tenant has to fill out an application and be vetted by the landlord if they so choose. Um, I'm okay with that. Councilmember Matthews, would you prefer uh, some time on some language <laughs> yes. and we'll go to, to Councilmember Myers for yeah, oh, please, yeah. And so we'll pause on that specific language going into the motion. We'll revisit that if that's okay with the maker sure. of the motion and we'll have uh, Councilmember it, sure, although I think, I, I mean, I can say that Be there? if we want to keep it simple with approval of the landlord, kind of covers it. You want to just do In, that make that change? Let, let me just point. read and think here. Two, two eight, <coughs> two. Okay. Yeah. So that will be, so we'll go to Councilmember Myers and then Councilmember Cummings and then Councilmember Glover. I just want a little bit of a clarification. Are we, are we continuing? So are, are we able to make comments just in general about this or are we still wanting to nuance and rewrite I'm sections I'm gonna nuance. Of this? Okay, okay. So yeah, I just have a question about um, nuisance, the nuisance clause, which is section three A, <laughs> let's see, section three A three. three. Um, I heard a number of people just sort of talk about uh, sort of the reality of, of being able to control not only um, their own property, but also respond. Uh, is there any, uh, would there be any, uh, uh, would, would any, would the maker be amenable to uh, at least changing this one clause to, to also acknowledge uh, immediately adjacent properties potentially? In case uh, someone needed to, or neighboring, neighboring, yeah, immediately neighboring. Uh, I don't, I don't, that? I don't know. I don't want the whole neighborhood, but um, you know, something in terms of a. I, I think just in my, I yeah. had a similar note to that in my notes. Yeah. So when when uh, Vice Mayor Cummings brought it up, I kind of started, my mind started um, spinning around how we might get at that because how. Adjacent property is one thing, you know, if you share a common wall or you're in close proximity. Um, enforcing that is the question that mm -hmm. concerns me. And so given that I, I just couldn't wrap my mind around it, I let it go. But if we want to discuss it and try to find a way to get at it, I'm amenable to doing that. Mr. Kondati, do you have something to add? I think it can be reasonably simply addressed by 
At the very end of subsection 3A3, uh, or is creating an unreasonable interference with the comfort, safety, or enjoyment of any of the other residents or immediately adjacent neighbors of the property. And I would also offer a friendly amendment that that similar, similar language would be, would be added to number four as well under criminal activity. I'm not sure, mm -hmm. but. I'm, uh, I'm amenable to that second. So that language would be then added to section 3A3 3A3 and four. three and four. Okay, so it's accepted by the maker of the motion. Is that accepted by the, that's accepted by the seconder of the motion? Are we ready to go there? Or <laughs> do you have any additional, do you want to make any additional? Yeah, I'm, gonna, I'm just gonna pose the question again since it just kind of got glazed over. Uh, what are we gonna do tonight to protect the renters that are facing eviction that are going to have to be out of their place before the end of the democratic process, which has yet to be established? So what, what are we gonna do? Are you proposing um, the maker of the motion consider some language or to respond oh, to that I think we question? would discuss it since it hasn't been brought up and it's not in here to revise any language. So do how will we as a body work to protect those people that are current? Uh, Attorney Kandati, would you, do you have any suggestions on ways that we might be able to add language to the document that would protect those people during the uh, hopefully coming process? <laughs> Um, well, we, we did include language in section seven on the, on the second to the very last page uh, under effective date and expiration date. Um, it states the ordinance shall take effect 30 days following its final adoption, which is defined as the effective date, provided, however, that it shall apply retroactively to any notice of termination of tenancy with an effective date on or after December, December 11th, 2018 in any unlawful detainer action brought pursuant to a notice of termination with an effective date on or after December 11th, 2018, that is still pending as of the effective date. So there's possible, um, there's a possibility that some evictions could s fall through the cracks, but this would cover most evictions that might otherwise occur between now and the ordinance taking effect. Great, and then with the, um, there were people that had said they received eviction notices prior to December 11th, like the 6th or the 7th, right after Ooh. the stuff was so going on. So the way on. we've attempted to address that is to say, um, notice of termination with an effective date on or after December 11th, 2018, uh, that is still pending as of the effective date. So, so if, if a notice of eviction was brought with an effective date prior to December 11th, um, it's possible that an unlawful detainer action could be brought and concluded prior to the effective date. And I don't see a convenient way of getting around that, mm -hmm. frankly. But, um, but that being said, even unlawful detainer actions don't always get adjudicated within 30 or 60 days. So um, most would still be covered by this ordinance. Some would fall through the cracks, I, I, I think, at least theoretically. Okay, okay. It's just, I just want to make sure that the community, especially We have especially attempted those... to add language to address that, that specific concern. Cool, I just want to make sure that the people, especially none of this expressing a, concern. None instead. of this fixes the problem right. under every circumstance, but, but that's the language that we've proposed, proposed to okay. attempt to address that concern. Thank you. Uh, Councilmember Brown and, then, and Vice Mayor Cummings. Tony, Tony got it. We got it? Okay. I was just curious. Um, my understanding was that the previous um, rental ordinance, um, the rent freeze and just cause freeze that was in place, um, had an expiration date of uh, December 11th when the council got sworn in. So right. I would imagine that any eviction notice that was served prior to that date would technically be a, an illegal eviction notice. If the if the rent if the just cause um, the previous measure was in place at that time, arguably. Yeah. Um, Councilmember Matthews might have some okay. language. So I'm going to go back to the <coughs> <laughs> confusing three A one A three, and that says um, not. 
preface, notwithstanding any contrary provision in this ordinance, the landlord shall not take any action to terminate a tenancy based on a tenant's sublease of the rental unit if the following requirements are met. And I think we've resolved one and two. For three, perhaps the simplest is just say, the landlord has unreasonably withheld the right to, to sublease following a written request by the tenant um, and application from proposed sub lessee. If the landlord fails to respond to the tenant in writing within 14 days of the written request, the tenant's request shall be deemed approved. And then just eliminate all that other stuff. It doesn't define what's um, unreasonable. Does that seem, okay. So is that a, is that, that, a that's, that seemed to me the simplest way to handle that. So, it, so basically, And then it does have at the end, a landlord's reasonable refusal of the tenant's written request may be based on, but is not limited to, the grounds that the tenant has replaced one or more departed tenants with short-term sub-lessors, and I would say without permission. That's accepted, it's um, language to the friendly amendment to the, okay. So what it would delete is the whole thing that you couldn't, um, find someone, uh, you couldn't refuse a tenant based solely on their lack of credit worthiness. Right, so it's basically allowing uh, the landlord to judgment. run a credit check yeah, if they want happens. to. Right, sure, yeah. okay, yeah. yeah, Okay. which I have mixed feelings about, but I, given that it is the kind of the norm for any, any tenant issue? agreement, sure. I, I get it. So. Okay. so that's accepted by the maker, is that accepted by the seconder? I just had a statement. I'd like to know if that's accepted first by the seconder. I, I'm, I'm, I'm uncomfortable with it. Do you mind, I'm sorry, do you mind using your microphone? Thank you. Uh, I'm, I'm, the credit report thing for me is a, a, a very abusive to a lot, of, a lot of tenants and getting into places and stuff. Um, I would rather not accept, take it, but. Okay, so, Senator Brown? I, well, it, yeah, I mean, I'm just having a hard time with this one because it's, we're not, to the extent that we're really not able to tackle the abuse of credit worthiness writ large, it, I don't know how much of a difference it's gonna make in, for, for these particular cases, you know, I mean, that's, so I'm having a hard, you know, I, I have a hard time with it as well. I just don't know how we can. Okay, then you could just add the word solely. I mean, the way it's written now, it just says you can't refuse on the basis of credit unworthiness, but it doesn't give you any other criteria. But if you said solely, then that would suggest that there are other reasons. So you could say a landlord's reasonable refusal of the tenant's written request may not be based solely on, on the proposed additional person's lack of credit worthiness, if the proposed <laughs> occupant is not legally obligated to pay some or more of the rent to the landlord, then you would say a landlord's reasonable refusal of the tenant's written request may be based on, but is not limited to, grounds that the tenant has replaced one or more departed tenants with short-term lessors without permission. <laughs> is that acceptable by the maker? Acceptable to me. Is that, is that, with that modification, does that Address your, your I, I just wanted to hear what Council Member um, Glover had to say. He wanted to say something about this particular issue, about the um, credit issue. I mean, look, I think I'd like to know prior to that if that's. You're what, asking what, if the if modification the was uh, accepted by the maker of the second. Yes, and that if it, if the seconder would prefer to have comment, is that? That's the mayor's. Mm -hmm. uh, up Mayor's prerogative. Okay, go ahead. Thank you. Yeah, yeah thanks. Uh, so the the main issue that I had with that initial motion is the fact that credit is used in ways to hold people down and limit their ability to participate. Now the the sole creditworthiness uh, makes it so that it's more acceptable to me, but at the same time, 
like how are you going to know if it's if that's the only reason like what if they have bad credit and how are you going to know if there's some other reason and, and are you going to have to report have them report it or something like that so it's it's a slippery slope with regards to being able to um uh, go against people because of their bad credit and even after talking with the police chief who has brought into con uh, conversation the issue of having to do credit checks to hire police officers and the barrier that creates for us to be able to get police officers on the force. If you can imagine that that impacts students he spoke a lot about, it impacts people of color, it impacts working class people. So, and this is here to protect those people for to be able to move into a place and avoid homelessness. And if you allow the landlord to make a deliberation based off of their credit worthiness, what's the point? I think this is protective. The police do a background check, not a credit check. Uh, they also do a credit oh, check. But I mean, background is, anyway, I think as revised now, it's protective um, in that uh, it, it says the landlord um, has unreasonably withheld the right to sublease. Unreasonably is not defined, but it says they can't um, refuse on the basis of a credit record. They may refuse if the tenant has moved in other people without permission. So it just it defines a couple of areas, but it not completely. Okay. So just wanted to make the statement before yeah, the second. I, I don't disagree. Can we parcel that out for a separate vote then? I mean, <laughs> you know, just up or down that amendment. That's I feel more comfortable doing that. Don't accept it as the friendly amendment. We can have an amendment proposed. Yeah. Let's vote on it. Do you, okay, that's so your preference. As a second. It as a I'll, second. I'll no. defer to the second on that if you if you want to do that. We can just do an up or down vote. Okay. So do you want to propose it as a friendly amendment? I mean, as a, not as an as amendment. An, as an sure. Amendment. Just that. Shall I reread that one section? I I I three that we're looking at here. Sure. If yeah. You want. Okay. So to be your motion for for the for the, amendment. the uh, section three a two a three will read the landlord has unreasonably withheld the right to sublease following written request by the tenant and uh, upon approval of uh, the landlord. Um, excuse me, following written request by the tenant, submission of an application by the proposed sub lessee and approval by the landlord. If the landlord fails to respond to the tenant in writing without four, within 14 days of receipt of the tenant's written request, the tenant's request shall be deemed approved by the landlord. A landlord's reasonable refusal of the tenant's written request may not be based solely on the proposed additional person's lack of credit worthiness if the proposed occupant is not legally obligated to pay some or all of the rent to the landlord. What? The landlord's reasonable refusal of the tenant's written request may be based on, but is not limited to, the grounds that the tenant has replaced one or more departed tenants with short-term lessors without permission or the grounds that the total number of occupants in a rental unit exceeds the maximum number, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Okay. So that's the language. Okay, is there a second to the proposed amendment a language? Second. Okay, so that was... Uh, Could I make it just to point out something is that I thought that the prior motion eliminated um, a after the wor after sub lessors... Okay, that's fine with yeah. me. I, yeah. I had some, okay. okay, I also delete that. Yeah. So just to be clear, this is a motion to amend the main motion. Oh. It's a motion yes. to amend the main motion, yeah. and we'll vote on that amended language at this time. Any further discussion? And I'll, I, just for discussion, I'll say my purpose is to be clear that the landlord uh, does have the right and expectation to receive an applicant from any sub lessor sure. okay. and review it. Yeah, and review the application. Okay. Any further comment or questions? Nope. Okay. Councilmember Matthews, could you confirm um, that um, this was the language? We, we missed that. Sorry. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Submission of an application and approval by landlord. Yeah. That's Thank fine. You. Mm -hmm. okay. 
All right, we'll be voting on the amended um, language to the main motion. I, I think, and Tony, maybe correct me if I'm wrong, you have to vote to accept the amended motion first and then vote to accept the amendment to on the motion. Oh, yeah, yeah. You have so to we're accept voting. it yeah. first and so, then vote on the motion. Okay, we're going to vote on the. Did you have something to add? I was just going to add that we do have a number of clarifications that are needed before the final vote. Okay, so we're not doing the final vote. We're <laughs> voting whether or not we want to make this change. Yes. So on this. voting on this change, all those in favor, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? No. So that passes with uh, Councilmember Brown, Councilmember Matthews, Vice Mayor Cummings, uh, Councilmember Glover. Abstain. Uh, can you stay? Can I stay? No. Okay, okay. Uh, Councilmember Myers and myself, uh, yes, and Councilmember Crone and Councilmember Glover, uh, no. So that is now part of the main motion, okay? Is there any other modifications or just changes or Councilmembers that want to speak to this item before we take the vote on the main motion? Are we prepared to vote at this time? Oh. These, we're doing the main motion is all these all these additions plus approval of the of the ordinance. Correct. Um, well, I'm just yeah. I'll make a quick comment. Sure. Um, I'm actually not going to support. Uh, I won't be voting in favor of the ordinance. Um, I do feel like. Um, we are. Uh, I I do. I do feel like we are at a point in this conversation um, around how we provide rent stabilization and protection for renters where um, we're acting without information and data. Um, and I will talk more about my thoughts about the task force when we get there. But um, I do worry that um, this action tonight is going to, will result in loss of rental units in our in our community, um, and I don't think that that is a threat um, or a hostage taking situation. I think it's just a reality um, that some people face with various finances and mortgage issues and things like that, and the risk that they take in terms of um, trying to hold on to a whether it's uh, trying to hold on to a unit here in 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 town. Um, I'm absolutely committed to trying to figure out how we protect renters and have, how we stabilize um, rents in the community. But um, at this point, I'm not, I'm not in favor of this um, this evening, but I did, did want to add those comments. Um, and I, I guess I would also add that, um, you know, I think this will pass tonight, obviously. Um, I think uh, the, the language is a little better um, but I would have liked to have seen uh, a different tool looked at in terms of this point in time before we did the task force. And that tool could have been, um, for example, hiring a uh, mediation company or firm that actually renters could have had access to uh, upon receiving eviction notice uh, and then having landlords and tenants go through a mediation. Uh, I believe this is going to be um, very helpful to a lot of uh, attorneys in town, and uh, we're going to end up uh, spending quite a bit of money, and, as will tenants and landlords in this situation. So I just want to go on record with that. Uh, I'm going to be a no vote on this, and uh, but uh, I just want wanted our community to know my reasons behind that. Thanks. Um, I, too, uh, will be voting against the... Uh, um, ordinance as uh, pros. I think it's mm -hmm. it's improved a bit, and I appreciate the uh, efforts for doing that. Um, but uh, I do think uh, coming um, straight after the break, straight after the election, understanding that the just cause was uh, one of the uh, keynote objections to the um, Measure M as written, uh, and then this to, ha to have this come right back again in substantially the same form, I think has really um, undermined uh, the confidence of those who do have rental properties to participate in in a good spirit and goodwill in the discussions that we need and that we will talk about on the next item. Um, I think there's plenty to do. 
Um, there were there were so many really heartfelt and genuine statements uh, on both sides of this issue tonight, and there were plenty of offensive statements on both sides. So let's just acknowledge that. Um, the issue, this issue has brought Santa Cruz, as we've said before, to um, a, a more deeply divided um, circumstance than I've ever seen. And many people on both sides expressed just a sadness on the polarization that this has brought. And I do look forward um, when we uh, get into a community process. I take a lot of people at their word. They said I, I was not in favor of Measure M, but I do see the need to deal with the housing crisis, with the affordable, with rent, rent, rental protection and so forth. I think they are willing to come to the table, but um, it has to be in a different format. Uh, and there has to be a more open discussion. You saw how, how hard, what a hard time we had just kind of refining what was the meaning of certain uh, phrases in here. And uh, to do a good job, I think we have to listen to what are the issues and how can, how can we arrive at um, uh, ideally a consensus, but hopefully uh, some, uh, maybe a menu of solid recommendations that we can move forward with. So um, uh, I appreciate the thought that's gone into it, but um, I feel that um, Overall, it will be costing us rental units and it will be costing us um, uh, undermining of public confidence. Um, if there aren't any further comments, I'll just briefly say that I was um, very supportive of the temporary measure while the community decided on Measure M. And um, within that time, we often heard from um, both sides asking that we let the community decide and sort of stay out of it, knowing that um, that was already underway. And also interest in having a more inclusive community conversation um, if if the measure were to fail um, and, and going from there. And so I look forward to that conversation. I appreciate the intention. I recognize the intention. Um, I uh, won't support it for uh, that reason and um, look forward to the conversation that we're gonna have at the next item. So in the interest in time, I will go ahead and just um, ask to take the vote. So all those in favor, so please. You, oh, pardon. Sorry to interrupt. No, no, go ahead. <laughs> uh, a couple of clarifications sure. um, or um, confirmations. Uh, there was the specification of um, calling out registered domestic partner um, um, in uh, seven, section seven yeah. um, on page five. And um, we just wanted to confirm that that would also apply to uh, the reference in 2B. 3A, 2B? Uh, yes, 3A, <laughs> 2B. Yeah. Yes. Okay. <laughs> Here. Um, so just wanted to confirm that because it wasn't specified, but I believe those are the only two places where um, it is identified. And second, sorry to belabor the point here, um, but um, Council Member Brown, your original motion was uh, to um, require that um, landlords um, approve um, subleases. And I just wanted to be clear, um, that was addressed as part of Council Member Matthews in um, 3A to Correct. A three. However, just so the council is aware, that does not apply in the instance of um, family or now a registered domestic partner. So I wanted to make sure the council was aware of that, given that your your original motion was fairly broad in saying people coming in. So if there's any uh, discussion regarding that. that, that's state law, isn't it? Oh, I thought. Anyway, <laughs> I believe so. Well, that, believe it that's is. Yeah. I mean, yeah. Okay. Yeah, it is. And okay. My, my general you, statement was really more due to <laughs> my inability to um, adequately wordsmith. So yes, but thank you. Okay. You're welcome. Okay. Was there was there another? Okay, okay. that covers it. Sorry. Okay. Quick question. Um, just it's up to one year or until the report comes back to the council should uh, we have the mm. task force working until on it? Until we take action. Right. Okay. Take yeah. action. Until we take action. Okay. okay. Just want to clarify. Okay. 
I'm not going to even try to attempt to rewrite that. But I'm, no. can, I ask, can I ask Clerk if you need any clarification before we go ahead and vote? Okay. So all those in favor of the motion on the floor, please say aye. 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 Those opposed? No. No. So that passes with Councilmember Crone, Councilmember Glover, uh, Councilmember mm -hmm. Brown, and Vice Mayor Cummings voting yes. Uh, Councilmember <laughs> Matthews, Council, Councilmember Myers, and myself voting no. Okay. So that then leads us to the community process and a discussion around how to direct staff to move forward with that at this time. Um, go ahead. I'll start. <laughs> um, so part of me thinks we're at the point where we should go into mediation, um, but I would like to hope that, um, similar to many of my colleagues' comments up here, that um, we can um, work towards a community process. Uh, where voices can be heard and we can um, build out some of these solutions together. Personally, I think um, our housing affordability and um, uh, availability problem is, is larger than just, than just just cause um, uh, uh, guarantees. Um, and so I think you know, I, we've done the blueprint, uh, but I'm, I'm a little confused right now how this sort of, where this sits in our process. The blueprint, we have 99 actions, we're doing a lot, but um, I don't know that we're getting at some of these issues with regards to rent, rent stabilization and rent protection and security for people to stay in their homes. So with stating that, um, one of the things that uh, I think is really important in this process, and I guess I would put as a goal, um, is that um, the process uh, includes, and whether this is created by staff or is, is created by some other uh, outside experts or others who, who could get this information together, but um, I think we're, we're, we're designing policy a little bit in a, in, for a black hole right now, and I don't know that we know all the, the um, the stresses on the on the system. Um, as a biologist uh, that does restoration, I'm always looking for the stressors on the system. Of, and if I don't understand the stressors on the system, then my restoration project will fail because I'm gonna be fixing something that I have not adequately diagnosed. And so um, I guess one goal that I would um, ask for is a robust data uh, analysis and a robust set of um, uh, measurement factors that we can really assess as for this for this group. Um, I think if we don't start working from data uh, and current data and understanding even just in the past six months what have, has happened in our market, then we will, you know, potentially be developing policies that might not be effective at uh, protecting people and we may continue to lose rental stock. So that's probably my biggest addition, just uh, looking at the time tonight. Uh, and then I do, um, I do support a committee process. Uh, a task force sounds reasonable, but um, I, I guess I would also say that mediation, I think, um, may be a quicker uh, pathway. And uh, so I would support either of those at this point. And so at this time, we're, um, my, if, if, if I may, my understanding would be to sort of gather, and what I'm gathering is that there is consensus to have a community process to take place. Um, and so what will inform our staff is our ideas around what we'd like that to look like for them to return to us with a proposal. Does that seem accurate for the ask of this evening? Yes, thank you, Mayor Watkins. Um, especially now that we don't have the 90-day limitation, which was keeping me up at night a little bit, um, we will have some time to take your input and then we can generate a model and bring it back to you. And I think that would be the most effective way. So if you can advise on, on the goals, what you're really trying to accomplish as much as you can about the scoping. We already got some information around um, some of the mechanics of the committee, having some data there, which leads me to think, well, facilitator and expertise, we need to make sure. So that helps with the budget and I can advise on the, the cost of doing the process. So if I can get um, feedback from the council on your goals, the outcomes, you know, what you want the product 
product to look like, your expectations around community engagement, what you might want that to look like, and you know, is this a small set of people? Do you want this to be um, a very large, very inclusive process all the way through. So any sort of feedback you can give me now, even though it's not fully dialed in, will be helpful because then we can generate those models and bring them back to you. Okay. So, um, okay, Councilmember Glover. I'll let Councilmember Glover. Okay. So throughout the public comment period, I heard many people echo that they were in favor of a mediated uh, conversation. So I will also express my support of a mediated conversation between the opposing interests. But instead of, and, and I want, first of all, I want to appreciate staff uh, for putting together this report and the asks so you can let us know exactly what you're looking for and all that kind of stuff so we can uh, provide you with as much as possible. And also for um, segregating these three potential options that we can choose from. Uh, something that a community member said was get creative. So I was thinking about ways that we might be able to fuse uh, or synthesize some of them together, um, specifically the mediation between opposing interests which has a smaller group but at the same time, we want to maximize community involvement and consideration. So figuring out ways that we might be able to fuse that with a discussion circle of some kind, whether it be a community information submission process that's then reviewed by the body and taken into consideration, or whether it is actually a set of town halls that the representatives that are chosen go and attend to listen to the community and then break into uh, deliberation processes or sessions, just to make sure that community members are feeling heard, but we're not bogged down in a extensive hundreds of people trying to make a, a consensus decision and uh, at the same time will avoid the erroneous potential of the public survey options, so. Councilor Matthews. Um, what I would like to see in addition to the, the data uh, would be the experience of other communities um, and come up with a menu of approaches um, as we've done on some of the other um, big issues that we've tackled and, and then not necessarily adopt them all but narrow those down. Um, a mediation in my mind requires very limited partners who have the, uh, the authority to agree on, the behalf, on behalf of themselves or others, whereas I'm thinking more of a facilitated discussion, a task force. Um, but I also agree there could be different levels here. The housing um, blueprint used a whole lot of, um, and that was a big, expensive, complicated, lengthy process, but it did get a lot of voices, a lot of them meeting where they were so that they felt comfortable in that environment, hearing very different comments. Probably don't have to go to that length, but I think there's a value to reaching out. I mean, we certainly heard a whole lot of experiences and opinions right here that have enormous validity. Um, so I think some combination of community discussion, maybe, you know, as you say, breaking into smaller groups and actually talking face to face with someone who doesn't agree with you. But in the end, I think um, opposing, uh, not opposing, appointing a, um, uh, a smaller task force representing informed um, community members who represent a combination of the mom and pop and the property owner and the, the <coughs> tenant advocate and, and maybe, you know, cut that a, a bunch of different ways as well so that you have those different viewpoints um, and then having a facilitated discussion, understanding, reviewing the information and then um, coming up with, as I say, a consensus recommendation, but I th could think maybe even several options to choose from. I mean, that's that's kind of what I see. Okay. Um, before Council Member Brown, one of the things that I heard as a request from staff is for us to refine truly the purpose of what we're asking mm -hmm. them to do. And so I just wanted to see if I could get clarity on where the council is with that. And uh, I'll go ahead and start with you, yeah. Council Member Brown. So I was going to start with uh, my... Um, my uh, interest in, you know, in terms of uh, identifying the purpose and perhaps some goals or goals and objectives. So, um, <clears throat> I think for for me, what I would like to see is um, a uh, process that's professionally facilitated um, and resourced with expertise. Absolutely, I think that's very important. Um, that and that the 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 purpose of the committee would be to identify strategies to protect city residents from displacement. 
due to inflationary rent increases and arbitrary evictions and to make recommendations for council action. I have some specific uh, or more specific objectives that I'd like to see us at least discuss and maybe put into the mix. Um, uh, so the following, so I'd like to see a committee that could could bring us uh, recommendations um, uh, about the following. One, a formula for protecting landlords' rate of return on investment through setting annual rent increases <coughs> to cover inflation and operating costs. I mean, that's, I think, a concern that we've heard. It's been included <coughs> in rent stabilization measures. Um, I think that we uh, should include that in, the, um, in our set of objectives. Um, Causes for eviction, including definitions of nuisance behavior and consequential br breaches of rental leases. So um, really fleshing that out. And I mean, we tried to do some of that tonight, um, but I think that that is, is absolutely important. Uh, terms of no-fault eviction. Um, so wh what those might be, the, you know, for example, landlord moving in, you know, um, owner moving back in, moving family members in, measures to mitigate hardship of evictions, relo such as relocation assistance, you know, those kinds of um, factors. Extended notices to vacate. I could come up with more, but I think we, you, get, you get the gist there. Um, um, and then identifying potential exemptions for um, classes of property. We've done that here, so um, I think that should be part of the charge to, to think through what kinds of exemptions make sense. Um, and hopefully we we'll get to consensus. I'm not, you know, I can't even say I'm cautiously optimistic we'll get there, but I, you know, I'd like to see us at least try. Um, um, enforcement and dispute resolution strategies. And um, I think that's it for now. I have some comments on membership as well. Um, do, if you wanted me to keep going. Or do you want to keep, stay stick with the goals and objectives, and then I'll come back on membership. However you however you choose, you can you can. Well, why don't we, you know what? Actually, let's pause on membership at this point. So I agree with much of what has been said, um, especially around some of the points that Sandy just brought up. And one of the things that I um, very much am interested as a goal is how can we incentivize landlords to keep their rents below market rate. Um, one of the things that I've been hearing is that, you know, there's many people in our community who don't charge market rate and they keep their rents well below market rate. And so I think that if there are those people within our community, we should try to devise ways to incentivize people to continue that behavior or that there should be some exemptions for people who actually keep their and are able to demonstrate that they keep, they keep their rates well below market rate. Yeah, uh, so one thing that was brought up that uh, was mentioned by community members was the all the different cities that have just cause eviction language. And I'm not sure if it's possible to get a compare and contrast between the different cities so that we can get an understanding of uh, just what's been implemented and uh, if there's data that supports that. Another thing that was mentioned was, and I'm not sure whether this would fall under the purview of the task force or someone else, but uh, the data associated with rent increases over the last five years with renter or with um, landlords, and I realize that'll be difficult because we don't have a database of landlords, uh, to my knowledge. So I'd love to explore the potential of creating a database of landlords and their rent histories and all that kind of stuff, if possible, um, just so that we can be aware of what's going on. We have the rental inspection program. Mm -hmm. uh, one other point that I was going to bring up is whether or not we can find out information on costs around potentially um, putting the lease leases and rental agreements online. Um, and this would be a way to c begin creating an additional database where we can track um, rent increases on tenants. We can track um, whether or not there have been complaints made by landlords or tenants, the number of times people have been e evicted or landlords have evicted um, tenants from their properties. And so just so that there's, because one of the things that we've heard this in, this evening is that there's not a whole lot of data on um, how many landlords have been increasing their rents, how much they've been increasing their rents by. And I feel like as we're moving further into the technological age, getting away from paper leases and having um, this be, having leases be made 
made online um, and what potential, uh, if there's a potential option for having that, I think would also, and the costs around that, I think would also be a direction that we might want to go in. I would like to add, um, if there's interest of the council of having this being, if it's going to be comprised of Santa Cruz City residents? Yes. Yes. Okay. And, um, and, and then thinking of um, having areas of consensus be something that's really spelled out for us to receive when the report is complete. Actively seek. Even if limited, full consensus. Yeah. I think that's, that's right. a good idea. Okay, and then um, if that covers um, input at this time in terms of um, more or less the direction we're hoping to go to help you all uh, bring something back, then we could talk a little bit about membership. Is that appropriate at this point? Yes, and I'm thinking we can all, you know, we're going to go home and think about this. We can give our thoughts to staff individually okay. in the that's a, that's relatively absolutely. near future. So if there's additional yeah. thoughts. I, I just wanted to add UCSC to the mix, too. I mean, that's a huge elephant in the room. Okay, so um, the Im impact of UCSC in terms of data? Yes. Sure. Okay. Housing office, is that what you're thinking? Yeah. Okay. Get them involved in... in yeah. Okay. Okay. Great. Good addition. Okay. Um, do we want to bring forward a conversation at this time in regards to membership or how that would look a, a, aside from the Santa Cruz residents? I'm, I'm just, it's late. Yeah. It's almost midnight and I'm gonna, you got enough to chew on. Maybe bring that back. We all agree we want some kind of facilitated smaller group, I think, okay. with city sure. residents representing a spectrum. So that could be, we could pick up that. And if there's input or ideas amongst the council that we could email you those ideas, is that appropriate? Or did you like? Sh well, I just want, I mean, I'd like to make a statement for the people who stayed um, for as late Council as Robinson. we have, um, just really quickly on membership. And, and that's fine. You know, I have some thoughts on that, which I'm, happy to send along, but I agree with, um, and it's been, it's been suggested by others um, that we ensure that we have uh, tenant representation, uh, landlord representation. Um, I'm not sure exactly how to designate a you know, student voice in this, but I think that's important. Um, representative from you know, a nonprofit, at least one nonprofit engaged in housing issues, um, et cetera. So I, I do think that you know, we, we, but th I also wanna say that I'm absolutely supportive of this being uh, a relatively small group, so 9, 11, I'm thinking that's that's where I want to, I'd like to do TSO, um, for the official task force process with opportunities for the public to weigh in. No, I'll just add that I think it'd be beneficial to also include any experts with that live within the city that are interested in serving on the task force as well. Councilor McCall. Um, so are we talking about a Brown Acted Committee too? It's gonna to be open to the public, all the meetings and... We'll have to I, I would think, I uh, can imagine. I'm just kind of looking at staff, but for example, the public safety was not a Brown Act committee, but some of their meetings had public participation and some they were invited to observe, <coughs> but not engage. I mean, just in the interest of moving it. And we could look at that, would, so we could look at those various discussion. options when we get that return to, when the item comes back to us in terms of public safety. And consider that. Yeah, thank you. I just want to make sure that in our not focusing on the memberships right now, it doesn't have the potential to delay the process just because of the time frame and the urgency associated with this topic. If we push it until the 22nd and staff hasn't had time to come up with a full presentation because they're lacking the membership details, will that push it another two weeks to the next meeting? And is that something that we want to do? I don't, I don't know. I mean, I'll let st staff respond to that. Yeah, thank you, this was very helpful. And actually to answer your question, Vice Mayor Cummings, it was an 18 month process for the WASAC. And I can talk to you more and we've got lots of materials. It was a very sophisticated process, but there are some very good parallels there. And one was the very carefully constructed composition. Because in that, similar to this, you had um, about two maybe opposing sides, if you will. And so it was very important about the membership and the balance on that. So that was very carefully wrought. So we have a model there that was effective that we could bring forward to you. Now, as for timing, um, Council Member Glover, I was thinking realistically to put this together, to devise strategies, think this through carefully, it would most likely come back on February 12th. And that is, I know, I know everyone wants to move, but if you just think about our calendar preparation, this would have to be done by next Wednesday. 
and to be you know published by the Thursday. And I just I don't know if that's adequate. I'm going to aim for that, but I think it's very likely to have a very fully vetted, carefully considered um, process options for you. Um, it might make more sense to have additional time trying for the 22nd. I just want to put that out there Appreciate because you. you want to be thoughtful. I, I, I get this matters a great deal to you in the community, and I want to be able to do the best we can do to give you good options. Okay, thank you. I'm going to go to Councilmember Brown, and then Councilmember Crone, and then we can make a I just want to raise, because it's been, uh, the issue has been raised, so I just want to see if we can get some clarity about um, direction regarding the potential for a survey of some sort. Um, if, if Do people want to weigh in on that now, um, or should we just give you that? I'll just um, brief, I mean, my, my way, I mean, unless that seemed something that's absolutely necessary, I think, um, you know, with the Voices on Housing, we've done a significant surveying, and if that doesn't seem adequate, and we think that at that point we want to maybe do additional surveying, then I would be open to that potentially. Would you like me to give some thought to that and present that as a discussion question? I, I actually don't know that it's necessary, but okay. I just wanted to see what other others okay. thought. Sure. Okay. Before, so are you talking you about like a Gene Bregman kind of survey? Like we take no. five. What, what kind of survey? Maybe the data collection was the thinking about. There was, it was suggested in our in our agenda report that we might consider a survey. So I just wanted to. I don't really have any thoughts on it because I don't think we need to do it. But um, <laughs> I wanted to see if where it, it seems like if anybody to wants to give directions to staff to come back to okay. us. And again, if you have additional direction or input that you'd like to provide, I think it's appropriate for you to reach out to staff directly at this point. Um, Councilman, uh, to me, the meat and potatoes of this is going to be the the task force working sure. on this and. Um, surveys will have, uh, I think, a limited function. It depends on um, who takes them, <laughs> and that's kind of self-selecting. You can do a survey monkey or something like that. It gives people the chance to weigh in, but it's, it's certainly not scientific. So I would say that's maybe a nice add-on. We'll get some okay. expression. But. I, I would just add that hopefully it, it, the facilitator can help yeah. maybe s suss that out with sure. us a little bit is, you know, that's often one of the things they think about is when they put the process together is whether that. Did you have a See, Yeah, was the, um, was the WASAC, that was a Brown Act, did they have participation by the, the public? Absolutely. All, they did. So they took yeah. um, uh, public comment yeah. like at every meeting. Mm -hmm. um, how about the DLAC? DLAC. Oh, library. you know, that, that was all, thank you, I'm sorry, <laughs> you can tell us. Yeah, they did, yeah, it was open and there was public comment. Mm. Um, so how many members were, anybody remember the, of the DLAC? Uh, 11, 12, 13, around yes. that range. And uh, um, WASAC was 14? WASAC was 14. 14. Mm -hmm. And it looks like the public safety here, the advisory public safety was 14 also. Mm. Right. Is there any further discussion? Do you need a motion on this, or is this just direction? No, you don't. It, okay. I just, this how, is just this discussion. How about a, also like some sort of budget? I mean, the stuff that we got here in, in on our sure. these pages gives us a flat, sort of flat figure, but it says end staff co costs, and I'm just wondering also sometimes what staff costs are. So, so perhaps when you bring back your proposal, sure. you can bring back some financial constraints or costs with associated. Okay, great. So then that concludes this agenda item, and we still have another one. <laughs> so, um, at this point, what's that? Okay, okay, sorry. <laughs> at this point, um, we will now move on to item number uh, two of our evening session, which is the second reading and final adoption of ordinance number 2018-20, amending chapter 21.3 of the municipal <coughs> code pertaining to relocation assistance for displaced tenants. Good evening, mayor and council members. <laughs> Almost morning. <laughs> yes. Um, so, um, We'll, we'll try to go through this quickly. We typically do not have a uh, presentation for a second reading. However, um, given the timing here with the uh, new council not uh, having seen the, the presentation for the first ordinance, um, we do have a brief presentation here. Um, we'll go through it quickly, and if you have any questions, then um, we're happy to go into more detail on this. Um, this is one of the things that um, was identified 
as part of the housing blueprint subcommittee's recommendations. And um, it uh, has come back to the council a number of times and, and I'll go ahead and let Sarah uh, give you the history on that. Hello, council members. My name is Sarah Fleming. For those of you who I haven't had an opportunity to meet yet, I'm principal planner overseeing our long range advanced planning team. Uh, so a little background, ordinance history. Um, this came out of a, a number of efforts that you will have seen actually uh, in the staff report for the last item um, around housing and um, addressing some of the housing issues. So uh, as we discussed in the last item, there was an interim just cause eviction and rent control um, ordinances that were passed in February 13th, 2018. Yes, what year are we? 2018. Um, at the same time, we had the Housing Blueprint Subcommittee uh, that was meeting, they brought forth a series of recommendations of June of uh, last year, uh, one of which was this item that you have before you uh, to amend our displaced tenants ordinance to add language um, to address tenants displaced due to a large rent increase because the ordinance as written uh, only addressed tenants that were being displaced based on life, health, health, life, and safety issues. So this adds language to that uh, ordinance. Um, as we do with any type of um, policy update, we did a series of community outreach efforts, and then we brought this forward to the council initially on September 11th, uh, 2018, because in the Housing Blueprint Subcommittee uh, materials, we were asked to bring it back as soon as possible. Um, close to the end of the year. So we brought it back then. Um, concerns were voiced that uh, it would affect or impact the uh, ballot initiative, and so council decided at that time to continue that item until after the uh, election. So staff brought back the item November 27th, 2018, after the election results were um, well into the process of being uh, counted and certified. Uh, at that time, council did uh, determine that they wanted to make a couple of modifications. So modifications were made to the effective date and to the applicability of the ordinance. Uh, that ordinance, that was the first reading of that ordinance. December 11th, uh, staff came back for the second reading and council had received a lot of feedback with some concerns concerns uh, regarding the applicability. And so um, this, uh, council decided to, at that point, um, change the applicability uh, language and then uh, also modify in the original language there uh, was, or the original ordinance there was language that allowed changes by resolution and council decided that they would prefer to take that language out and make any changes required by ordinance. So um, that then became that first reading of the ordinance because those changes were substantive enough to require that uh, to be a first reading. And uh, now here we are back January 8th with our second reading that includes all those changes. So uh, just kind of the high level ordinance provisions. Uh, it's important to note that this does not cap rent increases. What it does instead is defines a large rent increase uh, as 5% in one year or 7% cumulatively over two years. By not capping the rent increase, it's not rent control, but what it does do that if a large rent increase occurs and the tenant uh, needs to move because of that large rent increase and provides the notice to vacate within 60 days, the tenant is then entitled to payment of two months rent uh, in the pre uh, increase amount, so uh, whatever had been agreed upon before the increase, uh, they're entitled to that from the landlord. Uh, as it's not rent control, it would not be subject to Costa Hawkins and uh, it would cover all rentals citywide. And so with that, that's the, the high level overview. That's where we're at today and we'd love to turn it over to council for any questions and discussion. Are there any questions from the council at this time? I'm trying to understand um, the last time this came to us, I thought the two months uh, was taken out. What was changed from it? Why are we doing it? Percentage was changed in the 90 making days. making changes by ordinance rather than by resolution. That's correct. And also actually um, some language had been added. I had just moved that back. There we go. Um, in November, this language had been added uh, to the definition section, this yellow language um, that basically indicates that people who are required to vacate due to the termination of a tenancy for reasons other than the breach of the le uh, lease, um, 
would be entitled for reloc to relocation assistance. And um, at the December 11th meeting, the, the council then had heard feedback from the community and uh, reconsidered this position and decided to take this out. Mm -hmm. So those were the things that changed on December 11th. It's late, could you explain sure. that to me one more time, what was, t what was changed in the last meeting? Yeah, so, Start with the first. yeah, let's go back. <laughs> okay, actually, I'm gonna go back here. So on November 27th, uh, council had asked us to add two things. We added an effective date and the applicability language that I just showed you, which we can go back to in a moment. On December 11th, we brought those changes back as a second reading. Council then decided that they wanted to re-modify the applicability language, so that has now come back out, uh, and then also require, change the language that does not allow changes by resolution, but rather requires changes by ordinance. And so what, what you have now is from November 27th, you still have the effective date language in there that makes it effective December 11th. Um, you no longer have the ac ac applicability language and you now have language that requires any changes to be made by ordinance as opposed to resolution. So those are the key changes over the last three meetings. And, so in and, over four Did I miss years, something? you can still raise rents 14% um, over, yes. over four years, for example. So if you go 8% over two years, then and the person and the, the tenant can say yes or, or no. If they say no, then they accept two months relocation. That's correct. That's correct. So long as they provide notice within 60 days That's right. of the rent increase. So you couldn't say you know, six months later. So there, there's that provision. You, you've got 60 days to decide. And if you decide to leave, then you would be entitled to the two months if you exceed either the 5% in one year or 7% cumulative in two. Okay. And the percentage of what constituted um, excessive was lowered from 10 and 15 percent to 5. Oh, thank you. That is correct. That did happen uh, in November. November 27th, and that did carry over. So thank you. Good catch. Any additional council questions at this time? Okay. Um, so now we will ha open it up to public comment. Is Gail Jack uh, still present here? No. What's that? No. Okay. Is any member of the community wanting to speak to this item? Okay, just one, I'm seeing one, is that correct? Two? Okay, two, then you get two minutes, okay? Oh, are you three? Okay, is there any other members of the community that want to speak to this item? We have three members who are standing up. We'll have it conclude after you, sir. Okay, two minutes. Okay, so four, okay, that's it. <laughs> <laughs> Assert. <laughs> yeah. Okay, four yeah, members, yeah. that's it. I'm closing the public comment at this point. Um, you'll have 90 seconds. Go ahead. I'm sorry. Sorry. I'm Cynthia Berger with Santa Cruz Tenants Association. I, um, I applaud you for entertaining this in the first place. It is sure to be challenged in court. This is a groundbreaking ordinance. Thank you. Thank you. Honestly, all I can say is that it's midnight and I'm exhausted and I cannot give you a competent argument at this moment because I worked a full day and now I've been here for another full day. So I'm just stating that for record that I'm too tired to actually give a valid statement. Okay. Thanks. Good evening, I'm Scott Graham. Um, I still think the percentages are too high. Personally, I'd like to see it uh, connected to the COLA for Social Security, because that hasn't raised in years. And all the, your grandparents have been suffering with no increase in their Social Security for eight years now. And we want to let landlords raise it by 5% every year, or I guess it'd be, what, 3.5% every year. So I think the Social Security COLA is a better measure of the increase that should be allowed. And since the federal government decides there has been no increase in the cost of living, 
Why should landlords be allowed to continually raise rents? It doesn't make sense. But I think, I, you know, I don't want to delay this thing any more than it's already been delayed. So um, thank you. At least our, next, our last yeah. speaker. <clears throat> Um, the gentleman pretty much, uh, previous gentleman pretty much said what I wanted to say, um, but, uh, but I just want to add that I'm, so, I'm just really disappointed and I, I hear that the community is so divided and so forth and coming together, but I think the overall context of the situation that we are operating in has completely failed to be discussed. We are operating in a fascistic environment. What does that mean to me? This is what it means. It means business controls government. When business controls government and you already have a foundation where everything is about privilege and money and status and relationships in that sense, the people need protection. And if this is the best that we can do, and, I, and I've, I've watched this whole process and I, I'm not blaming anyone. It's been a bear. It's, it's midnight and, and we're working on this. So I just wanna say, I'm really disappointed in this. I'm really, I'm just like, this doesn't, this isn't, this is, this is abysmally poor. It doesn't, it's not enough. And the greed, I'm sorry, I don't agree. The power imbalance, how are we gonna have a task force? This is not decel in the sense that there's a power differential here that's completely lopsided. Thank you. So now I'll bring it back to council for action and deliberation. Council Myers. I'll go ahead and move the item uh, for final, second reading, final adoption, just so we have a motion. Okay, so we have a motion by Councilmember Myers, second by Councilmember Matthews. Any further discussion or deliberation at this time? Seeing none, I'll uh, ask all those in favor, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? Mm -hmm. That passes unanimously. Okay, so at this time the meeting is adjourned. Have everyone. <laughs> Mercifully, we don't have... Uh,